You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, 13 Lectures, given in Dornach between January 9th and May 2nd, 1915. This is translated by Rory Bradley. Lecture 1, given in Dornach on January 9th, 1915. We already have some concept of how complicated the human being is. People do not always pay this much regard because out of a certain cognitive complacency they strive for simplicity, for a simplification of knowledge, for a certain schematism. Only a detailed look at the things that we have been considering for years can show us what a complicated being the totality of human nature truly is. For example, let us take the fact that the first stage of the human being's physical form developed in the far distant past during the old Saturn period. We will bear that first form of the physical human being within us, but what we still have of it must be recognized as the product of a transformational process that turned us into what we have gradually become. After going through sun, moon and earth evolution as a physical human form, we can no longer recognize with our normal way of seeing what existed during the old Saturn period. For this physical human body itself was transformed during the sun, moon, and earth periods. During the sun stage it underwent a transformation and was penetrated by the ether body. During the moon stage it underwent another transformation and was penetrated by the astral body. And during the earth stage it underwent yet another transformation and was penetrated by the eye. So, if we just consider the physical human body first, not the ether body as such, not the astral body, and not the eye, but just the physical body, we have to say that the physical body itself has undergone four transformations. Once it existed only as a physical body, and the higher parts of human nature were not yet a part of it. Then it was transformed by the influence of the ether body, then by the influence of the astral body, and finally by the influence of the eye. All of this now constitutes the physical body and is the product of the transformations of the physical body. Let us pause for a moment on this. The first stage of the physical body existed during the old Saturn stage. Then, under the influence of the sun stage, we see how the ether body transformed the physical body. In other words, how the sun stage of evolution transformed the original stage of the physical body. Then under the influence of the moon stage, we see how the astral body transformed it. And during the earth stage, how the eye transformed it. These are the four transformations of the physical body. Now, we have turned our eyes toward the effects of the ether body, the astral body, and the eye on the physical body. But we have not looked specifically at the higher parts of human nature themselves. That is, we have not considered what sorts of changes the ether body, astral body, and eye underwent over the course of time. During the sun stage, the etheric body entered the picture. 
it completed its own process of development during the sun stage, and then it underwent changes during the moon stage because of the influx of the astral body and during the earth stage due to the influx of the eye. These changes ultimately resulted in a threefold etheric body. Finally, during the moon stage, the astral body entered the picture. It developed itself through its own astrality during the moon stage and developed further during the earth stage through the eye. But now during the earth stage, the eye itself has come forward as an individual aspect. We can also consider all of this from another point of view. If we turn our attention toward the eye, we find that we actually have within us a fourfold eye. We have the product of the way the eye transformed the physical body. Then we also have the product of the way the eye transformed the etheric body, as well as the astral body. And now we also have the eye that has developed out of itself. But here we shall pose a different question. If we look at the human being and its presence on the physical plane, we know if we count up all the different sections on this diagram that the human is a tenfold being. So when the human being stands before us on the physical plane, what parts of this tenfold nature are truly before us? Now basically very little of this is really on the physical plane. Most of what I have written down here is hidden. What stands before us is, first of all, this I, C diagram, I'm going to call this I number one. What is this I? This I is the physical body. It is the result of how the I transformed the physical body. Please, Pay careful attention to what I am saying here and what I am going to say because that is the only way that you will grasp it properly. I'll read these off. Uh, I number one, externally perceptible. I number four, as inner experience. I number two, as speech and song. I number three, as creative imagination. When you stand before a human being and look at the form of the body, the physiognomy of the nose, the mouth, when you see how the person looks and who the person is, and even if you were to cut open the body as an anatomist or physiologist, everything that you see is the product of how the eye has transformed the physical body. The forms that the moon stage, the sun stage, and the Saturn stage had once given to the physical body evade our gaze and remain hidden. Only what the eye has made out of the physical body presents itself to your physical eye. Y-E. Only when you pay attention to this can you have a clear understanding of the matter. I will now attempt to help you with another consideration that will explain the matter further. If you have an animal before you, a dog for example, or a cat or a wolf, then in that case you have something that was formed by an astral body. When you consider a human being, you have something that was formed by an eye all the way down to its circulatory system. When you consider an animal, on the other hand, you have something that was formed by an astral body. The configurations of the physical body that were formed by the etheric, astral, and physical bodies remain hidden. What we experience externally is actually the embodiment of the eye. Let us take a good look at it. It is the embodiment of the eye. And if we want to speak very precisely about the human being, we must say that the human being is, in the whole of its being, down to the circulatory system, an embodiment of the I on earth. 
So, this means that we perceive the form that the eye has made by transforming the physical body. But what do we not perceive? What we do not perceive is this eye over here. If you call this one eye number one and this one over here eye number four, then we can say that eye number one is externally perceptible, whereas eye number four is what cannot be externally perceived, but perceived only as an inner experience. Now, you could not have it as an inner experience if the eye were really the only thing there. I have already said to you that we sleep not only at night but also during the day. We are not fully aware of the whole of our inner experiences. And since we are asleep also during the day, so too the beings of the upper hierarchies live within us during the day. In the eye live the angels, the archangels, and the archai. In the part of us that is the most asleep, in the will that makes decisions, lives the power of the archai. The angels and the archangels also live in the will, but the deepest impulses of the will always come from the archai. But the human being, as I have already described to you, knows very little of the will. The power of the archangels lives in human feelings and in thought the power of the angels. We can say that the will-giving archai, the feeling-giving archangels, and the thought-giving angels live within us as an unconscious experience of self. And all of that drifts and flows into the I, and ultimately becomes what we call the inner soul life. But I number one is the only one that is actually known. Just as the forms of the astral, etheric and physical bodies made out of the physical form of the human being lie behind what we see as the embodiment of the I, so too do the effects of the angels, archangels and archai lie behind what we experience inwardly. So, really, we can say that the human being knows very little about what actually comprises it. When you encounter another person, what you perceive is the other person's I number one. When you look into yourself, what you perceive is your I number four. So eight out of the ten parts of the human being remain hidden. But even though these parts themselves might remain hidden, we can still say that their effects appear in certain individual occurrences in human life. For example, the form that the eye creates out of the etheric body remains hidden. The way that this eye, which I am calling eye number two, integrates into the etheric body remains hidden, although only seemingly so. We will soon see that it comes out a little bit as well. The appearance of I number one presents itself to us in the physical figure, the physical form of any human being that we encounter. Just as I number one makes itself known to external perception through a physical figure or form, I number two, the form that the eye gives to the etheric body, can be perceived only by a clairvoyant, naturally. The etheric body is not a body of form, but rather a body of movement. Even without clairvoyance, you can detect how I number two generates very particular rhythmic movements in the etheric body. Just as I number two gives a form, to the physical body. But these rhythmic movements, these inner movements of the etheric body, come to appear in the physical body by penetrating into it, or to say it in a better way, they come to appear in the physical world. 
I would like to note that in Eurythmy, we try to call forth the movements that the etheric body generates within us, insofar as this is currently possible. If you were to present a poem or a piece of music in Eurythmy, and if you would step back, look beyond the physical body, and see only what the etheric body is doing, you would see the I within the etheric body in motion. Because Araman's presence in the world caused the human etheric body to become so hardened that we are unable to develop eurythmy as a natural ability, we must try to wrest this eurythmy from Araman. The human being would move in a eurythmy-like way if not for the fact that Araman has hardened the human etheric body to such an extent that the element of eurythmy cannot not find its way to expression. This element of eurythmy must squeeze its way in through one single part of the human physical body and it is hindered by the other parts of the physical body. The etheric body, which is actually intended to live in eurythmic movement in all forms of music, in singing, and also in speaking, has been hindered by the weight of the physical body, which is to say, by Araman, making it unable to really carry out these movements. It can express this natural movement in only one part of the body, namely in the lungs and larynx where it can press air through them. This is what brings about speech and song. So we can say that I number two, insofar as it intends to organize the etheric body and bring it into eurythmic movement, must content itself with one part of the human being in song and speech, rather than taking hold of the whole human. When a person sings or speaks, a spectrum of the whole person actually always appears in the tone and the vocalization of it. What you hear is the tone, the vocalization. But for the clairvoyant consciousness, what appears is in fact a whole human being, the whole human expressed in a certain form of movement. A, A, E, O, U, In those sounds, there is always a whole human being, or actually a spectrum, an etheric ghost of that whole human. Except that the etheric body is moved in a very special way each time, so that when you hear a person say, Ah, A, E, O, U, what you actually see are the spectrums of five human beings engaged in different forms of movement, and in such a way that the whole human being is not always fully or equally visible. Sometimes the movement is more in the head, sometimes the hands, sometimes the feet. The other parts, we might say, step back then into the darkness, into the gloom, Now, in connection with this same I number two that I just spoke of, whose effects resound in speech and song, there is a being from the ranks of the angels. This particular angel is one that I have often spoken about in these lectures. But this is something that absolutely cannot rise to the level of consciousness because nothing of what I have just told you about the activity of the I in the etheric body when we sing or speak, rises to the level of consciousness. In all of this, a being from the hierarchy of angels impresses itself. It is a servant of the folk song, and in this way the particular colorations of speech and the language in a particular region emerge from the folk spirit. Since the folk spirit belongs to the hierarchy of the archangels, this is then connected back up with the higher regions. The sense of a collected people, a nation, comes to people along this complicated pathway. 
But this is how it is at this point. For behind the angels stands the folk spirit, which is a being from the ranks of the archangels. We will now call the next I, which is also hidden, I number three. We also do not experience I number three directly. I number four is the one that we experience in a direct and unmediated way. What we see externally is I number one, and we can externally perceive the effects of I number two when people sing or speak. I number three lives in deeply unconscious regions. It lives in everything that a person is capable of creating within the bounds of imagination. Everything that a person can call up as imaginative images, as images that are not imitations of the external physical world, this all comes from I number three, and we can say that it lives on the edge as creative imagination. Here we also need to describe what you can read about in my book titled The Philosophy of Freedom in the chapter Moral Imagination. Here, creative imagination is expressed as an appearance of moral principles. Everything creative, both good and bad, belongs to this part of the human being. I said both good and bad because you might be of the opinion that there are many people who seem to demonstrate a complete lack of imagination. Then you can only say, quote, oh, if only people had more real imagination, close quote. For even a small exercise of real imagination is a good antidote to certain troubles in life. I just want to draw your attention to one thing. There are people who appear to have absolutely no imagination in the places where we typically know to look for it. If given the opportunity to speak about what they might imagine or fantasize about, they might just express a general dislike of all forms of imaginative fancy. But if you really get down to the bodily level, or rather the soul level, you will find that they actually have a great deal of imagination. They need hear only one thing about a neighbor that they find offensive, and then they are off inventing whole stories and telling the craziest things about that person. All of these sorts of lies are creations of fantasy and the imagination, the byproduct of an imagination gone bad. And if you take this negative extension of imagination into account, then you discover that imaginative fancy is indeed quite widespread in the human world. If you consider all of the fanciful creations that people bring about by saying one thing or another about their fellow human beings, also when they portray someone in a good light, you will find a great deal of imagination, even if those people who lack imagination in the usual more noble sense of the word. Human capacities sometimes go off course, and falsehood and rumor-mongering are nothing more than imagination gone wrong. On the whole, we can say that I number three is moving down in the streams of humanity, because everything that a human being can create of itself, parenthesis, everything that bubbles forth from the depths of his soul life, both in good forms and bad, close parenthesis, all of that is what comes from I number three. But beings from the ranks of the angels and the archangels have an influence on I number three in both good ways and bad, coming out of both the Luciferic and the Aramonic natures. You can get a picture of human nature if you demarcate like this, bracket, see the diagram, I number four, I number three, I number two, I number one, close bracket. With this oval, you have the revelation of the human eye to the external world on one side and the revelation of the human eye to the inner world on the other. Between the two, you have a stage that I would suggest is half external, the expression of the inner toward the outer. This is eye number two. 
I number three is the part that is only half internal, coming out of unknown depths into the inner life. Above this dotted line here are the hidden parts of human nature that lie adjacent to its physical nature. Below this dotted line are the next spiritual hierarchies that stand in connection to the human being. On earth, whenever we speak about the human being, we are basically speaking of little more than the parts that lie within this oval. But above it, we see everything that remains as a residual, a leftover within the human being from the old Saturn, Sun and Moon phases of evolution. If you were to draw a line here, and there's the picture of the crescent moon, you would receive everything that lies hidden in the human being from the moon phase. If you were to draw another line here, there's a sun image, you would receive everything that lies hidden in the human being from the sun phase. If you were to draw yet another line, Saturn, it would be everything that lies hidden in the human being from the Saturn phase. Draw a line here, Jupiter, and you receive everything that will be revealed during the Jupiter phase, when the human being will live among the angels. Draw a line here, Venus, and you receive what will be revealed during the Venus phase. And finally, at the end here, you receive everything that will be revealed during the Vulcan phase. From a certain perspective, this diagram gives you more or less a concept of the complicated aspects of human nature. It is good to do more than simply consider these things in the order in which they come up during the course of our cycles. We should also bring individual aspects of them into relationship with one another. Today I want to give you an example of how these things can be brought into relationship with one another. A diagram like this can be arrived at in different ways. First, I will tell you how a clairvoyant, for example, arrives at a diagram like this. The clairvoyant would say, I am encountering a human being. The first thing I perceive about this human being is the physical presentation of his external figure, everything that belongs to his external aspect. But through clairvoyance, I can then deepen this form in this way I arrive at the basis of this external figure. But then if I look away from this external figure, I can perceive an etheric being, and the speech, song, and indeed all the tonal externalizations are a part of this etheric being. This deepens the external form for me. Likewise, I can deepen my inner being. I can first develop my self-awareness in the same way that people normally develop it in their physical life. But then this too can be deepened. You can immerse your inner life in the world that normally expresses itself only through the effects of the fantasy. But then something real comes into being. Then true imagination comes into being and mere fantasy ceases to be merely fantasy. The human being finds a way into a feeling that tells you that fantasy is no longer merely fantasy, but submerges itself in something real. Then you encounter someone and you know there is the inner life, and there is the external life, and the two of them are encountering each other here. There's a picture. This is how a clairvoyant consciousness encounters the form. Then it must somehow unify what it is able to perceive by orienting itself toward the moon, sun and Saturn phases of evolution. In this way you can inwardly experience through clairvoyance and creativity the necessity of such a diagram. Anyone who has completed the first step of initiation can experience this step in this way. But even if you have not yet completed this step, you can help yourself toward it to a certain extent by gradually working more and more to have an inner experience of the things that come toward you externally. 
if you put together everything that has been said already in lectures on spiritual science, then you would be able to put together this chart yourself, exactly as it is written here. You just have to make the effort to do more than simply read the lectures one after another in sequence, but really try to make connections between the things that have been said. You could come up with this chart based on the material already at hand. And it is very useful to do this, because by working through the material offered in the lecture cycles, you move from an external reception of the material to an inner reworking of it. This inner reworking has genuine value for any true forward progress. Today I gave you an example of how such a diagram could be constructed from the materials offered in the lectures. I hope now that many of you will slowly begin to construct diagrams like this, because first of all it would cut down on baseless speculations about the content of the lectures, and that is very good, and second, genuine inner evolution would be brought about by that kind of compiling efforts. Individuals who work on these fruitful summaries would progress. You could make more than just a few of this kind of thing from the lectures. Based on the lecture materials that are out there, if you worked productively, you could make not only hundreds but many thousands or even more of these diagrams and summaries. So you see, you have enough to do if you turn toward what is offered by the lectures in the fruitful way that I have discussed here. If you were then to go form a diagram like this to a further extension, you would really be getting somewhere. If you were to exclude everything that actually exists on the physical plane, this fourfold I, then you could say that under the diagonal line lies all of these things here and above it all of those things there. In this case we would simply have to reverse the placement. Everything that is written below here would have to be moved above. Then we would have the six points above, so up here we would have to make six points and then take the six parts written here and write them next to the six points. All of this which is up above we would have to move down below. Again, we would make six points, and we could then write the six points next to them there, in the spot where the upper points also would be. And there's a circular picture of a circle with the center and these various markings. But we actually do not need to do this, because the cosmos has already done it for us. What exists on the earth is there, and even though the things that live within us, from the Saturn, Sun, and Moon phases, are hidden, and even though the things that will come with the Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan phases are also hidden, the traces of them are still present in the cosmos, in the zodiac. And so we can expand this diagram. Everything that is not a human being on the earth can also be found if we move upward or downward. This is just one indication of how you can connect our elemental teachings with the things discussed in the lectures about the spiritual hierarchies and their connections with worldly bodies. But you will also find many things in connection with, shall we say, pedagogy. Even pedagogy will present itself when we properly consider something like what we have just been discussing. Consider the fact that we have arrived at the idea that speech and song are present in I number two. We can rightly say that speech and song have been pressed out of the whole of human nature by Araman's influence. If that ever is properly understood, something of great importance for actual life will come of it. First of all, it will result in a new foundational principle for the singing pedagogy, namely, that any student of song must be called to become conscious of the part that the etheric body plays in singing and of the enduring connection between tones and the etheric body. 
only when people really start to consider the etheric body's participation in the act of singing will they really begin to experience the transformative impulse in singing pedagogy that must necessarily follow from our principles. Practically speaking, this would mean that the singing teachers would work more and more to develop more awareness in their students of the feeling of what surrounds the physical body and not just the physical body itself. The singers need not really have a feeling for the movement of their own organs, but for what the air is doing as it moves within and around them. This emancipation of a conscious feeling for tone in the air, from the experience of tone in the vocal organ, is what would result from the proper recognition of spiritual scientific principles in singing pedagogy. In regard to speaking, particularly in regard to recitation, a similar sort of change would occur, leading to an increased understanding that it is really a matter of becoming conscious of the surrounding interweaving of the elements when one is speaking artfully. By way of this transformation, it becomes possible for a tone to become a truly artistic tone because the speaker has an awareness that when you speak artfully, you are not simply locked inside your skin. I would say it this way. When you speak artistically, you will feel the tone in the air. You will feel the sound in the air as a living being. And through this feeling, you will have a kind of overtone in your speech, a subtle nuance. An enrichment of speech pedagogy will similarly result in the ability to feel sound in living speech. Significant things will result in both teaching and learning when we go into the intimacies of spiritual science. Humanity is still mostly unaware of many of the things that ring out when we touch on the kind of things that we are discussing today. For example, it would be good to develop an awareness of how a new formulation of sound has been attempted in a certain part of my mystery dramas. You can see this most easily in the seventh scene of the first mystery drama. But in the other mystery dramas there are also parts where this new approach can be detected. Readers aside, the four mystery dramas are uh, recorded and on the website to listen to. End of your readers aside. A certain inner form of sound, along with everything else that is there, is the way in which a new element of poetic creation will express itself, one that is almost nowhere to be found at the moment. But it will take the place that alliteration, end rhyme, and consonance once occupied. A certain inward, or I would say etheric poetic, experience of sound as opposed to the more external physical experience of sound that we find in end rhyme and alliteration. There is a need, even in our ever more prosaic culture of recitation, to do away with the old forms. It is not easy in our time for someone to use alliteration as Jordan did, and it is not easy for someone reciting a poem now to emphasize the end rhymes as they were once emphasized. Instead, the emphasis is guided by the sense of the piece. But that is prose. It is not poetic speech when you simply emphasize according to its sense. Poetic recitation would be one with excellent emphasis placed on the non-prosaic element of the artistic form. But that will become possible only when the speaker lives into the inner rhythm of the piece rather than residing in the external configuration of its rhymes and external rhythm. To do this, one has to live into the sound in a way that I recently described in another connection, in the recent lectures where I spoke about how music composition in the future will live into the individual tones. All of these examples 
show that simply learning the theory of spiritual science is not enough. What matters is having an inner experience of what we learn and filling our whole souls with the impulses of spiritual science, as I have had the opportunity to speak about it in the past. This building, the first Gertianum, is intended to serve as a beginning for precisely that. Readers aside, actually in brackets, the first Gertianum, uh, end of readers aside, insofar as something that is intended to stimulate such a change can be established externally, this building is meant to do so by affecting the entire soul, and not just the eyes, by the beholding of its forms and colors. But what has been intimated will be fully achieved only when we feel induced to form our whole life in the same way as has been attempted in this building, wherever such a change is possible at present. But then we must also attempt to really bring spiritual science to life, to really let it flow into what we undertake and intend to do. It is necessary to become conscious of the fact that the spiritual scientific worldview provides something that is meant to engender a kind of new human being in place of the old human being that has come down to us like an heirloom from an earlier stage of earth evolution. At the same time, we develop the preconditions in ourselves through spiritual science that will help give birth to what is to be born in the future on earth. If you want that, then you must connect very, very deeply with your whole being to spiritual science. Here and there we have already seen beautiful examples of such a deep connection. We have already spoken often of one outstanding example. I would like to take this opportunity to say a few words in closing by our friend Christian Morgenstern which should serve as an example of how spiritual science can fill one's heart and soul as an inner experience. Spiritual science does not fill us as completely as it could, because we take it up theoretically. It will fill us only when it lives into every fiber of our being. And this is one example, among many, of how spiritual science was expressed so beautifully in a poem like this one by Christian Morgenstern. Superficially, this poem could have been written from the perspective of another worldview, but in reality it breathes, not only in every line, but in the vocalization, a vocalization on the soul level, in this case. It completely breathes the spirit of our spiritual science. Quote, Like all that is, I am born from God. With all that is, mine I go into God to die. I turn homeward, O God, to live as yours. At first I was given from your eye. Then what was given had to be earned. You had to be raised as you, breast to breast. But right in the middle, pride sought to corrupt it, and it became you, and you were lost to pride, until you powerfully wore me down. Then I was born a second time. Then I understood for the first time how to die. Then I felt for the first time what it was to live. The end of Lecture 1 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English, and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner. Thirteen lectures entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, translated by Rory Bradley. This is Lecture 2. 
given in Dornach on January 10, 1915. As a reminder of what we attempted to consider yesterday, let us think for a moment about how we actually must go about engaging with what we are calling the old Saturn stage of human evolution. Turning our eye, EYE, toward what we discussed yesterday, we know what was planted in us by the Saturn stage of evolution. The first iteration of the physical human body is present but hidden in our human nature. What Saturn brought about in us can no longer be found anywhere in our external world. This old Saturn stage of evolution emerged at one time in the far distant past before disappearing again. It had its own features and powers, but at least initially, we would seek in vain for them by simply looking around us. Even when we look up at the stars in the cosmos, we still will not find the things that predominated during the Saturn stage of evolution. After this Saturn stage faded away, the Sun stage of evolution came about, followed by the Moon stage. Now, we are living in the Earth stage of evolution. Three prior evolutionary stages have passed. Their particular features receded with them and are no longer in our field of vision, so to speak. We will find the particular features of the old Saturn stage of evolution only among the hidden occult effects that permeate the world. To some extent, we can still uncover the forces that were at work on our physical bodies at that time. If you recall the things I described in my title outline of Esoteric Science, you will remember that at one time, the spirits of will and the spirits of personality were at work together. This cooperation continues to this day, but as I said, we will not find it in our field of vision. We will find it only if we look into what we refer to as our personal destiny. Our personal destiny is woven in such a way that the things we encounter in our successive incarnations are connected as though by cause and effect. And the forces that are at work in our personal destiny stream are not ones that scientists who study external nature can study. Among the forces that the scientist discovers in the fields of physics, chemistry, biology, physiology, and so on, nothing will be found that calls up this cause and effect connection that is expressed in our personal karma. The laws that are active there elude physical observation. But they also elude historical observation of the sort that the materialist so-called scholars of culture, practice at this time. When the processes of history are studied in the manner that people currently approach history, everything from Persian history to the present, including Egyptian, Greek, and Roman history, laws are discovered that have nothing to do with the forces that are active in our karma. That is why the historian and the contemporary materialist scholar of culture will not arrive at the laws that are connected to personal human karma. History is understood to be a stream that moves ever forward. No consideration is given to how much the historical process is dependent on the fact that, for example, human souls who were individuals incarnated during the period of ancient Rome are now back again on earth, participating in the events that surround us. And their participation in those events is such that it flows out of their personal karma. Materialist historians ignore this. So, when we go looking for the forces that were the natural forces of the old Saturn stage of evolution, we must look to the lawfulness of our own personal karma. Only when we learn to do 
more than just look at the cosmos that lies in our field of vision. Only when we learn to read what is in it will we gain some insight into how the laws of old Saturn continue to have an effect on what surrounds us to this day. When we regard the arrangement and luminescence of the twelve signs of the zodiac as though they were cosmic writing, when we turn our eye to the forces that come streaming into human life from Aries, Taurus, Gemini and the others, then we are thinking along the lines of the forces that were the old Saturn forces. And when we attempt to connect personal karma with the constellations that are related to the zodiac, then we are living more or less within the kind of considerations that must be undertaken when we look at the laws of old Saturn. So what remains is not visible by and large, but rather something invisible that can nevertheless be detected in the signs of the cosmos. Someone who believes that Aries, Taurus or Gemini determines his fate has fallen into the same error as the person who is convicted because of a certain section of the law and then starts to hate that section of the law, believing that it was what caused him to go to prison. Just as a section of the law that is to say the printed word on the page, cannot sentence a person to time in prison, Aries, Taurus and Gemini cannot determine one's destiny. But it is possible to read the connection between the cosmos and human destiny in the writing in the stars. So we can say that what comes out of the cosmic writing is a remainder of the old Saturn stage of evolution. It is old Saturn made completely spiritual, leaving behind only its signs in the cosmic writing in the stars. When we move on from old Saturn to the moon stage of evolution, then we have to be clear about the fact that we also do not have anything directly, remember I am saying directly, from the moon stage in our surrounding field of vision either. The external workings of nature do not in the main contain any forces that are similar to the forces of the old moon stage of evolution. The forces of the old moon stage of evolution have also receded largely into hiding. Neither have they been spiritualized to the same extent as the laws of old Saturn. The laws of old Saturn have been spiritualized to such an extent that we can do research into them by exploring our personal destiny. In other words, they are entirely outside the realm of space and time. When we consider the whole of human life, we still find these old Saturn laws today. We still find things that we cannot see when we encounter the human being in the physical world. We said that When we encounter the human being in the physical world, we have before us the physical body as the remainder of the old Saturn stage of evolution. The etheric body is the remainder of the old Sun stage. The astral body is the remainder of the old Moon stage and the I capital. And actually, when we approach a human being externally and observe its form, it is only in the embodiment of this I that we see something other than a remainder of something prior. This means it is earthly laws that are active when the eye takes form as a human being, when it becomes embodied. And the laws of the astral body, the laws of the moon stage of evolution, have already pulled back and are no longer externally active. But they are still active in the sense that when we encounter a human being, we say, quote, you, human, in the form that you take when you approach me as a material being, are an embodiment of the I. But deep in the background of your being lies your invisible personal destiny. Close quote. The laws of old Saturn are woven into the human being, 
and determine this invisible personal destiny. So we are actually calling upon something very spiritual when we look beyond the embodiment of the I, which is to say beyond the laws of Earth and toward the laws of old Saturn. When we look beyond the form that presents itself to us externally and toward the laws of old moon, which are still active in the human being, we are looking toward something that is not quite as spiritual. But these laws have also pulled back from being externally active in the world. They too are not as directly a part of the efficient forces of the earth. Where are we to look for what has remained of the activity from the old moon stage. We must look for it somewhere protected and buried, hidden from existence on earth. This is because it is active in the period of time before the human being comes into the world through physical birth. It is active before the moment when external physical light can penetrate the eye, E-Y-E, It is active before the first breath is taken. It is active from conception to birth in the life of the embryo. But it is not active, please take particular note of this, in what develops from the egg cell into the external physical human being. That is, in what grows ever larger from the egg cell through an ongoing process of cell division. The laws of earth are active there, but the old moon is active in the parts that are only present inside the mother and that die off throughout the development of the embryo, dying and lost in the moment of birth. The laws of old moon are woven throughout the parts with which the mother encases the embryo the parts that see to the nourishment of the earth being before it is born, the parts that encase the developing human being and then fall away from it. Connected to these are the things that extend beyond the individual human being, creating a connection between that individual and his or her ancestors, in short, the concept of heredity. Here we can continue to see the activity of the things that were there during the old moon stage of evolution. But we do not see them in the external world. In the external world it appears simply as the part that dies off as the human being develops. It is overcome the moment the human being takes its first active breath as a being of earth. If you want to study the laws of the old moon stage of evolution purely physiologically, without clairvoyance, there would be no other way to do so in our time, at least when it comes to a portion of these old moon laws, than to study the laws that are active in the casing that surrounds the human embryo before it takes its first breath, the things that surround it and nourish it. During the old moon stage of evolution, The things that are now locked up in the mother's body and thrive only inside the protective shell of the mother's body during the earth stage of evolution, those things comprised the whole whole of nature during the old moon stage. They filled up the whole visual field during the old moon stage. So it is not only the beings that have this shell-like nature that die off, Indeed, whole groupings of natural laws die out in that moment as well, and only their remnants carry on into subsequent periods. Now you will no doubt ask, what about the things that come from the sun stage? Let, Let us take a look at yesterday's chart. We see that despite all the complications that came along, we were basically dealing with the following when it came to the complete human being, physical body, etheric body, astral body, I, etheric body, astral body, I, astral body, and then I itself. Basically, everything that is above this, the long diagonal line in the drawing, makes up the hidden parts of human nature. 
If we want to study the laws active in the physical body, we have to look to the suprasensory laws within the human being that determine its destiny. When we look to what is active in the astral body and find its embodiment in the physical body, we are dealing with something that is not so spiritual or suprasensory, but something that is dissipating from the sensory realm into the suprasensory. The part that falls away from the human embryo becomes ever more atomistic as the human being develops toward birth. Materially, it approaches its dissolution. And the closer it gets to this material dissolution, the more spiritual it becomes. Because what joins onto the human being in the form of the astral and etheric bodies comes about through the spiritualization of these dissipating parts of the embryonic shell. But the question arises, quote, What about the parts that come from the sun? Can we find those anywhere in the world? Close quote. The things that come from the sun stage of evolution also elude sensory observation. Whereas the parts of the human being that come from Saturn, what we call karma and personal destiny, lie in highly spiritual regions, we have seen that we do not need to look so high for the parts that come from the moon, for we can still find them hidden within the sensory realm. We also do not need to look so high for the parts that come from the sun. What comes to us from the sun is still within our grasp, but it is not easy to recognize. It is graspable, but not easily identifiable. I would like to present an example of where you can still recognize the parts of the human being that come from the sun, even though our attention can be drawn only to what cloaks them. Those of our friends who have read the new edition of my book titled The Riddles of Philosophy found that four different epochs of philosophical development are delineated in it. The first epoch, which I called the world views of the Greek thinkers, lasted from 800 B.C. or 600 B.C., the first is a rounder figure, to the birth of Christ, which is to say the emergence of Christianity. The second epoch, which I called the world views of the Middle Ages, lasted from the emergence of Christianity to roughly 800 or 900 A.D., which is to say the time of John Scotus Origina. The third epoch lasted from 800 or 900 A.D., to 1600 A.D., and the fourth epoch, from 1600 A.D. to the present, four epochs in the history of philosophical development lasting 700 or 800 years, are presented as best I could in a book intended for a world that has not yet encountered spiritual science. The intention was to present something that might induce a reader to experience, at least once, the spiritual structure of these epochs. The unique characteristic of the first epoch is that it found a way to transition from a very peculiar, older form of thinking to what we might call the, quote, thought life, close quote, of ancient Greece. At present, we still have much to understand about certain distinctions, such as the one between our present thought life and the thought life of ancient Greece. Our block-headed thinking is of the opinion that a thought lived in the mind of an ancient Greek in the same way that a thought lives in the mind of a modern individual. But thoughts lived in the minds of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle in a completely different way than they do in modern individuals. And this ancient thought life was awakened for the first time in the 6th or 7th century before Christ. Before that, there was no actual thought life. As I have described it in my book, we can truly speak of a new beginning, a birth of thought life at this moment in ancient Greece. We have developed the most curious imagination of the first Greek philosophers 
such as Thales and Exagoras and Anaximenes, for example. We have taken note of the fact that Thales believed that all the world emerged from water. Anaximenes believed it came from air, and Heraclitus believed it came from fire. I pointed out that these ancient philosophers were still taking their philosophies from the human temperaments, and that these theories were not merely speculation. Thales believed that water was the basis of all things because he had a watery temperament, and Heraclitus founded his philosophy of fire because he had a fiery temperament. You will find all of this described in detail in my book. Then the actual thought life came about. And even in the epoch that I am describing now, this thought life was different from the present, fundamentally so. The Greek thinker did not derive his thoughts from the basis of his soul. Thoughts came to him as a revelation, just as external tones and colors reveal themselves to people now. The Greek perceived thoughts. He perceived them externally. And when we speak of Greek philosophy, we must not speak of thinking as we understand it today, but we must rather speak about the perception of thought. Plato and Aristotle did not think in the way current philosophers think. Rather, they thought in the same way that contemporary people see the way contemporary people perceive. Plato and Aristotle would look into the world, so to speak, and then perceive the thoughts they describe in their philosophies in the same way that we perceive a symphony. They were perceivers of thought. The world revealed itself to them as a construct of thought. This is the essence of the Greek thinkers. The Greek thinkers completely perfected this way of perceiving the world as a construct of thought. When contemporary philosophers believe that they have understood what Plato and Aristotle perceived as a worldwide symphony of thoughts, this is simply a reflection of their childish attitudes. Modern philosophers still have a long way to go before they will truly understand what Aristotle described as entelechy, and the parts of the human soul, aestheticon, orecticon, kineticon, and so on. The inner thought work of taking thoughts out of oneself, engaging in subjective efforts in order to think, simply did not exist in Greece. It is complete nonsense to believe that Plato, in quotes, thought, he perceived thoughts. It is even nonsense to say that Aristotle thought, in the modern sense of the word, he perceived thoughts. Modern individuals can barely even think about what that actually means, because they have no imagination of true evolution. They get goosebumps when they are told that Plato and Aristotle did not think, in the modern sense of the word. And yet, that is the case. In order for thinking, in the modern sense of the word, to be able to claim any space in the modern human soul, an impulse had to enter that took hold of the most inner part of this human soul, an impulse that had nothing to do with the thought symphony surrounding us, but that took hold of the most inner part of human nature. This impulse came from the mystery of Golgotha. That is why this particular philosophical epoch lasted until the birth of Christ. In the second epoch we are dealing with thinking, but with a kind of thinking that is still not actually human thinking. It is stimulated by an impulse from the spiritual world. If you go through the thought systems of all the philosophers of this second epoch, you will find that the Christ is active everywhere, up through Scotus Origina. Something flowed out of the Christ himself, I would say, which brought forward the first drive, 
within human beings to generate thoughts from within. This is what gave the character and physiognomy to patristic philosophy, the philosophy of the Church Fathers, the philosophy of Augustine, philosophy itself, up to Scotus Erigina. Origina. So we can say that we are no longer dealing with thought perception, but rather with a thought inspiration stimulated by the Spirit. It is different again in the third epoch, where this inner impulse that started with Christianity began to be grasped by the individual human being. Human beings became aware in this third epoch that they were the beings who did the thinking. Plato and Aristotle did not think. As a result, there was no doubt in their minds that a thought had a full objective validity. Just as we know that the green that we see on the leaves of a tree has a full objective validity. In the second epoch, the strong belief in the Christ impulse was what lent assuredness to the awakening thought process. But now in this third epoch, an epoch was beginning in which human souls began to say, Indeed, we are actually the ones doing the thinking. The thoughts come out of us. The Christ impulse gradually faded and people became aware of the fact that thoughts came out of themselves. And the question arose as to whether one might actually be thinking thoughts that have altogether nothing to do with the outside world. Could it be possible that the objective external world has nothing to do with one's thoughts? Just think about the tremendous difference between this and the thinking of Plato and Aristotle. Plato and Aristotle perceived thoughts. They had no doubt at all that the thoughts lay outside of themselves. Now, in the third epoch, people became aware that they produced thoughts themselves. And they began to ask what these thoughts had to do with the objective being that lay outside of themselves. And so arose the need to give thinking some certitude or as we tend to say it, to, quote, prove one's thoughts, close quote. It is only in this third epoch, for example, that Anselm of Canterbury could come up with the idea of providing a proof for the validity of the existence of God. In Greek thought, this would have been complete nonsense, because thoughts were actually things that could be seen. How are you supposed to doubt the existence of God when you can see the thought of God outside in the world, just as you can see the green on the leaves of a tree? Doubt came about for the first time in the third epoch, when it became clear to people that they themselves were the ones doing the thinking. The need arose to prove, to consider the connection between one's thoughts and the outside world. And this is, in essence, the epoch of the scholastics, the dawning awareness of the subjectivity of thinking. If you consider Thomas Aquinas's whole body of thought, you see that it is firmly a part of this third epoch, and that it is completely dominated by this new awareness. You can see everywhere in his thought the awareness that concepts are produced from within, that concepts are pieced together just as the laws of subjectivity are. As a result, one must find some way of supporting the idea that what is generated internally is also present in the outside world. At first this was done simply through an appeal to pre-existing dogma. But the connection to the Christ impulse during this epoch is not the same as it was during the second epoch of philosophical development. Then comes the fourth period of philosophical development, when thought works and moves freely in the interior life. This is a further emancipation of thought from the act of external perception, the free creation of thoughts from within.
which appears so magnificently in the work of Giordano Bruno, Spinoza, Descartes and his followers, Leibniz and others. If we study these bodies of work and thought, we will see that all of them were created entirely out of the inner life. And in all of them, we find that these thinkers demonstrate an intense need to provide proof that what they have created inwardly also has an external validity. Spinoza created a magnificent collection of ideas. But the question arises, quote, was all of that just created within the human mind or does it have meaning outside, in the external world? Close quote. Giordano Bruno and Leibniz created the theory of the monad. The monad was meant to be something real. How does something that people have thought up in the form of the monad come to be something real in the external world? All of the questions that have come about since the 16th and 17th centuries have been influenced by this striving to bring the free creation of thoughts into harmony with the external world. The human being feels isolated, abandoned by the world in this act of totally liberated thinking. This is the state in which we currently find ourselves. So, what is the whole picture that this adds up to? If we go back to the act of perceiving thoughts, which happened during the time of the ancient Greek philosophers, we have to say that philosophical thinking in ancient Greece, parenthesis, despite the fact that ancient Greece was generally the time of the intellectual or mind-soul, close parenthesis, was such that this old form of thinking, of thought perception, was deeply influenced by the sentient soul, or even the sentient body, the astral body. It still clung to the external world. The thinking of the first philosophers, such as Thales, was still under the influence of the etheric body. The human temperaments reside in the etheric body, and it was out of the temperaments that the Greeks developed their water, air, and fire philosophies. As such, we can see that a philosophy of the etheric body predates a philosophy of the sentient body. Then we move into the Christian era. The Christian impulse penetrated into the sentient soul. Philosophy was experienced and sensed inwardly, but also in connection with what a person can feel and believe. The influences of the sentient soul were still present. In the third epoch, the epoch of scholasticism, the essential element in the process of philosophical development was the intellectual or mind-soul. You see, philosophical development took a different path than did general human evolution. And only now, since the 16th century, has philosophy come together with the rest of human evolution. For now we have free thinking active within the consciousness soul. The most magnificent example of how liberated thinking moves from the abstraction of being into the highest of spiritual realms, like an organism of thought, altogether independent, which has completely departed from the world, can be found in Hegel's philosophy, thought that lives solely in consciousness. Tracing things in this particular way was the part that I could not describe to the rest of the world in my book, but it is a part of it all. And if you read the descriptions of the individual epochs, then if you are proper anthroposophists, you arrive quite clearly at the recognition that everything develops more or less as the human being does, from etheric body to sentient body to sentient soul to intellectual soul to consciousness soul. We trace a path similar to the course of human evolution but one that is organized differently. It is not the path of human evolution. It is something different. Beings develop and make use of the human forces 
in the sentient soul, in the intellectual soul, and so forth. Through human beings and their efforts, other beings with laws other than those that govern human development move through the world. You see, these are the effects of the laws of the sun, S-U-N. In this case, we do not need to ascend to the same suprasensory regions that we investigated when considering personal destiny. We see what remains in the world from the sun laws through the example of philosophical development. Yesterday, in connection with the etheric body, we wrote angels here in reference to diagram page 21. Such angels undergo development, and when people believe that they themselves are philosophizing, the laws of the sun are actually at work in them, insofar as they continue to carry the sun stage of evolution, parenthesis, which is to say what the sun stage of evolution brought about in their physical bodies and the effects that it had in their etheric bodies, close parenthesis, and the laws of the sun continued to work from epoch to epoch in such a way as to bring about philosophical development and carry it to a point that it has not reached before. Because these are laws of the sun, the Christ, the sun being was also able to take hold through them in the second philosophical epoch. This was prepared during the first epoch and then the Christ, the sun being, took hold in the second epoch. You see how all of this is connected. But when the Christ, the being of the sun, took hold, these laws came into connection with a line of development that is not the same as human evolution, one that is not earth evolution but rather sun evolution within existence on earth. Sun evolution within earth existence. Just think for a moment about where we have actually arrived in this lecture. We have been considering the course of philosophical development, considering the progression of philosophical thought since the time of ancient Greece. And when we step back and look at how philosophical thought has developed from one philosopher to the next, we are saying it is the laws of the sun and not those of the earth which are active in this development. The laws that played out between the spirits of wisdom and the archangels back then appear once again on earth in the form of a philosophical striving for wisdom. I'm going to read that sentence again. The laws that played out between the spirits of wisdom and the archangels back then appear once again on earth in the form of a philosophical striving for wisdom. Go back to title and outline of esoteric science and read again about how the spirits of wisdom took hold during sun evolution. Now they are repeating this influx during earth evolution, not in the new evolutionary course, but via the remains of the old sun evolution. And although human beings do not notice that throughout philosophical development the spirits of wisdom have been pulsing in their heart minds, in brackets, gemüt, humans go about developing their philosophies. The old sun lives in philosophical development, It really and truly lives in it. But because this is all part of the old sun evolution, something left over is also alive there, something that is connected with old sun evolution. People from one generation to the next develop as external human personalities within earth evolution. But now, A philosophical evolution runs through all of this from Thales to our present moment, and in that, sun evolution is at play. This gives beings that remain behind an opportunity to make use of the forces of philosophical evolution to continue in their sun existence. 
These are the beings that fell behind during that old sun stage, ones that held back rather than completing the evolution that can be undergone in the etheric body, sentient body and sentient soul through a connection with the spirits of wisdom and the archangels. These spirits that did not complete their evolution during the sun stage can make use of the evolution of human philosophy to carry on as parasites in human evolution. These are Aramonic spirits. Aramonic spirits succumb to the temptation to creep parasitically into the striving development of human philosophy and carry on their own existence there. And so, human beings can develop philosophically. But at the same time, this philosophical development is threatened by Aramonic spirits, by Mephistophelian spirits. You know that Araman and Lucifer are harmful spirits as long as one is not aware of them, as long as they can work in hidden places. For as long as they do not step out and stand eye to eye, spiritually speaking, with human beings, Araman and Lucifer are harmful spirits, harmful in one way or another. Let us assume that a philosopher comes forward and develops thoughts. And they are thoughts only in so far as they can be grasped as a part of our existence on the earth. In this case, the philosopher is developing thoughts in the same way that he is living through the instrument of human reason. These are Hegelian thoughts. They are pure thoughts. But thoughts that can be grasped only through the mechanism of the physical body, which dies away in the moment of death. Hegel thought the deepest things that can be thought during life on earth, a light that is configured to die out in the moment of death. And Hegel's tragedy is that he did not realize that he had grasped the spirit in logic, in nature, in soul life. But the spirit that he grasped was only the one that existed in a form of thought that did not accompany him through the gate of death. In order to place this clearly before his soul, he would have had to say to himself, quote, If I were able to believe that the things present in thought, in other words, what I pursue in thought through the abstraction of being into logic, into the thought of nature and the soul, all the way up to philosophy itself, if I were able to convince myself that this would take me behind the curtains of existence itself, then I must have fallen prey to the temptation of Mephistopheles. Close quote. Another person perceived this. Goethe perceived this. And he depicted it in his Faust, the battle of the thinking man with Mephistopheles, with Ahriman. And in this fourth epoch of philosophical evolution, we see how Araman is projected into sun evolution and how we must clearly set ourselves up in opposition to Araman by recognizing and grasping the true nature of his being. Therefore, we are currently standing at a turning point of external philosophical thought. This is why philosophical thinking must flow naturally into spiritual science, must look behind and beyond Araman and understand it, in order not to fall prey to temptations, to the temptations of Araman and Mephistopheles. Read the two chapters just before the last chapter at the end of the second volume of my title Riddles of Philosophy, wherein I attempt to describe the world views that exist in the external world as philosophies, in order to then append the final chapter, a sketchy description of an anthroposophy. There you will see how philosophy currently exists as free, emancipated thought life that reaches up into the consciousness soul. But also how within this life in the consciousness soul. We must grasp the things that come from the spirit itself, 
philosophically at first, lest philosophy fall into decadence and risk dissolution. Readers aside, the book Riddles of Philosophy is on the website under the Written Works section. End of readers aside. Here you see at least one example of the integration of sun evolution into human existence on earth. I said that you can catch a glimpse of these sun laws by studying the development of philosophy. But you will not always recognize that the sun laws are active within it. It is the task of spiritual science to recognize this. Simply imagine that in actuality a being developed that eventually comes to form the same limbs as the human being itself. If you were to go even farther back into yet earlier epochs, you would find that the physical body, like the etheric body, also participated in philosophical impulses. It is very difficult to become clear about the particularities of that period, twelve or fourteen hundred years before the birth of Christ, even before Homer, for it predates any history. But at that time, something was developing that is not recognizably human, according to the form that human beings currently have on the earth. In history, something lives that moves through the etheric body, the sentient body, and everything else, a real genuine being. In my book I said that thought was born during the time of the Greeks. But in recent times, thought has really come into self-awareness in the consciousness soul. This thought is an independent, active being. Naturally, this could not be said in an exoteric book meant for the world at large. The anthroposophist, however, will find it there if he or she reads it carefully and takes note of what guided the descriptions there and what is produced by them, even though that has not been reproduced in them literally. From all this you can see that many, many transformational impulses relating to spiritual life are at work in our time. Here we have watched the development of something that is like a human being, but that simply has a longer lifespan than an individual human being. Individual human beings live on the physical plane. For seven years we develop a physical body, for seven years an etheric body, seven years a sentient body, and so on. And the being that has developed in the form of philosophy, we call it by this abstract name, philosophy, lived in the etheric body for 700 years, in the sentient body for 700 or 800 years, the time is approximate, in the sentient soul for 7 or 800 years, in the intellectual or mind soul for 7 or 800 years, and then in the consciousness soul for 700 or 800 years. A being has developed about which we can accurately say that during the very beginnings of ancient Greek philosophy it had reached the point in its development that would be comparable to the moment when sexual maturity is reached in the human being. At that moment it was a being comparable to a 14 to 16 year old human being. The period of Greek philosophy and thought was the period in this being's development when it experienced what the human being experiences between the ages of 14 and 21. Then comes the next seven years, the things that the human experiences between 21 and 28. At this point the Christ impulse entered philosophical evolution. Then comes the time when Scotus Origina to more recent years, during the 700 to 800 years, this being developed the things that a human being develops between the ages of 28 and 35. And now we are living in the period of development comparable to what the human being experiences in its consciousness soul. We are experiencing the consciousness soul of philosophy and philosophical thought. 
philosophy has actually reached its forties, except that it is a being with a much longer lifespan. A year for a human being is a century for philosophy. And so we see a being moving through history for whom a century is comparable to a year. We simply do not really perceive it. This being develops according to the sun laws. And behind this lies something that is even more suprasensory than this being that develops like a human being, although it is a being for whom one year is equal to one century. Behind this is a being who develops in such a way that its external expression is actually our personal destiny, which we carry through long stretches of time, from one incarnation to the next. There live the spirits that rule our external destinies, which have an even longer lifespan than the being for whom one year is equal to one century. So you see, both how we can look into the higher stratifications of beings and how we are able, if we so choose, to write a biography, so to speak, of one such being that stands far above on the way up toward spirituality, the human being, at a distance roughly equal to the distance in time between one year and one century. Today, we have attempted to write the biography of such a being, one who reached sexual maturity at the time of Thales and Anaxagoras, and has now arrived at the time of its consciousness soul, a being that has been in its forties since the sixteenth century. The biography of this being offered up as a history of philosophy. At the same time you can see how spiritual science is truly capable of taking something that is otherwise abstract and making it living, of truly bringing it to life. What we might call a history of philosophy is normally so dull and dry. And look at what comes of this history of philosophy once we know that it is also the biography of a being that is interwoven with our existence, but develops according to sun laws and not earth laws. These are some of the things that I wanted to add to everything that I have been saying recently about the life forces that are realized in us when we do not treat spiritual science merely as a theory, but rather look to it as a guide to what is living. And we can find what is living through spiritual science itself. When we entrust ourselves to the leadership of spiritual science, things that are as dead and brittle as something like a history of philosophy often suddenly become something new. And from the cloud of the history of philosophy, a being steps forth that we look up to as a goddess, one that descends from divine heights, one whose youth we can trace to ancient times, one that we can watch mature, although slowly, as a century is equal to a year in human life. But all of this comes to life. The sun is rising just as it does on earth itself. Just as the sun rises on the physical plane, so too do we witness the old sun streaming down into the earth world in the form of a being that has a longer lifespan than a human being. Just as we can follow the development of a human being on the physical plane from birth to death, so too can we follow philosophical development by observing it as a being. When we look in this way at what anthroposophy can be for us, we come to see a true leader in this anthroposophy who leads us not to knowledge but to living beings that surround us without our knowing about them. Yes, my dear friends, Christian Morgenstern also felt something similar to this And because he felt such a thing, 
felt it in the deepest part of his soul. Our friend Christian Morgenstern was able to write down a beautiful sentiment that is really and truly an anthroposophic one, a sentiment that shows the kind of expression open to a soul that feels at one in its deepest depths with our anthroposophy and experiences it not as knowledge about one thing or another, but as something that enlivens us. A magnificent example of how one can allow oneself to be enlivened by anthroposophy can be found in the beautiful poem Lucifer by our friend Christian Morgenstern, a poem whose sensibility lives almost entirely in the breath that you begin to sense when, as we have tried to hint at today, you can find a bridge from the description of the idea in anthroposophy to the recognition of living beings. Quote, I will close off my light before your light. I do not want you. You should not enjoy me until I have become my own self-light. So doubtless I bring evil into appearance as the spirit of separateness and denial. Yet my order of spirits creates a new world. Out of opposition to unshaken being, out of error a divine tribe should heal that determines itself out of itself and not out of you. That does not walk not in truth to begin with, that first negotiates the truth in suffering, that first suffers the truth, struggling with it. Close quote. If you take up the sensibility of this poem in such a way that you think about how things that are understood theoretically in anthroposophy can become so living that spiritual science can actually allow us to grasp the beings that step forth from the dark abyss of being. If you take up this poem in the same way that you might be stimulated by the sensibilities that I sought to stir up in you in today's lecture, then you will see that this figure of Lucifer has truly been perceived and given form in the most marvelous way. And so we have a model, an example of how the things that anthroposophy offers can become living within you and take hold of your whole soul. The end of Lecture 2 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life in the World. Translated by Rory Bradley. This is uh, Lecture 3, given in Dornach on January 30th, 1915. From the various considerations that we have undertaken here over the course of time, one fundamental thing that emerges is that true genuine art can ultimately be traced back to the secrets of initiation. We have, at the very least, hinted at this idea when discussing various particular examples. The great artistic epochs, epochs in which art is created that shines its light over all of humanity, always derive their artistic sources from initiation. And with that, we have some indication of how art brings spiritual life into physical life. Initiation opens up the possibility for people to step beyond the physical plane into the spiritual world. And the things that can be experienced 
and undertaken in the spiritual world with greater or lesser awareness, are then borne by true art down into the physical forms in which art finds its expression. Now, the whole situation that I am talking about here will be viewed properly only if we pay heed to the fact that the last few centuries of human evolution have really hidden, have made invisible and imperceptible to the vast majority of people a number of things that just five or six or seven centuries ago were not a secret to the same extent that they are now a secret, even to those who consider themselves cultured. In order to point out a very important circumstance, I have selected the Divine Comedy by Dante as an example. It is an artistic work that truly continues to shine, even as time passes. Those who truly give themselves over to the Divine Comedy will be able to see the spiritual course that runs throughout what Dante was able to express. In our time, when it comes to talking about how Dante arrived at the sublime images in his poem, people tend to use the word fantasy and content themselves with saying, quote, Oh, yes, artistic fantasy was simply active in Dante. Close quote. It goes without saying that artistic fantasy was very active in Dante. But even looking at it historically, that is, in terms of exoteric history, it would be incorrect to believe that Dante created his whole majestic poem out of the void, purely through artistic fantasy. Dante had a teacher and friend, Brunetto Latini, and I think that you will recognize in what I am about to say that Brunetto Latini can be called an initiate in the truest sense of the word. That means that if we can identify a connection between Dante and someone who, given the circumstances of his time, was truly an initiate, then we have found the connection that in relation to what we are looking at today must be most strongly emphasized. At that time, it was known that if you wanted to get behind the secrets of existence, you had to follow a path that led through a human rebirth. And above all, it was still a very living fact back then that the path to knowledge of the world lay in knowledge of the self. But we cannot think about their concept of self-knowledge in the same superficial way that we tend to think of self-knowledge now. Who does not think that he is in a position to say something about himself. I would like to bring up one small but telling example of how difficult true self-knowledge is, even in the most elementary things, of how little people tend actually to deal with something that can be called self-knowledge. I have here a book by a very famous contemporary philosopher, Dr. Ernst Mach, who has written a series of works that are very characteristic of this time. Already on page 3 of his title, Analysis of Sensations, speaking about the connection between the physical and the psychic, he makes a very characteristic remark. He says, quote, One day when I was a young man, I took note of a face in profile on the street that was unpleasant and off-putting to me. I was more than a little startled when I realized that it was my own face, which I had seen in two mirrors that were facing one another in a mirror shop. So, he was walking, and his karma took him by a mirror shop, where two mirrors were angled in just such a way that he was able to see himself. And there he saw this terribly unpleasant face, only to discover that it was his own. Even when it comes to what is purely external, it is not exactly easy to achieve even the most elementary form of self-knowledge. This man goes on to make another remark as well. 
he had become a university professor and had thus developed an idea of how a higher-level school teacher looks. Quote, Before long, I boarded an omnibus one night, exhausted after a very strenuous train ride, just as another man was stepping on from the opposite side. What a pitiful school teacher that is, I thought. It was, in fact, myself. For opposite me as I entered was a large mirror. Close quote. By way of explanation, he goes on, quote, The bearing that I had in the classroom was far more familiar to me than my bearing that night under those circumstances. Close quote. He had formed an imagination of what a schoolteacher looks like, and so he knew that the man who was boarding the train looked like a pathetic version of a schoolteacher. Only afterward did he realize that he was in fact seeing himself. This is a perfect example of how often our self-knowledge is very limited, even when it comes to external appearances. When it comes to self-knowledge of the soul, it is even more complicated. And yet this individual self-knowledge is nothing less than the most fundamental beginning of the path that leads through the human realm into the wide universal secrets of existence. When we observe the world externally on the physical plane, we are seeing only the things that belong to the most external aspects of the human being, that is, to the structure of the physical human body. We can say that when we turn our eyes toward all that we can see stretching out before us to the physical horizon, we are looking at everything that is related to our external physical human bodies. We must be clear that this is only one part of the whole of our being, and that behind it lies an etheric body. But everything that is similar to the etheric body in our surroundings as human beings is not something that we can sense at first. We have even less of a sense of the things that are similar to the astral body and still less of the things similar to the eye. Each of you, since you are primarily the sole example for yourself of something that has borne evidence out of the spiritual world into the physical one, you must go through your own proof of the spiritual world. Everyone who has experienced some part of initiation has done this, to be sure. Brunetto Latini knew this as well. Now for him, Dante's teacher and friend, it is particularly characteristic, and this happens often, that the process we refer to as initiation was triggered by a very unusual experience. Everyone who proceeds along the path of spiritual science is basically awaiting the moment that comes at one point or another when the gates of the spiritual world swing open, and they will open. It can certainly be the case, and is often so, that the movement into the spiritual world occurs gradually, that we grow slowly into the spiritual world. But it is also often the case that some sort of sudden occurrence, perhaps some sort of shocking or surprising life occurrence, befalls a person and causes the spiritual world to open. Brunetto Latini himself tells how he had been sent as a messenger to the ruler of Castile, and how on the way back he learned that his political party, the Guelph Party, had been driven out of Florence, and Florence had completely changed in his absence. This caused him great despair, this sort of despair in a soul constitution that is suited to the external physical world often serves as a starting place for the entrance into the spiritual world. He goes on to tell that in this state of despair he did not go home, but instead went into a nearby forest or wood. Recollecting this moment, he had to conclude that he was entirely out of his wits. When he came to his senses, everything was very strange for him. 
He did not see the typical world of the physical plane surrounding him, but saw instead a formidable mountain rising before him. He did not return to a consciousness oriented to the physical world, but instead returned to a consciousness that was connected to an entirely different world than the one that surrounded him physically. A formidable mountain where things came and went came into existence and then faded away again. And by the side of this mountain stood a woman, and things would come into existence and fade away according to her orders. Brunetto Latini saw the lawfulness of natural occurrences in the form of an imagination. All the natural laws and their lawfulness, the generative, interwoven, essential nature came forward in that imagination in the form of a woman who gave orders dictating how and when things should come to be and cease to be. We see here that he was living in the time of the 13th and 14th centuries, the time when natural scientific ways of thinking were beginning to draw closer. Brunetto Latini saw the things that were later given the abstract name of natural laws, things that later people would not want to think about as having any kind of being behind them. He saw them in an imagination, in the form of a woman whose spirit gave off what would later be abstractly called natural lawfulness, but in the form of a commanding word whose nature he also imagined. Then this woman said to him, so he says, that he should deepen his soul forces because this would allow him to move ever deeper into himself. Now it is interesting that even as she was shining her power down on him, she gave him the opportunity to move ever deeper into himself. This is the process of diving into one's own being. And the sequence of events that he describes is truly the correct sequence of initiation under certain circumstances. The first thing he learned, he says, were the soul forces. So by diving down into yourself, you learn to truly recognize the things that would otherwise remain unconscious, your own soul forces. But this knowledge is something that people tend to flee from when they really meet their own soul forces. For it, is, for it truly is often the case that these soul forces appear unsympathetic to us when we perceive them. And we say to ourselves, quote, Oh, what a terrible soul this is! Close quote. And people do not want to do that. It is just what happened to the good professor when he saw his own figure and it looked downright ugly to him. People do not want to see. In the choir of these soul forces, you will often see something that is a part of you that in your day-to-day -day life you do not ascribe to. But we see it in such a way that it works upon the whole of our being, on the elevation or also on the degradation of our basic nature making us either more or less useful for the collective being of the universe. So first we come up against the soul forces. The next stage that you experience is the four temperaments. It becomes clear how we are woven together out of choleric, melancholic, sanguine and phlegmatic temperaments and how this interweaving lies deeper in us than do the soul forces. And only after we have passed through the four temperaments do we arrive at what can be called the five senses in the esoteric sense. The way that we normally speak about these five senses refers only to the way that they can be known externally. We know these five senses only from without. We can come to know the senses inwardly only when we have descended down through the temperaments into the deeper regions of the self. 
then we see the eyes, ears, and other senses from within. In other words, we experience our own eyes and ears by occupying them from within. We might say that you have to imagine the following. After you have undergone this process of descending into yourself, instead of going through a door into a room and perceiving the objects and people that already are there, you move into the area, so to speak, of your eyes and ears. In this area, you can perceive how the forces operate from within to bring about the acts of seeing and hearing. You perceive a very complicated world, a world that someone who knows only the external physical plane has no inkling of. To be sure, some will say, quote, This world of the eyes and ears does not impress me at all. The world of the physical plane that surrounds me is large. But there, in the world of the eyes and ears, I am looking down into a little world. Close quote. But this is a maya. What you behold when you are inside your own ear or your own eye, EYE, is much larger and fuller than the external physical world. There you have a much richer world surrounding you. And only then, when you have moved through this region, do you arrive at the region of the four elements. We have also spoken about all the particular characteristics of these individual elements. Only then do you feel that you are within earth, water, air, and fire. Normally people are familiar with their senses from without, but here they get to know their senses from within. So here you move consciously into the eye from within, then break through the eye and move into the realm of the four elements. The same breakthrough could happen in the ear or with the sense of taste. You are constantly surrounded by these four elements, but you are not aware of what they are like inwardly. You cannot see what they are like inwardly with your external sense organs. Instead, you must first move through the sense organs from within and then leave them behind as though you had passed through a set of gates. You must climb into that realm through the eyes and the ears. You must slip through the eye, slip through the ear, and then move into the region of the elements. In this way you come to know the spiritual element that is living in this realm, the various forms of nature spirits and the beings and the hierarchies that are right beside the human being. Then you go even farther into the region of the seven planets. There you are very far outside. There you learn to recognize the creative forces that are bound together with us in the vast cosmos. And then you must stride across a great ocean, Okeanos, as it has always been known. Soul forces, four temperaments, five senses, four elements, seven planets, ocean. This act of striding across the ocean signifies the following. You can still reach the realm of the seven planets when the last part of your soul being, so to speak, is still present in the physical plane. But when you go through the gate of the senses, through the elements and the planets, then you must finally withdraw the last vestiges of your soul being to arrive at a state in which you are conscious but otherwise asleep. When you are in the realm of the planets, a part of your soul being still resides within your body. When you tug this free, then what you will experience is comparable to having to swim through the universal ocean of spiritual being. Brunetto Latini undertook all of this. He tells how he took each step at the behest of the woman who appeared to him in his imaginative knowledge. 
Then the woman urged him to go farther. But this admonition came to him at a very particular moment, and this is very characteristic. So, think about this. A man rides into a wood because he is perplexed about everything that has happened in his hometown. He arrives at a state of consciousness that does not lead into the physical world, but rather through all of the regions just described. Then comes the moment for him, and this is not an accident, as some might say, but rather happens at the woman's behest, the moment when he catches sight of himself there in the wood. After he had gone through all of that, after he had journeyed through the soul forces and the temperaments, and had traveled through the sense world into the elemental world, and perceived the rich spiritual life there, after he had perceived the seven planets, and journeyed through them and the upper hierarchies that enclose each other in ever-widening circles, only then, to find that he was no longer on solid ground, but rather swimming in some sort of ocean, after all of that, he awakens in the physical world. And this is the extremely important thing that we see also in all of these initiation processes, that the person in question makes a complete circle, ending up again in the physical world. After everything that he experiences, Brunetto Latini feels that he is once again in the wood. Now he is truly surrounded by all that surrounds him in the physical world. Shortly thereafter, the woman stands before him again. But now he has the physical wood around him as well, and she says to him that he should now ride on the side of right and justice. And she gives him indications about how he can arrive at philosophy, at the four human virtues, and at knowledge of the God of love. Take note of what significance lies behind this. People now would say without hesitation, quote, Oh, yes, philosophy. I know all about that. I studied the whole history of philosophy. I know what philosophy is and what it teaches. The four virtues, Plato said that they are wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. And as for the God of love, who doesn't know about him? You need only read the four Gospels. Close quote. In other words, people of our time know it all. But this is what is characteristic about spiritual knowledge. You begin to see that all of this is not actually known, that you first have to journey through an understanding of the spiritual world and must then return to the physical world as it presents itself. And only then will you understand that physical world. So, if Brunetto Latini were to rise from the dead now, and if a highly educated man of the present were to come to him, let us say, a very famous professor of philosophy, and if the professor were to say, quote, I know all of philosophy, close quote, then Brunetto Latini would answer, quote, Yes, certainly you are familiar with it, but in reality you know absolutely nothing about it. First, you have to become familiar with the appearance of the suprasensory worlds. You must know what the conditions are there. Then you will return to philosophy, and it will become something altogether new for you. Because only then will you get a hint of what you now believe you know so well. Close quote. The very same thing could also be described differently. Who would not find it absurd to say that a very famous philosophical mind can write a philosophical book that he does not understand? But he must understand it, must he not? If he is writing a philosophical book, how could it be the case that he does not understand what he himself is writing? 
It is not hard to write books now. They practically write themselves. The things that we have learned to repeat can be arranged in compositions. But to do this, you do not need to penetrate into the deeper meaning of what you are writing. This is the monumental thing that we encounter in Brunetto Latini, that he wants to understand, through spiritual knowledge, the things that others seek to understand through exoteric study. And only after he has made this trek through the spiritual world does he encounter the things that others believe they know through their work in the physical world, the knowledge of philosophy, the knowledge of the four virtues, the knowledge of the God of love. I would really like for you to fully understand what I have just said to you, my dear friends. To be clear, a certain degree of knowledge can be gained without spiritual knowledge. But these things appear in a totally new light, as something altogether different, when you first familiarize yourself with what lies behind the physical world. And because of the example of the connection between Brunetto Latini and Dante, which I cited today as a way of showing how exoteric, artistic creation is connected with initiation, because of this connection, we can see how Dante's great masterpiece is connected with initiation. Dante would not have been able to achieve his unique way of approaching the spiritual world if he had not had Brunetto Latini as a friend and teacher who bore him up into the spiritual world. Every epoch has its own way of seeking the spiritual world. In the centuries that preceded Dante's age, we see in the experiences of many initiates repeated instances of this woman that Brunetto Latini speaks about. Repeated instances of being led forward into the spiritual world by a woman. Several initiates in this particular stage of evolution, dating back to the 7th or 8th century, called this woman Natura, the creative force of living nature. Old initiates described this woman, this creative force of living nature, as the counselor of Nous, the principle that guides and creates the world, the wise reason that pervades the world as nous, and they called this woman a relative of Urania. Whereas nous is guided out in the cosmos by Urania, it is guided here on earth by Natura. And if you continue to pursue the matter, you can trace it back to a different means by which the initiates of older times sought to draw near to certain secrets of existence. And there again we find this woman in the form of Proserpina or Persephone, who wove the garment for her mother Demeter. So the imagination of this woman has changed over the course of centuries. But what we must take away from this is that the secrets of initiation have been at work in the ongoing stream of humanity. In order to approach these things properly, it is necessary that we fill ourselves with the living feeling that the forces at work in world events are not only the ones that we can perceive with our external senses and understanding, but also that the spiritual realm is also at work in everything. We must also contend with the fact that what people today and for some time now call spiritual development refers to nothing more than the development of forces that are connected with the physical body. Very often the term spiritual development is used to refer to the development of forces that are bound up with the physical body. This came about over time. We know that in ancient times, clairvoyance was the normal condition under which humans lived. This eventually faded and receded, and what is now called spiritual development is something connected with the physical human body. 
At the time of the mystery of Golgotha, something entered the evolutionary stream that is so great and powerful that we are only now really beginning to understand it. What people had up to this point was a sort of tradition, the very last gasp of the final remnants of atavistic clairvoyance was used by the writers of the Gospels to record what had happened. But as I said, this was the last gasp. And now we are beginning to truly grasp the first truths about the mystery of Golgotha through our newly developed powers of clairvoyance. We must understand that the coming time will be immersed ever more deeply in the mystery of Golgotha. We are standing only at the very start of this. Nevertheless, we are beginning. But the impulse of the mystery of Golgotha has been active in the world from the moment that the Christ lived out his life on earth. I have often stressed that if the only thing that people have received from Christianity is what they are able to see with their eyes, then they will not have gotten much from Christianity. If the Christ impulse were able to do its work only via what people are able to grasp by the physical senses, then they would have had very little of the Christ impulse during those first ensuing centuries. I have often given two examples, although I could offer many, that allow us to see how the Christ is active in the human soul, in the things that run through the course of humanity's historical development, but that people are not able to know anything about. Because truthfully, Emperor Constantine surely knew woefully little about the Christ impulse, even when he converted to Christianity and made it the state religion. But the victory of Constantine, the son of Constantius Chlorus, the Pale, over Maxentius, led to the introduction of Christianity in Rome. The whole arrangement is one in which special forces lay at the base, and as such the Christ impulse was at work in all of it. The Sibylline books were given to Maxentius to advise him. They told him, I mentioned this same example in the lecture cycle in Leipzig several years ago, how he should approach his battle against Constantine's encroaching army. But he also had a dream. Following this dream and the Sibylline books, he left the city with his army, which was four times larger than Constantine's, to march directly against Constantine. That was a huge mistake, according to all the laws of strategy. Constantine also dreamed that he would win if he had his army bear the symbol of Christ's cross, which he made them do. It was not the human wisdom with which people were blessed at that time that led to Constantine's victory. It was dreams. But through these dreams, something was actually at work that could not be grasped, that was in fact the living Christ impulse. Truly, the people could not understand what was active within them, active and living, carrying world evolution forward. They could not understand this thing that completely changed the face of Europe at that time. And again, we arrive at a time in which we can see how people squabble over all sorts of dogma with every ounce of their reason, understanding and capacity for feeling over dogma that seems altogether strange to the enlightened people of today, whether communion should be taken with one element or two, and so forth. We know how ferociously these battles played out, later resulting in Hussitism and Wycliffe and so on. But there were always conflicts like these. They are proof of how little human understanding could reach the true nature of the Christ impulse. But where, in a crucial moment, did the Christ impulse really shine through? I have often made reference to this. 
it appeared in some form in a shepherd's daughter, the maid of Orleans. And now we must be clear about the fact that this occurrence is almost like a tutorial in how the suprasensory spiritual forces were at work in human feeling during a period when they were not able to be at work in human concepts. Joan of Arc is a particularly interesting case. Her inner life was open and receptive, but the part that was connected with the physical body was not open. Rather, it was the perception of her etheric and astral beings that was open. But it was open and receptive in such a way that we can, in fact, see in her an analogue for initiation. How so? Recall now, if you will, that in a lecture recently we spoke at a pertinent moment about the history of Olaf Ostason and how he slept through the days after Christmas and awoke only on Epiphany, on January 6th. We noted several things in addition that during the days when the physical rays of sunlight have the least power, the spiritual power that encases the world is at its greatest. Therefore, it is only right that Christmas should come during the time of year when there is the most physical darkness. In darkness, spiritual illumination comes to those human souls that are ready for it. This is why we told the legend of Olaf Astason and how he attuned his inner soul life at that moment in just the right way, when the spiritual forces of light from the sun enter the earth aura at the moment when the external force of the sun is at its weakest. These forces took hold of his soul, and during the period of time leading up to January 6th, he truly made a journey that we could call an entrance into the spiritual world. The maid of Orleans was to be prepared for a great historical mission. The impulses connected with the Christ impulse that flow and weave through the world were to be present in her soul. They were to be there within her soul, but how could they have gotten in there? They would have been able to enter if the maid of Orleans had ever undergone something in her life similar to what Olaf Astason had done. If she had slept through the thirteen days after Christmas and then awakened on January 6. But she did not do this, at least not as Olaf Astason had done it. But then again, in a certain sense, she was in a sleeping state during that time so favorable to initiation, the last thirteen days of her embryonic state. Her mother carried her just so that she experienced the last thirteen days of her embryonic state in her mother's body during the thirteen days following Christmas. And she was then born on January 6th. That is the maid of Orleans' birthday. So this was a journey undertaken during the precise time in which the spiritual forces are weaving particularly strongly through the earth's aura. And so we need not wonder at the fact that the exoteric documents confirm that the residents of the village ran all throughout the village on that day, January 6, 1412, and felt that something significant had occurred. What had actually happened on that day was really known only later, when the Maid of Orleans carried out her mission. For those who are able to see into the spiritual, con spiritual connections here, it is of tremendous significance that our calendar tells us that Joan of Arc was born on January 6th. The connections in the world run deep, and any enlightened person can also know when the maid of Orleans was born. He or she need only look in the encyclopedia. But that enlightened person does not really know the first thing about it. 
Only those who understand the significance of January 6 through spiritual science will be familiar with the full significance of this fact. And so we see ourselves, through these two very illuminating examples, how we must go through an understanding of spiritual circumstances, only then to return to the earthly ones and understand them in the fullest sense of the word. I have also presented these considerations to you today to show that what we typically call spiritual culture in our time has grown old dry and brittle. Anyone who has any understanding of the deeper impulses that move through world and human evolution must come to understand that we must stand now at a moment of a renewal in which we ourselves will take part, both with our concepts and with our longing for the spiritual world. And the more intensively we are able to imagine that this renewal is needed, the more likely we will be to find opportunities to participate in the work for this renewal. It will no longer be sufficient in the future to simply change and reform the old. We are dealing with a radical renewal of what might be called spiritual life. Just as what we mean when we say spiritual science is altogether different from the things that are taught about the spirit in broader circles now, so too will the culture of the future be altogether different from the present culture. And if people now find it easy to think that what spiritual science urges is fantastical and foolish, this means only that these same people would find the spiritual culture of the future to be similarly fantastical and foolish. But in such a period, a rebirth of the human soul life must occur. All of the aspects of human life must live into this impulse toward renewal and rebirth. Everything artistic must again draw near to the process of initiation. And with that, we have spoken the reason for why we must try to make a start at this in our Gertianum here, which for all its of, it, of its imperfections is connected down to the last detail with what initiation science has to say to us at present. Only because this, excuse me, only because the experiences of spiritual science become living in our souls and come to expression in the form of living experience. Only because of this do the things that make up this building have any of the worth I mentioned, serving as a starting point for something new and not representing its perfection. We can only hope that things will be understood in this way and that especially within our circle there is a deep awareness of the fact that there is a connection between the things that we attempted to approach in spiritual science over the years and the things that are contained in every line and detail of our building. Then, when we ourselves are filled by this knowledge, then perhaps our building will be able to say to the world the things that it needs to hear. And then we will be able to look to the future with happiness, a future that must continue to work for ever more perfect versions of the things contained in the elementary, primitive beginnings of the Gertianum. The end of Lecture 3 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life in the World.
translated by Rory Bradley. Lecture 4, given in Dornach, on February 2nd, 1915. We have often had the opportunity in our discussions to draw attention to the fact that anyone who really wants to understand life and existence can never actually make the claim that life and existence are somehow simple things. The complexity and multifaceted nature of the world harmony into which the human being is woven must be constantly remembered. More and more we hear people now saying that truth, and by this they usually mean the truth about the highest things, must be quite simple. And people love nothing more than for someone to tell them truth about the highest things in such a way that they actually do not have to learn anything at all, but rather can receive it without any process of learning it out of themselves. Any person, as I have often mentioned, will admit that he cannot understand a clock if he has not learned to understand its interlocked gears and the rest of its mechanism. Only when it comes to the great, magnificent, powerful world creation do people want to gain some understanding without making any sort of effort. Now, all of spiritual science is there mostly to grant us an understanding, gradually and slowly, of the true sense and meaning of life and existence. Today I would like to add a little something to what we have already observed. In the process, I would like to add to the concepts and ideas that come up often, ideas that we have often taken up together. I would like to start with the fact that from the standpoint of spiritual science, we have often had occasion to say that the external existence in which we live is a maya, or indeed in quotes, the maya, the great deception. I have also emphasized that our world view within the tradition of Western philosophy cannot be one that understands our surroundings as a deception, in the sense of our surroundings being untrue. The world as such, the world that works upon our senses, and that we grasp with our understanding, is not a maya. This world is true reality in its inmost being. But the way in which the human being regards it the way in which it appears to the human being, this is what makes the world into the Maya, into the great deception. And if through our inner soul work we come to find the actual deep foundations of what our senses show us and what our understanding tells us, then we will quickly see the ways in which the external world can be grasped as a deception. For the world appears to us in its true light, in truth, when we know how to complete the picture of it, when we can perceive that it has things that remain hidden in the first moment of observing and considering it. This is what gives human beings our essential nature, worth and purpose that the cosmos, the universe, does not treat us like immature children who need to be spoon-fed the truth. It is a given that human beings must work hard to gain the truth by their own effort, the effort of an entire lifetime. The forces of the world greatly depend upon our collaboration in arriving at the truth. They are counting on our freedom on our dignity. Now, the whole of human life, as it plays, as it first plays out between birth and death, is a maya, a deception. This human life must be a deception because when we consider the world only in terms of its physical things and physical conditions, 
we always leave out the other side of the world and the human experience of this world existence. We leave out the things that human beings experience between death and a new birth. Now one might certainly say that we can understand human life between birth and death simply by observing and considering it. What use is there to consider the other side, the life between death and a new birth? But already this is a totally incorrect concept. For the simple reason that the life between birth and death is a reflection of the life between death and a new birth. Everything that we experienced in the life that preceded our current physical life is reflected in the life that we live between birth and death. To understand this reflection, we need to turn our attention toward two things. The first is that we consider certain stages, certain key points of our life between birth and death and investigate the extent to which these points are in fact reflections of things from the life between death and a new birth. Then we need to bear in mind that the life between death and a new birth is connected much more intensively with the unknown worlds that we speak about in spiritual science, with the conditions that played out before this formation of the earth, on old Saturn, the sun and the moon. These conditions on Saturn, the sun and the moon are much more connected with the life that we live between death and a new birth than with the life that we live between birth and death. We can even say that the life between death and birth is everywhere and in every way influenced by the bygone lives that we know as the preceding planetary lives of Saturn, Sun and Moon. The things that the Saturn, Sun and Moon lives affect in our hidden earthly life between death and a new birth is then reflected in the life between birth and death in such a way that the life between birth and death is a kind of mirror image of what occurred between death and a new birth. And the things that occurred between death and a new birth are directly influenced by the things that played out on old Saturn, old Sun and old Moon. We must consider certain key moments, certain stages of our earthly life if we want to better understand the process in detail. The first thing that belongs to earthly life is what we refer to as conception in reference to physical existence. After that follows the embryonic human life. After that comes the birth of the human being, its entrance onto the physical plane. Now, spiritual science reveals a very particular fact about human life. In the whole of the life that we spend in our physical body, we actually have only one condition that is necessarily connected with earthly life, which is to say that there is only one condition that can be explained purely in reference to earthly life, namely conception. Apart from conception, nothing else in human life has anything to do with earthly life directly and exclusively. I would like to really emphasize that word exclusively. What happens at the moment of conception has nothing to do with moon, sun and Saturn life. The causes of the things that happen in the moment of conception are generated entirely within earthly life. Since exoteric biology and exoteric physical science in general prefer to concern themselves only with earthly life and consider everything that has to do with moon, sun and Saturn life to be utter nonsense, this exoteric science can discover truth in the physical sense of the word 
only about the act of conception. For the same reason, when we read through the works of someone like Ernst Haeckel, we find that the most detailed descriptions are of the processes in the parent organisms that construct the human being and that there is a constant return to things that are somehow connected with conception. Think about that and compare it with what exoteric science has to say and you find that it is confirmed. The physical scientific consideration of these processes within the human being typically go back to the most simple single-celled form. This form of the single-celled organism from which the human being develops, it develops of course from the fertilized egg cell, did not exist on old Saturn, old Sun or old Moon. It is to be found only on Earth. And on Earth this kind of unification of cells occurs that is highly prized by exoteric physical science. This particular stage of our life is nothing other than the reflection of a real and genuine process that plays out prior to the moment of conception and is connected with human life. We are, of course, dealing with the last period of our life between death and a new birth, but also with the moment still within the spiritual world when we are physically conceived. At that moment something always happens with us in spiritual life. And conception itself is nothing more or less than a reflection of this process, a maya. The true process plays out in the spiritual world. And what happens in the physical world is a reflection of this, a maya. But what happens in the spiritual world is a process that plays out between the sun and the earth. And it plays out in such a way that the female element experiences the influence of the sun and the male element experiences the influence of the earth. So the process of conception is the reflection of a collaboration between sun and earth. This is to say that this process, which people so often demote to a realm that is altogether humiliating for humanity, is among the most significant mysteries. It is the reflection of a cosmic world process. It will be interesting to draw our attention to a few details here. As an individual draws near to the moment of entering into the earth once again, he or she forms an imagination in the soul of the parents through whom his re-entry will be made. How the individual is led to these parents is connected with human karma. This is something that bears repeating. But what I want to draw our attention to today is the fact that the person who is moving toward birth already has an interior image of what is physically present on the earth. In particular, the individual has an image of the mother. So the individual who is moving toward birth is primarily looking out toward the mother. Now, the image of the father and I would ask you to bear this in mind because it is a very significant thing, is there only in so far as the mother has the image of the father within her soul. In other words, the father is seen through the image that the mother carries of the father within her soul. Of course, this is putting it in the most radical terms, shall we say, but it is fundamentally the truth of the matter. You can really talk about these supra-sensory processes only by describing their essence, so that you do not come away with too fixed an imagination of this. I would like to add that, for example, nevertheless, if the soul spiritual inheritance from the father's side is to play a very significant role in someone's life, 
which is to say that certain soul spiritual characteristics had to be passed down from the father to the person being born, then it is possible that the individual might have a direct image of the father within him or herself. But the more this unmediated image of the father can be perceived, the more the image of the mother fades. The next stage of physical life on earth is the life lived between conception and birth. At the fundamental level, this stage of life, we call it the embryonic stage, is also a reflection of another process that takes place in the spiritual world before the one that I just described. Whereas in physical life, birth follows naturally from conception, the process of which birth is a reflection, actually occurs before the sun-earth process that is reflected in conception. This life that people live between conception and birth is already one that cannot be at all explained through reference to the other conditions on the earth, and the desire to give an explanation based on the forces and laws at work on the earth is nothing less than a very, very common bit of nonsense. This is because it is precisely the reflection of a pre-birth process that is fundamentally influenced by the things that remain from the pre-earth moon and the pre-earth sun. It is a process that plays out between the sun and the moon and in this way is truly a supra-earthly process. The forces that are active there are primarily those at play between the sun and the moon. Exoteric science has a vague awareness of this fact in its consciousness, for it counts the embryonic lifespan in terms of months connected with the moon, and notes that it encompasses ten cycles of the moon. Understanding it in this way We see that in the life we live between death and a new birth, we experience a real and genuine influence from the sun and the moon. And that later in our physical life, this process, which is a process of the sun and the moon, is reflected in the time between conception and birth. Please note that this word reflected is not, of course, being used in the physical sense. In the case of a physical reflection, you have the object and the image of it simultaneously. But here the true process is carried out prior to the moment of birth, and the reflection of that process comes at a temporally later point. The reflection, therefore, is the maya of a suprasensory process that occurs before birth. We must now turn our eyes toward the period of time between birth and the next important moment in human life that is often mentioned, the moment when we begin to develop consciousness of the I, the moment, uh, capital, the moment we begin to consciously say I. We can call this period true childhood. This period, the first childhood, or perhaps you would rather call it infancy, is again a reflection of a process that happens even earlier in the spiritual life. The real process that is reflected in the period when we begin to babble without connecting this speech with the consciousness of the I is a reflection of a process that plays out prior to birth, one that reaches even farther back into the cosmos. And during this process we can say that there is a collaboration between the sun and the whole planetary system that belongs to the sun, which is to say the sun and the planets that orbit it, with the exception of the moon. The forces that are at play between the sun and its planets work their way into our life between death and a new birth. And this process that happens long before our birth 
is reflected in the life we live during the very first years of childhood. From this you can see that reflections of things more removed from the earth than the moon are at play in the life of the child. This has an enormous and deeply significant practical consequence. The consequence is that during this period of the human being's life we should not disturb its ability to take up or make use of the forces that it has gathered. Just think for a moment about what is actually happening here. Before birth, forces from the cosmos have affected us, forces that are at play between the sun and its planets. These forces are in the child who has come into the world and stepped into earth life through birth. These forces want to radiate out from the child. These forces are really there within the child. In this sense, every child in its inmost being is an emissary from the heavens and the forces within want to emerge in the world. We can essentially do nothing more than give these forces the greatest possibility of emerging. Basically, this is the only thing that we have to do during the first period of the child's infancy. We may not disturb the forces that want to emerge from the child. There is something humbling about this knowledge. I would say, though people usually believe that they can be very significant for a child, the truth is that the most we can do is disturb as little as possible the forces that want to emerge. This is not to say that the person who rears a child is nothing to him or her. This is not true at all. For what emerges from the child, pay close attention to this, is after all a reflection. And the person rearing the child must give a sense of reality to that reflection. This reflection must be given a firm footing to stand on. Our task as nurturers and educators can be described as follows. Say we had an object that was reflected in a mirror here. Then we would have a reflected image. And we would need to bring something to that reflected image that made it firmer inwardly, for it is nothing more than an image. The human being comes into the world, in fact, as a kind of mirror image, and it must acquire a sense of firmness and reality to pair with this reflection. This is what is developed between birth and death. The things that want to emerge from the human being must be disturbed as little as possible. What emerges are the mirror images of the processes that we acquired from the cosmos prior to birth. But through our influence we must tie the things that emerge as mirror images to reality. And whenever we tie them to a false reality which is to say, whenever we intend to correct them, those are the times we are prone to disturb or destroy them. Those forces are supra-earthly. Now you can see the extremely significant consequence that comes out of this. Those of us who intend to raise a child are dependent upon the fact that in our own soul in which we live near the child, we have suprasensory imaginations and perceptions. And everything that we bring to the child that is connected solely with material imaginations and perceptions disturbs the child's development. People often ask what they can do to best rear a child. As with so many things, it is not so much a matter of coming up with a few ground rules 
that we can carry in our vest pockets or purses and use to guide our actions. Instead, we must start with ourselves and make an effort to carry a font of suprasensory imaginations within ourselves, to be filled with sense perceptions that reach up into the suprasensory realm. Such things are far more effective than what we might be able to achieve through external rules of logic and a pedagogy based on reason. A loving heart-mind, gemüt, that is filled with the supra-sensory world and whose perceptions are all deepened by this connection, is thereby in a position during child-rearing to develop a certain kind of cultus, religious devotion, shall we say, and please do not misunderstand this word, one that comes about because we love a being that has been sent to us from the spiritual world, that comes about through a spiritualization of the love for a child, that comes about because we are filled with the feeling that by reaching out our hand to the child, we are extending something to it. But we must also be a representative to the child of the forces that are not to be found on earth, but rather in the supra-sensory realm. Everything that one might elaborate about various pedagogical principles will be altogether fruitless so long as science treads on materialistic paths. Only what comes out of spiritual science will be productive for the true rearing of the child. And the most important thing is the work that we do on ourselves. Although we are able to accomplish a lot in the external material world by what we do, as a nurturer or educator, we accomplish much more through who we are. I would ask you to take note of that. We can take that as a motto for a good pedagogy. In the external world, you achieve things by what you do. As a nurturer or educator, you achieve things by who you are. Then comes the period in which the children achieve boyhood or girlhood, the period in which they are still being nurtured and educated, but in a different way than during infancy. This is the next stage, the next step that we will consider. It encompasses everything between the time when a human being first begins to consciously say I to the time when we can release the child out of the actual nurturing or education period, the time when the human being steps out freely into life, the moment in which the child is surrendered to the turbulence of life as either a well-bred or ill-bred person. This too is a reflection, an external maya, namely, a reflection of processes that preceded it. The true realities, as before, lie between death and a new birth. And in this process works the whole planetary system from the Sun to Saturn, or if you follow more recent astronomy, to Neptune. The whole planetary system is at work here with the stars. And the forces that play out between the stars and the planetary system are those that are active in us during the period of time when we are nurtured and educated. The processes that play out only on the earth tell us so little about human reality. We can truly understand the stages of human development during the period of nurturing and education, only if we are clear about the fact that during those times forces are at play in a person that are part of life in the broader sense. That broader life exists not only on earth, not only in the planetary system, but also outside of the planet's orbits, working in harmony with all of the stars and cosmos. 
if we have before us a child who can already say I, making the child a being that in a certain sense we can speak of as a human, we must be clear about the fact that living in that child there is a reflection of something that is active, not only beyond the realm of the earth, but also beyond the realm of the whole planetary system. For the later period of nurturing and development, what was said earlier is even more the case. That is the assertion that we will be able to arrive at a good pedagogy only when it comes out of spiritual science, when the teacher knows that beyond the planetary system lies a world that then unfolds within the human being. We arrive at good pedagogy when this knowledge is not only theoretical, but also felt and perceived completely, when the teacher has actually experienced the truth of this world beyond the planetary system for him or herself. Even when a teacher like this is somewhat fumbling and awkward, it can often be better than the well-articulated pedagogical principles of a materialistic teacher. For the things we fumble with, our foolishness, these things improve over the course of our lives. But the things that happen in the world because of who we are cannot be rectified in the same way. Among the things that spiritual science should metamorphose or transform, we should hope that it also allows more and more people to see that those who intend to be teachers or nurturers, which is to say anyone who intends to be a parent, need to see that they will become better teachers and nurturers by taking up spiritual imaginations that they collect in their own souls. If you want to become a good teacher, most of the work that you need to do is work on yourself. And before stepping into the classroom, it should be more important to the teacher to live fully into the material with his or her whole heart, rather than to acquire the best pos possible pedagogical guidelines about how to do one thing or another. And after the teacher has fully taken to the material and given birth to it inwardly through love, then he or she can fumble through the lesson, although I am not recommending it, and still teach more effectively than someone who steps into the classroom with a mind constricted by many guidelines and principles, locked up as though in a Spanish boot, knowing how to do everything in the most proper way. We know that for the moment things are proceeding in the world in very contradictory directions. Those who are to become teachers now are tested primarily on what they know, on how much content they have taken in. We might almost say that they are tested on things that they could find in books, and it might just be better to collect a library instead. They are tested primarily on things that you could find any time in a library if you know anything about research. When it comes to testing teachers, we should not be testing things that the teacher could easily find in the moment it might be needed. Less value should be placed on knowledge. On the other hand, every teacher must be extremely accomplished in the ability to connect his or her sensibility with the knowledge, the feeling that can be acquired for the development of the whole universe. The abilities of a teacher should be measured by the feeling that he or she has for human and world evolution. Then those who simply knew the most would fail their exams, and those who were good people in the spiritual sense would pass with flying colors. Eventually this will come to pass. It is what we must be moving toward, that someone who is not a good person, whose soul is not attuned to spiritual life, will someday fail the exam to become a teacher. 
no matter how much he might know. Even if he had all of the knowledge that people need to have now in just his little finger. It will be here that the door will open to placing less value on mere knowledge and more value on the whole unfolding and development of the soul. Let me stress one more time that our worth is not measured by what we accomplish in the external material world, by what we do. As educators and nurturers, our worth is measured far more by who we are. Now let us turn our attention to a full consideration of everything related to the real process that is reflected in the moment of conception. All of that belongs to earth. But insofar as it is a process that plays out prior to birth, it also belongs to the collaboration of sun and earth. It is simply completed within the earth aura. Within the earth aura, a significant spiritual process plays out prior to human conception, a process which is then reflected in the conception itself. What then plays out between this moment and the moment that is reflected in birth is in reality a pre-birth collaboration between sun and moon. This collaboration is essentially a repeat of processes that once played out on old moon. So, during the embryonic stage of human life, the reflection of a real process plays out, and this real process plays out before birth and is a repetition of processes that played out on old moon. In the same way, The processes reflected in the period between the end of infancy, the moment when a person consciously says I, and birth, plays out as a repetition of the conditions on Old Sun. What plays out before that, which is then reflected in the final stage of education and nurturing, is a repetition of processes from Old Saturn. And then, when we step out of nurturing and education into the world as well-bred or ill-bred persons, what processes are reflected then? At that point, processes from before the period of old Saturn are reflected, processes that do not belong to the visible world and never have, ones that have no correlative to the external visible stars the correlatives of the things that we experience up until the end of the period of our education can still in a certain sense be seen. The most distant stars that are nevertheless still visible have a relationship to these processes. But what we experience beyond that, the things that can still take form within us, belong entirely to the invisible world. When we truly reach the end of our education, we are released from the visible world altogether. And so, naturally, by this point, it becomes important that we enrich our souls, or that we have already enriched them prior to this moment, with truths of the supersensory world. For this is the only means by which we will find our way through life. Otherwise we are nothing more than puppets, led by forces that we are not actually meant to be led by. The human being who has no imagination of the supra-sensory world, following the reflection of old Saturn, during the end of his or her education and release into the world, is not in his or her natural element, but rather is taken along by invisible forces, just as a harlequin or marionette is dragged along by the forces and the threads that tug at it. To become a human being means to take up the things that spiritual science has to give. It does not mean becoming a puppet 
or marionette of the sensory world. It means getting to a place of freedom, which is the element in which the human being should move and live throughout life. Freedom can be understood only through such concepts, which do not come from the sensory world. For nothing that we take from the sensory world can make us free. This is what I had in mind when I wrote my title, Philosophy of Freedom, Readers Aside, also known as Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, also known as Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path, and of Readers Aside, in which I stressed that the foundation of ethics and morality must be identified through the, the moral imagination which in a sense can happen even without the perceptions of spiritual science. In other words, they must be founded on a foundation of moral imagination, even though morality should not be understood merely as a fantasy. Ethics and morality must be discovered through the moral imagination, through something that cannot be taken from the sensory world. The whole chapter that I wrote about the moral imagination is an affirmation of the fact that insofar as we live in freedom, we must understand ourselves to be in connection with something that is beyond the sensory world. This is a picture, built, but what must arise freely within this picture, its essence, lies beyond the visible stars. It is not drawn from the sensory world, but summoned by inner creative work. This is what was meant by the chapter on moral imagination. This consideration was intended once again to demonstrate the complexity of the network of connections in which we find ourselves in life. Just as life before birth is a preparation for its later reflection, so too is the reflection that plays out between birth and death a preparation for the spiritual life that will follow between death and a new birth. The more that we can carry out this life into the life between death and a new birth, the richer our development during that life can be. But even the concepts that we must adopt for that life the truths of the life between death and a new birth are altogether different from the ones we must adopt if we hope to understand this earthly maya. Several of these concepts that we must adopt can be found in the lecture cycle from 1914 titled The Inner Nature of Man and Our Life Between Death and Rebirth. There you will find a description of how we must adopt new concepts in order to understand the other side of human life, which runs between death and a new birth. Sometimes it is truly difficult to really work out the concepts and ideas that are needed for this altogether different form of life. And when you read through it, you will notice in a lecture cycle like that one that it is quite a difficult task to come up with ways of really expressing and describing these wholly different life conditions. At this time, when we are experiencing the death of several dear members of our anthroposophic life, I would like to draw our attention to one thing in particular. In the life between death and a new birth, the moment of death plays a different role than the moment of birth does in the lives we are currently living, the life between birth and death. The moment of birth is a moment that, in the normal conditions of our human lives, we do not remember. Normally, a person does not remember the moment of birth. But for the life between death and a new birth, the moment of death leaves behind a very deep impression. It is the moment that is remembered above all others. The moment that is always there in some sense, although in a different form than the one that it appears to have from this side of life. From this side of life, death appears as a kind of dissolution, as something it is easy to be afraid of. From the other side of life, 
death appears as the most brilliant beginning of the spiritual experience, as something that radiates outward like a beam of sunlight over the whole ensuing life between death and a new birth something that warms the soul through and through with joy during that life between death and a new birth, something that is looked back on again and again with the greatest fondness. That is the moment of death. If we want to describe it with earthly expressions, we could say that the most joyous and delightful thing in the life between death and a new birth is the moment of death as seen from the other side of life. If we have the sense from a materialistic worldview that the human loses consciousness in death, if we are not able to arrive at a proper imagination of the continuation of consciousness, parenthesis, I am speaking about this today in particular, because the impetus and occasion for this work is an attempt at coexistence with the dear friends who have recently passed into death. If it is so difficult for us to imagine that consciousness extends beyond death and we continue to believe that consciousness fades, for it does seem that consciousness must fade after death, if these things are true, then we must learn to be clear about the fact that they are simply not true, for consciousness is something brilliantly bright. And it is only because we are not yet used to living in the overwhelming clarity of this consciousness that we first enter a state akin to sleeping immediately following the moment of death. This sleeping state is, however, the opposite of the sleeping state that we experience in normal life. In normal life we sleep because consciousness has been suppressed. After death we are unconscious in a certain sense because the consciousness we experience is too strong, too powerful, because we are living entirely within consciousness. And what we need in the first few days after death is to gradually live into this overwhelming state of consciousness. We must learn to orient ourselves within it. If we succeed in orienting ourselves enough within it, rising up from the whole collection of world thoughts, we begin to have the feeling of distinguishing our past self. Quote, that was you. Close quote. In that moment, when we begin to differentiate our past earth life from the whole collection of world thought, we experience within that fullness of consciousness the moment when we wake up, so to speak. We might perhaps be awakened by an experience that played a particularly significant part in our life on earth, an experience that then also plays a role in our experiences after that earth life. So, it is a process of getting used to suprasensory consciousness, to the consciousness that is not built upon the foundation and support of the physical world, but that works in and upon itself. This is what we call, quote, waking up, close quote, after death. We might say that this Waking up happens through a process of fumbling with the will and eventually bringing it into balance. As you know and as you can see in the lecture cycle that I mentioned, the will, especially, can develop after death. In those earlier lectures, I spoke about the feeling will and about willed feelings. When this willed feeling life probes its way into the suprasensory world and begins to fumble about there, the moment of waking up occurs. These are things that, if the opportunity presents itself, we will speak about again at another time. The end of Lecture 4 
You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, translated by Rory Bradley. Lecture 5 was given in Dornach on February 5, 1915. During this time when death seems to surround us, I would like to touch upon a few spiritual scientific matters connected with the problem of death. Today I would like to offer a sort of introduction to these issues, then speak in more detail about several things connected with the theme tomorrow. And then on Sunday we will make the transition from these problems to more general questions of an artistic conception of life, which in turn will lead us back to some considerations of our building here. If we want to turn our attention toward the experiences connected with the problem of death, we must, above all, be clear that people are generally unaware of their own being, of the things that are woven in as part of that being. They are unaware not only of the deeper aspects of their true hidden being, but also of many things that play a very significant role in their everyday experiences. We must be clear that when it comes to the most important organs of knowledge that we have in the physical world, that is, in our, that is, our senses, we see things almost exclusively from the outside. And when we see things from the outside, like this, what we might call our skin actually acts as a barrier to seeing our actual, true, human nature. And whenever we assess our actual true human nature, whenever we want to gain some picture of this true human essence, we must make use of our understanding and our imaginative capacity. But this understanding, this imaginative capacity, is very heavily influenced during the course of the development that we carry out in our physical body by both Aramonic and Luciferic forces, and all of these influences that are exercised upon our understanding by both Lucifer and Araman tend to cloud our self-assessment and judgment quite severely. When it comes to human self-knowledge in our time, things are most often like they were in the example that I mentioned in our lecture last time. The university professor who told the story about walking along the street as a young man and suddenly encountering a young man who had a face that the professor found simply horrible, only to be shocked by the discovery that he had actually seen his own reflection because of the position of two mirrors that had presented his own physiology to him. We can see that he had absolutely no idea how he looked physiologically, and his features actually struck him as quite unpleasant. I also mentioned a second similar instance that the professor had mentioned. But things are no different when it comes to what we might call our more exact self-knowledge. The I, capital, and astral body accompany us along the path journeying into the cosmos when we have moved through the gate of death. But these withdraw from view during our physical life. For when we awaken, the eye and astral body do not reveal themselves to us. They do not show themselves to us in their true forms, but rather in the forms that are reflected by the pictures of the eye and astral body 
projected from the physical body and the etheric body. Of course, we would see the eye and astral body in their true forms during the time between falling asleep and waking up, but for the fact that we are in an unconscious sleeping state. Even the dreams that we have in normal life are poor representatives of our essence because they are only reflections of things from the etheric body that are then more fully developed by the astral body. Also, we first need to actually understand the language of dreams in order to arrive at the correct interpretation. If we do understand the language of dreams, then we are indeed able to gain knowledge about our true being from the processes that play out there. But in our usual lives, we are accustomed to simply taking up the images that dreams offer us. But this makes about as much sense as simply taking up the letters in a written text and describing their shape, rather than reading the words that they form. During our life between birth and death, our true being and essence withdraws from us. We must be clear about the fact that all of the feelings and the emotions of the will that bring about our actions and dealings, as well as our judgments and concepts, lie within the astral body and the eye. There, in the depths of our being, where the astral body and eye reside, is a whole world of emotions, a world of feelings and impulses of the will. But the actual view that we have of these emotions, will impulses, and feelings in everyday life is really only distantly connected, quite distantly, with what we truly are inwardly. Let us consider the following. It can certainly happen in life that two people encounter one another or live with one another for a long time. And because of the particular forces that are at work in the unknown astral bodies and egos of these two people, these forces remain hidden, after all, these particular forces might cause one person to have a peculiar desire to torment the other, a certain sort of need for cruelty. Now it can happen that the individuals who have this desire to torment or this need for cruelty, have no idea about the emotions in the astral body and the eye. And so, instead, they build up a whole set of ideas about the things that result from their need for cruelty. Ideas that explain their actions on the basis of something entirely different than this need. Such people might tell you that they did something to the other person for one reason or another. These reasons might even be very sharp-witted, but they are not expressions of the truth. The concepts that we use as motives for our actions or even for our emotions are completely removed from the things that are truly interwoven within our being. Yes, it can be the case that luciferic powers hinder the ability of the person in question to become clear about his or her own need for cruelty, the need to inflict all manner of things upon the other person. And under the influence of this luciferic power, everything that such individuals say about the reasons for their actions is there only to spread a cover, a mask, over the things that truly exist in their soul. The reasons that we consciously state can often be meant to hide or to camouflage from us the things that are truly interwoven and active in our soul. Often the reasons also come out of a desire to defend ourselves from ourselves. Otherwise, we would seem as unappealing to ourselves as the professor's physiognomy was to himself. Readers aside, I think before when it said physiology, 
that they may in fact have been the word physiognomy, talking about facial features. End of Reader's Aside. Here it's a, uh, sorry, Reader's Aside again. Here it does say in fact physiognomy, so I'm mentioning that. End of Reader's Aside. In our soul, it would make us unappealing to ourselves if we had to admit the desires and emotions that actually exist there. And because it is necessary for us to protect ourselves from looking upon the true essence of our own soul, we invent, with Lucifer's help, all sorts of things that offer us protection, that shield us from this by anesthetizing us against the things that are really there, interwoven throughout our soul. Just as it is the case that the things that appear to us in the external world become a maya through the unique qualities of our imaginative capacity, so too is it the case that the things we tell ourselves about ourselves are generally a maya in everyday life. Certain desires and needs of the inner being in particular always cause us to deceive ourselves about this true essence. For example, we have a person who is vain and conceited, one who suffers from a certain need for status. There is certainly no shortage of people like this in the world. We readily admit this. But if we did not place a mask over the things that we actually carry within our soul, we would go on to admit that such a need for status exists in many, many souls, including many who do not suspect that about themselves at all. Many people wish for more status, but when I say that they wish for it, please understand that this wish does not rise to the level of consciousness. This wish remains deep below the surface. People like this might wish to have a predominant influence on someone else, but because they would have to admit that this drive to influence that person bespeaks a vain need for status, they do not admit to it. Instead, they have to appeal, unconsciously of course, to that allure, that power to mislead that Lucifer is capable of exercising on the human soul in secret. And under the unconscious influence of Lucifer, such a person never says to himself, quote, this thing that is inside of me, which creates this desire to rule over others, is nothing more than a vain need for status. status close quote. These people never say this to themselves. Instead, under Lucifer's influence, they often invent a whole system to explain their feelings, which they feel somehow to be dark, even though they do not admit to their true nature. So it is that a person like this feels certain things toward someone or another, but cannot admit to himself that he actually wants to dominate that person and is perhaps unable to, because that person does not allow himself to be dominated. And so the soul that is under Lucifer's influence invents a system. He invents a system that tells him that the other individual in question actually has ill intentions toward him, and the system lays out all of these ill intentions in detail. He feels persecuted by these other people, but this whole system of judgments and concepts is a mask. It is only there to cover up the things that are not supposed to come up from out of the depths of the inner soul life, to encase them in a kind of shell, a true maya. Once a man told me a, a whole string of things that he had done and said that he had undertaken all of them out of a deep sense of duty, out of total commitment to the cause that he was championing. I had to contradict him. Quote, All of the opinions you have about the motivations for your actions are entirely inconsequential. The only thing that is of consequence 
when it comes to making a judgment about human behavior, is reality, and not the opinions that people have about their own actions. Close quote. In this case, reality demonstrated that the cause of his actions was the drive, the inclination to gain influence in a particular area. I said to this person, quote, though you believe that you acted out of a deep sense of duty, you actually acted out of a need, an egotistical drive to gain influence. And now you are reinterpreting these actions as ones done selflessly, purely out of a sense of duty. You are not interpreting things this way because that is how they truly are, but rather because you get pleasure out of these thoughts, because you delight in them. Again, this comes out of a certain egotistical drive. Close quote. The things that live and move in our souls can be extremely complicated and are often not the least bit similar to the opinions and imaginations that we have of them. It can be very, very complicated. You will readily admit that you have to know this if you really want to live in a world of truth and not a world of maya, and you also have to speak out about it, sometimes in a radical fashion. The reasons that we are really and truly led to do the things we do will only gradually become clear to us when we learn to really recognize, through spiritual science, the connections between the human being and the world. Let us take a specific example. You all know that there are people in the world commonly referred to as windbags. You all know that there are people in the world who might be referred to as such. If you were to ask one of these windbags why they all get together in a little coffee clatch or somewhere else and talk so much, they often talk about a lot more than they can account for later. If you ask someone like this such questions, you will hear any number of reasons why it is important that they talk about one thing or another. You can talk with people you encounter on the street who are hurrying off to one of these groups trying to get there as quickly as possible. And when you learn about what they are going to talk about, you will see that usually they are driven to talk about the most vain, most useless, dumbest chatter imaginable. And if you ask them why this is so important, you will hear reasons that sound incredibly beautiful, nice, and magnificent. In any case, they are very inclined to obscure the truth of the matter. Now let us point out this truth of the matter. What happens when we gossip? And when we just talk, the same thing happens, of course. What happens there? Now, you see, we are using the organs of our breath, our organs of speech, to put air in motion in forms that correspond to words. Within ourselves we generate these physical waves. And so it goes without saying that we also generate the corresponding etheric waves. Because whenever we speak, something very significant happens in the etheric body. We generate physical waves, the air waves, and then the etheric waves that correspond to our words and lend them the force of expression. Just imagine that, quite exactly, for a moment. While you sit there, well, no, not you, excuse me, while a person sits there with his coffee cup in front of him on the table, he sets an entire inner organism in motion, the inner organism that corresponds to the expressive form, the external, physical, and etheric expressive forms of his words. Indeed, he has something that lives and moves within himself. He generates that internally. But he also senses it. He perceives it. He perceives this movement of the physical and etheric bodies because the astral body and the eye are in continual contact with them. The astral body is in continual contact with the waves of the etheric and becomes aware of them 
and the I, capital, is in continual contact with the physical waves of the air. So the astral body and the I are constantly making contact and butting up against something when we speak. Through this contact we become aware of the I and of the astral body, and this is the greatest of human pleasures, the ability to take delight in oneself. In this contact between the astral body, the etheric body, the I, and the physical body, something occurs that is similar to what happens when a child sucks on a piece of candy. The refreshing and pleasant feeling of sucking on candy comes from the fact that the astral body is coming into contact with a process of the physical body, and through this contact a person becomes aware of himself. We become aware of ourselves through such processes. We take delight in ourselves. When people are in a hurry to sit down at the coffee table and gossip for an hour or two, the truth is that they are hurrying toward self-enjoyment. Self-enjoyment is what people look for there. One cannot become aware of such things if one does not know that the human being is a being with four parts, and all four parts participate in all the activity of the external world. Something else can also be there in a different way. In the example I just mentioned of the coffee clatch, we can see this in the way that people have a drive to enjoy themselves through the contact of the astral body and the etheric body, the eye and the physical body. But people also often have a need to make contact simply between the astral body and the etheric body. In this case, the etheric body has to generate movement, to generate inner activity in such a way that the astral body can make contact with it. Such things happen much more than other things in the unconscious. People have a drive to make contact between the etheric body and the astral body, which, are not actu- which we are not actually conscious of. This drive is lived out in the most curious ways. For example, we often see young men, though recently it also happens with young women, who simply cannot rest until they see their words in print. It is sometimes an incredibly wonderful feeling to see your words in print, but it is a wonderful feeling primarily because in seeing yourself in print you often give yourself over to the terrible illusion that you will also be read. Now, it is not always the case that you are read, just because you have been printed, but you believe it anyway, and this creates an altogether wonderful feeling. And some men, and as I said, young women too, simply cannot rest and are always unsettled until the day their work is printed. What does that mean? Well, you see... If we are printed and then actually read, which happens very seldom these days, as we all know, then our thoughts are carried over into another person and live on in that other person's soul. And these thoughts live in the etheric bodies of the others. Then the feeling takes hold in us that what we ourselves had in the etheric body as a thought is now alive out there in the world. We have the feeling that out there in the world our own thoughts are alive. If they are really out there, if they really exist out there, which is to say, if our printed text is actually read, then this also influences our own etheric body, and we bump up against what lives out there in the world. This is a very different kind of contact than when we simply bump up against our own thoughts. People do not always have the strength for it, because it requires a certain amount of energy to take these thoughts out of one's being and essence. But when your thoughts live out there, when you can have in your consciousness the idea that your thoughts are living out in the world, then your astral body bumps up 
against the things that you put out there in the external world. At least we believe this to be the case. This generates a sense of self-enjoyment. This sense of self-enjoyment lies at the root of everyone's desire for fame, the desire to be known, the desire for prestige. At the root of this drive toward self-enjoyment is nothing other than a need to experience contact between our astral body and the objectified thoughts of our etheric body, and through this contact to become aware of ourselves. So you can see what a complicated process it is, one that plays out between astral and etheric bodies, which lies at the root of something that plays a considerable role in the external world. I have, of course, not said these things in the interest of setting them up as some kind of moralizing scarecrow in your souls. It was certainly not intended as such. For everything that I have just described is part of the normal features of life. It is simply self-evident that when we speak, we enjoy ourselves, even if our speaking is not idle gossip. It is also self-evident that when we print something, even if it is because we feel obligated to say something to the world and not because of a desire for fame, we encounter the thoughts of our own etheric body. The same process is at work. So we should not conclude that we should always try to escape these processes or understand them to be fundamentally immoral, because I mean all of this symbolically. If you try to escape everything that comes towards you from both Araman and Lucifer, and I mean this symbolically, as soon as you become, excuse me, as soon as you became aware of anything coming toward you, you would have to get out of your own skin. It goes without saying that Lucifer and Araman have no other effects on us than those which are also fully normal realities of human life, except that Lucifer and Araman perform them in obscure ways, as I have spoken about in various lecture cycles. If you hold all of this up before your soul, then you will see how endlessly complex and multifaceted the threads are that play out between human souls, and also between human souls and the world. But at the same time, you will say to yourself that people really have such a limited understanding from the things that they perceive and imagine, about this relationship between people and the world. What we imagine about ourselves is really such a tiny piece of what we really experience, and this imagination is largely a maya. Only by making spiritual science into a true resource for life, and not merely a theory, will we be able to get behind the maya and enlighten ourselves about the things that constantly work within us. But the fact that we have only a small, largely untrue, piecemeal understanding of the worldwide web into which we are woven does not change anything. Things simply are as they are. All of these hidden forces, this hidden web that links human souls to one another and to the various agents of the world, All of that is there and is at play in every waking and sleeping minute of human life. And from that you can assess how much work there is to do in order to arrive at a true knowledge of the human being. But it is part of the feeling that we need to correctly perceive things that belong not to earthly incarnation, but to eternity and the infinite that we engage in the sort of considerations that we have just undertaken. Because by creating this nuance of sensibility within ourselves, we become aware of what actually leads to the conflicts that arise in life. These conflicts that arise in life and that are properly the content of both poetry and art come from the fact that during life we are swimming in vast, unknown and hidden waves of interconnection. We are aware of only a tiny, 
a large and largely false piece of this expanse of connectivity. But we cannot live only according to this tiny piece that we are aware of. We must live with the entire soul in relationship to the vast and multifaceted branches of life. And this is where the problem arises. How are we supposed to establish a proper relationship with what is really present in life? How are we supposed to properly understand what actually exists in life when we have an awareness of only a tiny piece, which is also false in many cases? Because we are not able to understand, it often happens that we find ourselves in conflict with our own lives. But there, where reality lies, there lies also the truth. Reality does not follow along with the imaginations that we generate about it. And in the moment that the opportunity arises for this reality to be active, we see in countless instances that this reality usually relentlessly corrects the maya of our imaginations. And this sort of corrective that reality offers to the maya of our imagination presents a very significant set of reproaches for art and poetry. Following in the line of thought from today's considerations, I would like to take something artistic, specifically something poetic, as a starting point, with the intent to then move into a consideration of the life between death and a new birth in tomorrow's lecture. Then on Sunday we will come to the artistic aspects in the broader sense of our building. I would like to begin with something artistic that has not been arbitrarily selected, but rather something that nicely exemplifies the knowledge of the reality of spiritual life that I have to describe. The example that I chose, I chose because in a small but truly excellent piece of art, the artist really hit upon reality. Only an occultist can assess whether this has happened, because in small pieces of art we can see how a person, when attempting to penetrate into the deeper problems of life as an artist, often cannot help but touch upon the occult side of life that that rises up from the depths in the conflicts that play out in life. The conflict that we often are unable to penetrate with the help of the maya of our consciousness. The thing that is important to me in an esoteric, artistic sense comes at the very end of a novella that I would like to offer simply as an example to you. Therefore, I will simply sketch out the beginning for you and then I will read the final passage aloud. We are not doing this simply for the sake of talking about literature, but rather because in this specific case a writer has described something according to the truest of esoteric laws that is, in fact, possible to describe. Since this novella was written back in the 1860s, you will ascertain from the facts that I am presenting that the things we speak about in spiritual science as needing to occur in the cultural movements on earth have actually always, in some sense, been reflected and prepared in human consciousness. And the things that are to become more fully conscious through spiritual science have always been reflected unconsciously in certain souls. Perhaps one of these souls was in fact somewhat conscious of it. But because the times were not yet right, he did not trust himself to bring this knowledge forward in any form other than in the unassuming guise of literature. Even now, People are much more forgiving when someone presents esoteric facts in the form of a novella or poem. In a materialistic age, people are much more ready to forgive than to forgive that than if someone simply steps forward and speaks the truth directly, claiming that such things are reality. If people can say to themselves, "Well, that is just a bit of fiction." 
they are somehow more ready to accept it. The novella is as follows. It is written as though one of the people who is a character in the novella also wrote it. It is a so-called I novella, capital I novella. This individual describes his friendship with Mademoiselle Manon de Gossin. The novella takes place in Paris and then tells that he goes day after day to the house of this Mademoiselle de, de Gossin, Gossin, who is a celebrated singer. He tells how he comes to know a wide variety of people who are admirers of this lady of the house, among them one man in particular who was always, always there in Mademoiselle de Gossin's salon. But the narrator, in describing what happens in the novella, notices that the man in question has feelings for the woman that go beyond friendship. And he also becomes aware of the fact that the singer does not reciprocate his feelings. What plays out then, and it plays out in a wide variety of ways, is actually a conflict that arises because someone with a burning desire for the singer is there, and while his feelings are not reciprocated, he is also not simply thrown aside. He is actually drawn in more and more, which only causes him to become more and more unsettled and agitated. The the narrator of the novella, who is not the author of the novella, it being a so-called I novella, notices this, and he means well for the other man. It needs to be mentioned that the narrator is engaged and is to be married in the following weeks, so there is, of course, no question of jealousy here. The narrator means well for the other man, and one day he lays things out for him. This opens the other man's eyes and he feels compelled to have a conversation with the singer. The result of this exchange is that the man leaves the house and retreats to an area outside the city. But despite having resolved never to think of this woman again, to forget her and busy himself with whatever else he can, he cannot manage it. He is unable to get out of that state of being unsettled. The thoughts that he had during his acquaintance with the woman keep playing over and over in his mind. He leaves the city and lives somewhere else for a time. During this time the narrator gets married and has to go away on a trip. On this trip he meets the other man at a hotel. The other man is in a terrible state. In the course of their conversation the other man tells how he retreated from Paris how he tried to live alone for a while, and then one day he went on a horseback ride beyond the grounds of his estate and unhappily encountered the woman's company, which was also traveling outside of Paris. This encounter brought all of his feelings back to life. Now he actually goes around with two revolvers, intending to end his life at the first opportunity. The narrator still means well, the other man and invites him to the place where he has made his home in the hope of being able to bring him around to different thoughts. The man accepts the invitation which was intended to offer him a kind milieu as a guest in someone's home, but he cannot bring himself around and he continues to sink lower and lower until he finally resolves to kill himself. The two friends talk with one another and the narrator manages to convince him to delay for a little while. The narrator says that he has to go away on a trip, and because he does not want to say, quote, wait until I get back at least, close quote, the other man might not have listened, he might have shot himself in the meantime, he forces the other man to make a promise that will truly bind him. He says, protect my wife until I return. After the other man promises him this, He travels to Paris again with the intent to induce the singer to come to the country so that something might be done to bring his friend out of this desperate circumstance. So he goes into the city and returns to the country with the singer. They drive to the fence of the country house belonging to the narrator. At the moment they reach the fence, the narrator notices a man who had been standing at the gate go running off. 
They drive farther along the road toward the house. There is a shot. The other had kept his promise and guarded his wife truly, but he posted a watchman at the gate who was to inform him the moment that the traveler returned. The watchman said to him, Now he is back. In that moment the other man shot himself. So the narrator brings the singer into the house, and from this point forward I would like to read you the words from the novella itself. Quote, In the evening we arrived at the castle. I noticed that as we drove into the park, a farmer who had been waiting for us took off toward the castle like a bolt of lightning. We had barely driven halfway down the drive when there was a shot. In that moment I was so filled with the feeling of success at my undertaking that I did not understand the significance of that shot. The surprise was not long withheld from me. We drove on and nobody came toward us. The coachman pulled up and I sprang out. Gossin behind me. The first thing we heard was the shriek of my wife's lady-in-waiting, who rushed to us, pale as a corpse, crying, He has shot himself dead, before sinking at our feet. We hurried to the Marquis's chambers and the room was full of people. I waved them all out, shut the door, and stood with Manon alone beside the young man's corpse, which lay on the ground. She stared at him blankly for a few moments, then let out a cry and sank to her knees beside him on the floor. She grasped his hands, laid her own on his brow. The wound was on his breast. She looked up to me, down at him, and then began suddenly to sing out loudly. This filled me with a sense of horror. I believed she had gone mad. In the meantime, one of my stewards came by who knew something of the medicinal arts and typically filled the role of the doctor when the risk was not too great. Never will I forget the look of deathly terror that was painted on his face when he glimpsed the pair on the floor, the dead Marquis and Gossin singing beside him. She fell silent then, stood up, gazed at me for a long time and left the room. I followed her to attend to her needs. She said, I must have room to myself. I led her to the first and best room available, fetched her lady-in-waiting, and hurried off to my wife. I heard to my delight that she had gone to take a walk and set off toward her so that we might share the experience with one another. As the two of us had spoken often of the Marquis and had considered among the many possibilities, that it might end in this way, she was less shocked than saddened. I accompanied her back to the castle and gave my orders regarding the Marquis. The corpse had been laid on a bed. His servant stood by him and wept bitterly, saying, My lord said to me that he would not shoot himself until you returned. That had calmed me. He had arranged with Jean in secret that he should watch out for the carriage. He did as he was told and barely had he returned with the news that the carriage had driven into the park, when my lord stood up, made a note in the book he was reading, reached into his bag, and gave Jean a louis d'or, took his pistols from the table, and went into the other room. Not a moment had passed after he shut the door, and then he was dead. I reproached myself. Perhaps I could have rescued him if I had written in more quickly. If Gossin had arrived on time, perhaps we might not have experienced this misfortune. I also thought that perhaps Providence had wanted to protect him from something even more terrible. For even if the singer had resolved to marry him, and I believe she might have, even though she had initially assured me of the contrary, such a step would not have been without its share of calamities, and might have resulted in a misery far worse than any other. I went to her. She was composed. You could not see the recent experience in her, so to speak. She spoke with me about the Marquis's temperament and his natural tendency toward such a tragic end. Although she was so composed, I sensed that the inner agitation she was experiencing was very strong, and I feared the after-effects. I introduced her to my wife. We dined together and then withdrew to our chambers. The next morning the change in her was remarkable. 
She said that she was doing well, but her appearance was so haggard, her bearing so disturbed, that the sight of her betrayed her claims. She spoke of leaving shortly and requested that a different room be prepared for her for the following night. This was done. We spent the day quietly, and she did not retire for the day until all of the arrangements had been made for her departure. The next day she did not come to breakfast. The lady-in-waiting bid me come to her lady at her bedside. She received me with a dull smile and was so pale and hollow-looking that I was unable to conceal my shock. Dear friend, she said, you find my appearance unpleasant and do not want to say it. Do you not find that a natural inclination? Yes, you are always so sensitive and reserved. But in this case, concealing it will not help. I feel that death is upon me. Dear friend, I cried out in horror. I feel it, for I have seen the Marquis the last two nights. Waking, stepping here before me, he is pulling me to him. I considered her attentively. There was no sign of hysteria in her eyes, no madness in her voice. When I saw him lying there in his own blood, she continued, the feeling that I had caused this misfortune grew so powerful within me that I cried out, because I could bear it no longer. I felt as though something incredibly urgent was crying in my ear, The fault is yours, you have murdered him. In order not to hear this voice, I began to sing ever louder, but I could not overpower the voice. I kept hearing it. That night I could not sleep. I lay there and gazed at the shadows cast by the furniture in the dim nighttime light. The door flew open and was nothing more than a thin, dim stripe. The Marquis slipped through it like a paper-thin smoke. He had his eyes closed and drifted or walked slowly toward me, stood beside my bed in person just as you are now but with closed eyes. I did not want to look at him, but he compelled me to. I had to turn my eyes toward him. Then he suddenly opened his own and gazed at me. I could not bear it. I lost consciousness. The night after it was the same game. I cannot bear it much longer. I feel him sucking the life out of me with his eyes. I tried to explain away the apparition with every explanation of physics, philosophy, and religion but she remained firm. I have decided to leave, she said. Perhaps his shadow is merely bound to this house. I was opposed to this. I could not allow her to travel alone, and I also could not abandon my wife to the trials that were facing us. Instead, I recommended that she move into my steward's house and promised to remain awake at her bedside the following night. She finally acquiesced to this and staggered about like a shadow. That evening, when she had laid, her, laid herself down in bed, her lady-in-waiting called me to her. I set a table with a light on it beside her bed, set up a Spanish wall about it, and then began, after speaking with her for a short time, to read a book. She appeared to be sleeping. The lights burned low, and I cleaned them, drank some wine and water, and looked at the door. The door was made of old wood and was not secure. Suddenly it flew open. The latch must not have been properly closed. I made to move toward it, quietly to close it without a sound, when turning toward Mademoiselle de Gossin in the bed, I saw her sitting bolt upright in bed with staring eyes. She stretched her arms toward me, grasping at mine, and pointing out straight with her finger, There, he is coming. Nothing was to be seen. Where, I said, there. I pulled myself free and stepped to the spot. Here? Come, she cried, he is standing in front of you. With one leap I was at her side. Cover my eyes, I cannot bear it. He is standing right there, he is touching your knee. I pressed both my hands to her eyes. Her breathing was ragged, but there was nothing to be done. After a while she pulled my hands away. I must see if he is still there, she said quietly. There is nothing here, dear friend, I replied, letting go of her. She glanced about. He is gone again. Oh, if only he were to come a few more times like that, things would will soon be happier for me. We will slip out arm and arm through the door. This idea made me shudder. 
She laid back in bed and declared that she would surely depart the next day and would go to a cloister. I tried to talk her out of this. Go to Paris, I said. There you will forget. I have earned it, she interrupted. And that you would ever suggest such a thing. I have earned that too. I will never forget. Him, perhaps, if he ever ceases to torment me, but not my guilt. That has been welded to me tightly. There is no guilt to speak of, I said. It was coincidence that he loved you, and you could do nothing to change that you did not love him. It was only natural, based on his dissimulations, that you would believe him to be cured of it. Oh, she cried, can a mother who has let her child fall into the water ever forgive herself? You believe that guilt comes only from ill will? Would it not then be possible to wash away all remorse through an appeal to greater necessity? When God makes us guilty of an act, he also wills that we must bear its consequences. It has been decreed that I shall always hear the rattling of these chains. I had quickly exhausted my counter-arguments. She left the castle, and I did not accompany her. The birth of a son tore me away from all depressing thoughts. I threw a party in honor of this happy occasion. The baptism, the first stages of raising the child, the tending to my wife, all of these occupied me so fully that anyone might find it understandable that I did not make any further inquiries about the beautiful and unhappy being to whom my thoughts turned from time to time. One time I received a package from Paris that had been given to my managing director there, addressed to me. It comprised an étui and a letter, both sealed. I broke the seal on the latter first. It was only a few lines. Dear friend, by the time you have this in your possession, I shall be no more. I knew that the Marquis would call me to him. Though he did not come again to disturb my nights, I carried something within my soul that took his place. Tell your bride that I have no happier memory than that of her kindness toward me. Protect your son against people like me. Grant the small picture that I have enclosed a small and quiet place. You do not need to break the seal. I do not want it destroyed. It should not come into the wrong hands. When you look upon it, please think of me and perhaps believe I had a heart, after all. Manon de Gasson I opened the étui, and the unhappy girl who had just informed me of her recent death looked up at me, possessing all of the enchantment that was hers during her most beautiful days. The tears welled up in my eyes, and I recalled all of the happy hours that I spent in her home. Close quote. Steiner again. Today we have here a very accurate description of how the etheric body of someone who has died can appear before another person. A very accurate description indeed. Immediately following the man's death, Manon de Gasson saw the wandering etheric body of the dead man. Today I simply wanted to show you how this sort of apparition was worked through in a novella from the 1860s. Tomorrow we will continue with a consideration of the appearance of the etheric body of a dead individual and what this can teach us about the secret hidden relationships that exist between people. Try to feel that there is a vast realm that is at play behind the tiny piece of reality, the Maya, that was present in the Manon, Manon de Gossin's consciousness. Try to feel that the things that played out as her encounters with the etheric body of the dead man in the hours following his death arose on the waves that emanate outward from this vast hidden realm. Indeed, this human etheric body has a deeper and more inward relationship to the various conditions into which we are woven in the cosmos than it does to our own self-knowledge and consciousness. The end of Lecture 5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. 
As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161 by Rudolf Steiner, 13 lectures entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, translated by Rory Bradley. This is Lecture 6, given in Dornach on February 6, 1915. Yesterday I presented the story of Manon de Gossin because it contains an accurate description of the after-effects of the etheric organism, the etheric body, following death. It goes without saying that not every novelistic or artistic depiction of such things can be presented as I have done, because the artist might have created instead a highly inaccurate depiction, and one might end up presenting something false. But I selected an example that depicts the after-effects of the etheric body in a truly accurate way. It relates to the actual facts in an objective way. This is one of the first things that you encounter in spiritual scientific knowledge, that when a human being steps through the gate of death, the etheric body, astral body, and I capital, dissolve their connections with the physical body, and a kind of transitory state begins in which the physical body is on one side, and the etheric body, astral body, and I, still connected with one another, are on the other side. Of course, we know that after a relatively short period of time, the etheric body separates from this grouping and the human individuality remains connected with the I as it undertakes its journey through the cosmos with the astral body during the time between death and a new birth. Now we must be clear, and recently I have stressed this often, that the etheric organism, the etheric body, is predetermined to carry us through earthly human life to maximum old age. A person who reaches old age has, of course, the same etheric body that he had as a child. So if a human being, during one of his or her incarnations, must leave the physical plane early, one example that comes readily to mind is our dear Theophice, thereby causing the etheric body to separate from the astral body and the eye, then this etheric body finds itself in a different circumstance than if the individual had reached an older age, which would have allowed the forces within the etheric body to be spent over the course of decades. The forces and energies that are still present in the etheric body when a person dies young could have been applied to a longer life if the individual's karma had allowed the person to remain on the earth. This application amounts to nothing more than an ongoing use of the etheric body. An etheric body that separates from an individual who dies at a young age has a lot of unused energy within it. These forces are still contained in the etheric body. These forces and energies which have now passed over into the spiritual world, are ones that could have sustained a physical life for a long time. It goes without saying that these energies are not destroyed or negated when a person passes through the gate of death. For nothing is destroyed. And this is far more true of the spiritual world than it is of the physical world. All energy and force simply transitions to another form. We know, of course, that this law of the conservation of energy has played a big role in the physical sciences since 1842, when it was introduced by Julius Robert Mayer. It is applicable everywhere. 
even when it comes to the most basic things. For example, if you run your hand across a surface, you use energy and force. This energy is not lost. The spot becomes warm. The force and energy of pressure and friction is transformed into warmth. No energy, no force is ever lost. It simply transforms. Energy in the spiritual world is also never lost. We can say that, in the spiritual world, the energies of the etheric body that come from those who die young, which will no longer be used to sustain a physical life, are instead applied to everything connected with the human individuality that lives on in the eye and the astral body. These energies that would otherwise have been used for the individual's existence on earth are instead used in the spiritual realm. They remain in the elemental world, just as the etheric body itself dissolves into the elemental world. Within the elemental world, these energies form a true reservoir of energy, an energy source. This is indeed a very significant phenomenon for it illuminates for us the connection between the physical world and the spiritual world in a concrete fashion. It does not amount to true knowledge to imagine abstractly that the physical world is connected with the spiritual world, or that the spiritual world lies somewhere behind the physical world. The spiritual realm that lies behind the physical world is a wholly different provenance. There are many different things in the spiritual world that immediately surrounds us that can be traced back to those unused energies of the etheric body. The art of clairvoyance, which is particularly significant for physical human evolution on the earth, owes much to these unused etheric energies. The things that these etheric energies infuse into the elemental world that lies directly behind our physical world are particularly stimulating to both clairvoyant and spiritual scientific knowledge. Make sure you grasp this fully. We can be grateful to those like Theophyse who have passed on before their time because their etheric bodies have given much to our elemental world, and many, many spiritual influences have streamed directly from those etheric energies to us. I think that I need hardly say that such influences can extend only from those souls who die according to a truly natural progress of their karma, and never from someone who has died because of an act of human will, such as suicide. In those cases, things are very different, because the fertile energies of the etheric body are destroyed by the resolutions that come out of the consciousness maya that I spoke of yesterday. It is this form of consciousness that produces all resolutions about death when one is still alive on earth. This is just a side note, as I mentioned. All this is to say that the etheric bodies we have just been discussing lie at the base of the spiritual impulses that we experience. The spiritual movement that we serve must therefore show extreme gratitude for the things that are given to it by these energies, as we can surely recognize. Perhaps I also do not need to point out how significantly this enriches our knowledge of the kind of love and tribute that we owe to those who have passed on, based on our ability to distinguish between the gratitude owed to those who have died at a young age and those who have died at a ripe old age, who have taken up the otherwise unused energies of the etheric body into their own individualities. Those who die at an older age 
and we have also experienced this in recent weeks, take what would otherwise have existed only in the etheric body and incorporate it into the astral body. Those individuals have taken something that would otherwise have been cosmic and made it human. This process, then, causes the significant spiritual impulses of which I have spoken to emanate from the individuals themselves. And so these individuals have a great effect on the world because these impulses can then be taken up in the hearts of individuals who do not have access to spiritual, scientific or clairvoyant knowledge. Individuals who engage only with normal impulses in their everyday lives can be influenced by spiritual impulses, thereby enabling them to have as part of their souls something that flows into the spiritual world in a more human and less cosmic way, in which our souls are already always embedded. Thus we have denoted several different things that can be sought in what I would like to call the spectrum of death, the etheric organism that remains behind after the eye and the astral body have detached from it. I would like to call this the spectrum of death. This spectrum contains the kinds of forces that I have just described. But there are also many other things present there, In order to study the other things that are a part of it, we must go back to something that I sought to place before your souls by presenting that passage from the novella. Here is a fact that I told you about and that you can see in the events of the novella, that a karmic connection existed between Manon de Gassin and the man who eventually shot himself, a connection that is, of course, the result of prior earth lives spent in contact with one another. Such a karmic connection exists in all works of literature. These ongoing connections, particularly the strongest and most significant among them, can be traced back to the fact that the karmic connections that existed during the prior earth lives were not lived out to their completion. Manon de Gossin finds herself in an encounter with a man who loves her. She does not understand his love, and her consciousness maya makes her bristle at the idea of fully living out her karma. This leads to the conflicts that can be realized so effectively in art. Because people's consciousness maya always makes them rebel against things that are karmically predetermined. Of course, these things cannot simply be done away with. I do not mean to say that karma can simply be done away with. Indeed, it must be lived through in the next incarnation. A person cannot escape his or her karma, except in the most infrequent of cases, and in those cases the karma must still be transformed but the soul can attempt to not live out its karma fully during an incarnation. When this happens, the kinds of conflicts arise that we see in the novella. A person leaves the physical plane, and that karma has not fully taken the form that it was supposed to take. But the course that karma should, in quotes, take is not inscribed into human nature. One's karma should perhaps reach a certain stage of fulfillment. But to some extent, by failing to recognize our karma in a particular incarnation or by striving actively against it, we can push off the fulfillment of that karma to a later incarnation. But it is still within us, inside of us. We, quote, wash the karma out, close quote, as it were, out of the experiences of one lifetime lived between birth and death. And this is how the things were washed away that Manon 
de Gossin and the man who loved her would have experienced had they fulfilled their karma. It is washed away from the physical events of their lives. But the place that it cannot be washed out of, the place from which it cannot be erased, is the spectrum of death. There it remains as will, or even as desire, shall we say. And so it is that after such a person dies, this spectrum of death follows the will of its unfulfilled karma. So if Manon de Gassin seeks rest, then at the appropriate moment the spectrum of death comes to her from the very reason, excuse me, for the very reason, that the will which should have brought the two of them together continues to live on in that spectrum of death. The things that should have occurred but did not are then enacted by the spectrum of death insofar as such a spectrum is able to carry them out. So in this regard the circumstances that are described in this novella are very accurate. We can say that aside from the things we have already discussed, the unfulfilled karma is also contained in this spectrum of death. And after a person dies, something occurs in the elemental world that is like the unfulfilled karma being played out through a sequence of images. Now, take careful note of this. We are really dealing with something twofold here. When a person dies with unfulfilled karma, it is necessary for that karma to be fulfilled in a later incarnation. That will happen at some point in the future. But in the spectrum of death, something like a prophetic, imagistic depiction occurs of what will one day have to play out what should have already played out but did not. So when you consider the spectrum of death with clairvoyant vision, what you experience is unfulfilled destiny and karma. We can say that in the human spectrum of death, a process occurs that could have occurred during life but did not. Thus, an image of processes that could have been life processes can be experienced in this spectrum of death. This is a very significant esoteric condition. The factors that comprise human individuality, the eye and the astral body, move almost immediately after death into a kind of cosmic existence and remain connected for several days with the spectrum of death with the etheric body in such a way that the unfulfilled karmic will of human individuality is active out in the cosmos as part of the spectrum of the death. Then, after several days, what belongs to the cosmic sphere separates from the particular and unique being that an individual had through the connection with the physical form. A form that the soul had taken on only because it was enclosed within a physical human body. The eye and the astral body do not have this physical human form. But the spectrum of death and the etheric body also have approximately this physical human form. And over the course of several days, the spectrum of death loses this human form because once the soul has separated from the physical body, it loses this human form. The physical body had, through its own power, contained this spectrum of death within its form. Once the spectrum of death is outside of that form, it takes on other forms that are determined by the external powers of the cosmos. In a sense, it is therefore quite understandable that an accurate description of the exit 
of human individuality from the physical body, which takes place together with the etheric body, must be described as though the spectrum of death rises up in more or less the form that once belonged to the physical body. So if someone wants to describe the moment of death accurately, he or she will describe how the etheric body rises up as though it were a cloud. And in rising up, it maintains the form of the physical body with its arms and other limbs, only then to dissolve slowly into the more spiritual forces of the cosmos that begin to work their way in. This is a transformation, a metamorphosis, a transition. Clairvoyant imagination is difficult for us because the human being is bound up with time and space during physical life. That is, with those forms of time and space that we have available to us in our physical bodies. With three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time with its past, present and future. And many people have a tendency, when engaging with purely spiritual perception, to cling to these ideas of three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time with its past, present and future. We can indeed speak about space and time in relation to the spiritual world, but they are truly different there. This is the difficult thing. The words we use for the physical can only be poorly applied to descriptions of the spiritual world. When you speak about time in the physical world, what is past is truly past. The past lies behind us, and we can grasp it only in memory. In direct visual perception, we can have only what exists in the present before us. The spiritual world is not the same. Things are already different when it comes to the elemental world. There the past can also be present immediately before us, just as the present exists before us in the physical world. So, you can look upon what is past, upon what has already happened, upon the things that for the intellect can only be grasped in memory the things that you can no longer look upon in external life. Once you have stepped through the gate of death, you can look upon an earlier moment in time from a later one. It is just as though from a later point in space-time you can look upon something that is physically past, as though it existed in the present. Just as I can look from this physical point where I am standing over at the corner there. The past is really there. It stands as a living thing before us. It surrounds us. Such a perspective becomes particularly living when the sort of thing happens that happened to us recently when we had to cremate our dear friend, a situation in which her first experience of consciousness occurred in the moment when her physical body was consumed by flames. In this moment her consciousness became active, but before the physical body was surrendered to the flames, we had the memorial service. And this memorial service can be observed by the deceased right now, just as though it were were something happening in front of her in the present moment. Such things belong to what we might call the most esoteric aspects of our esotericism. But over the course of many years, we have striven to have as many opportunities as possible to speak with one another about such mysterious processes in the way that one might otherwise speak about the typical events of the day. And what we can say is this. Our esoteric lives will have a much, much more energetic and intimate character after the difficult period of war that we are currently undergoing than they ever had before. For many people, because of this general suffering, 
it will become possible to go much deeper into all sorts of areas that we currently must keep silent about, because we are currently living in a period of great transition for humanity. This is precisely because of the suffering that humanity has undergone. And I do not mean individual suffering, because that always leads to egotism, but rather the general and universal suffering that collective humanity has experienced. Let us take a more intimate look at this process, whereby human individuality, which is to say the eye and the astral body, together with the etheric, step out and depart as a threefold human being from the physical body. This is a process that lasts for days, but begins when the human being moves through the gate of death. This process shows in a particularly living way how cosmic forces can be present in the human etheric body. But it also shows, as we have now seen, the unfulfilled karma. This is a process that is truly different for each individual person, a process that is not the same for any two people. This is also why it is so difficult to describe these things, because they are not the same in any two cases, but rather always slightly different. When we look closely at this process, it becomes very clear that there are many different things within the spectrum of death. I simply cannot describe them all at once. But if we are at least aware of two particular things that are contained in the spectrum of death, we already have a more intimate understanding of it than we would if we just connected a phrase, the idea of the etheric body, in quotes, to the spectrum of death. Unfulfilled karma is within the spectrum of death, and this brings about the possibility of generating artistic conflicts the possibility of bringing unfulfilled karma into connection with these processes that occur after death. A purely exoteric artist will have to be satisfied with simply establishing the conflict and then letting his characters die. But when the artist contends with esoteric conditions, parenthesis, for example, in Shakespeare's works, as I have mentioned at various times in the past when I have talked about the things that lie behind Shakespeare's works. When the artist shows the connection between events and deeper laws of life, when the artist describes circumstances with a consideration of the things that lie behind the external processes, then the result is the sort of thing that we have in Hamlet, for example. There we have a truthful depiction of unfulfilled and untransformed karma playing out in what we see in Hamlet's father. In that sense, the dramatic conflict for the major players of the drama, for Hamlet himself, begins largely through the influence of his father's unfulfilled karma. An artist who is in the position to grasp the connection between the physical world and the spiritual world, will often feel compelled not to allow a character to fall away at the moment of his or her death, although that is how the monists and the materialists imagine it, but will instead give some indication that this passage through the gate of death is actually an entry into new experiences, into new processes that are more concrete than the concrete life processes that play out between birth and death. In order to show how art can strive to be enriched by turning the moment of departure from earthly life into the continuation that extends into spiritual life, I spoke to you about the novella from which I read an excerpt yesterday but it is generally interesting to observe how a person can arrive at a perception of unfulfilled karma, 
how a person can describe something that can be felt in the fullest sense of the word as unfulfilled karma. And if the artist has described unfulfilled karma, then he may also feel compelled at the end of his artistic depiction to consciously point out the fact that it was unfulfilled karma. And this can lead the artist to feel compelled to depict the ways in which this unfulfilled karma can be expressed through a sort of genuine elemental imagination that can come about when we take up life in its totality and not merely in its physical aspects. In connection with this, I would like to speak about another piece of art whose content I can outline only briefly, much more briefly than yesterday, because in this case I am dealing with a two-volume novel. You will also, excuse me, you will see that in the depictions it contains, something about unfulfilled karma also emerges. I will try to indicate as quickly as possible the extent to which unfulfilled karma is expressed in this work of art. A mother comes with her daughter from America to Europe. The father died some time ago in America. On their trip, they encountered the descendant of an old noble family, deeply rooted in tradition. A wide variety of processes then play out. For those who can observe things and their connections with the spiritual world, it immediately becomes clear that karmic connections are woven between the man who is named Arthur in this work of art and the two women whom the man simply sees on the street as they are going into the theater. These karmic connections then lead to the complicated relationships that play out. They play out in such a way that the whole opposition between European culture, which has grown old, and American culture, which is still young, is depicted in a great cultural tableau. The absolute opposition of these two cultures is depicted with penetrating insight and devoted love. Its representatives are Emmy, the daughter, and Arthur, who encounters her and begins to love her fiercely. The opposition is then reflected in these two souls. And many things occur that for those who have their eye on spiritual scientific connections appear immediately as results of the karma that is at work between the two of them. In a sense, the external milieu that one contends with when dealing with the coming together of an American and a European worldview is something that is connected with the fresh American culture, untouched by historical traditions, and the antiquated European culture that lives entirely on the basis of traditions. In the whole context of this milieu, something lives that is reflected in these two souls, bringing about conflict after conflict. This ultimately leads to the last great conflict, which comes about because of Arthur's father, who has passed away, and who owned a tract of land and manor. He still stood entirely in alignment with the traditional worldview of the old nobility. But he had also grown apart from the old noble traditions with his money, or rather with the spending of his money, which has happened so often in Europe. And the land and manor have fallen into debt. The estate, the estate has been sold, and Arthur has inherited the value of that estate. Now, in the most elegant fashion, which is not always the case, it happens that because of the way in which the American relationships are established with the European ones, a small improvement comes about. Emmy is able to help with her money, which is to say that her mother can buy back the estate for Arthur. This happens, or at least it it is supposed to happen. On the estate, There is an unknown offspring who has remained there. He cannot say where he came from, but he conducts himself like a vagabond there on the estate. Of course, it does not belong to him, but in his imaginations, which we might call mad, 
he gets the idea that he is the lord of the estate, and this brings him to the idea that the estate should belong to him. From, this pers- from his perspective, if the estate is to be repurchased, this is a violation of his rights. But his rights come only out of a sort of decadent madness. He considers himself the lord of an estate that has long since been surrendered to the bank. He carries on like people who are mentally disturbed tend to do, in a way that is not exactly dangerous. And so a conflict plays out that causes this man to grow furious about the sale of the estate, and as soon as the opportunity presents itself, he goes out and shoots Arthur on the estate. Emmy has already gone through several terrible experiences, and now she has to go through this one. As a result, she develops a kind of sickness that carries on in her disposition. At this point, she is going into her twenties. Her mother brings her to Montreux ill, and there in Montreux she is attended to by a Mr. Wilson, an American who is depicted in the most sympathetic fashion, as well as by a few others who are there. The way in which Mr. Wilson is described is truly a wonderful moment, an absolutely remarkable passage of this piece. In a way, all of North America is alive in him. This is brought to life in a wonderful fashion. But Emmy cannot be healed, despite the fact that she is attended to in such a way by this doctor who has come into her life, by this man who is in some sense Arthur's rival, but who is also his old friend. She dies in Montreux, and her death is described. So let us consider from a spiritual scientific perspective that here, in the utmost sense of the word, we are dealing with unfulfilled karma, with karma whose threads have been broken everywhere, a karma that has led to conflicts, conflicts that play out primarily between America and Europe, a karma that was concluded with a gunshot. Those of us who can perceive this, if we are not materialistically inclined, will have to ask ourselves, quote, where is reality? Where does this unfulfilled karma go immediately after death? Where does it live on? Close quote. I would like to suggest that anyone who is not a materialist has some sense of the way in which this karma lives on, And so, those who are artistic must then feel a need to give some indication of the way in which it lives on. And we find just such an indication at the end of this work. Now, I need to read you a few lines. Arthur is dead. He has been shot. Mother and father have traveled to Montreux. Emmy has been ill for a long time. And Arthur appeared to her in her last dream. But it is immediately evident to us that this is not merely a dream image, a dream of reminiscence. Rather, we are dealing here with the influence of the real Arthur in the physical world. And now the moment of Emmy's death is described as follows. Quote, Between midnight and morning she thought that she awoke. Her first glance toward the window, through which the dull illumination streamed, was free and clear, and she knew where she was. She even heard her mother, who was lying next to her, breathing. But not one moment had passed, and then she felt a pressure like she had never felt before, and she was overcome with fear. It was not just those individual thoughts which had tormented her in the last few days, but rather the sense that a giant hand was holding all of the mountain ranges of the earth above her by a thin thread. And at any moment those fingers that held the thread might open, and the whole mass of them would crash down on her. To remain there on top of her for all eternity. She let her gaze roam about both inside and out, seeking a shimmer of light, but no light offered itself. The glow of the window had vanished, Her mother's breathing was no longer audible, and suffocating solitude surrounded her as though she might never again 
reach the world of the living. She wanted to cry out, but she could not. She wanted to move, but none of her limbs obeyed her. She was completely still, completely dark. She could not even grasp onto thoughts any more in that state of terribly monotonous fear. Even her memory had been taken from her, until, finally, one thought returned. Arthur. And now, wonderfully, it seemed as though this one thought transformed into a point of light visible to the eye, and to the extent to which the thought grew into a boundless yearning, the light grew as well, approaching and expanding, suddenly springing about and reforming, taking the shape of Arthur, standing about her. She saw him, and she finally recognized him. It was, without a doubt, he himself. He smiled and was close to her. She did not see whether he was naked or clothed. It was simply he. She knew him too well, he himself, and not merely a phantom that had taken his form. He stretched out his hand toward her and said, Come. His voice had never sounded so sweet and enticing as it did that day. With all of the strength she had, she tried to raise her arms toward him but she was unable to do it. He came closer to her and reached out his hand toward her even more. Come, he said again. Emmy felt as though the strength she was using in her attempt to make one word cross her lips would have been enough to move mountains, but she was unable to utter even that one word. Arthur looked at her and she at him. If she were only able to move one finger now, She could have touched him. And now the most terrible thing. He seemed to be moving away. Come, he said for the third time. And she, feeling that he had spoken for the last time, that terrible darkness might break again over the heavenly sight of him, filled with a fear that tore her apart the way that frost cracks tree trunks, she made one final attempt to raise her arms toward him but she was unable to overcome the weight and the cold that held her fast. Just in that moment, before her very eyes, other glowing arms grew up out of her arms like a bud bursting into flower. Other glowing shoulders grew out of her shoulders. These arms extended toward Arthur's arms, and he took her hands in his, slowly retreating and pulling her along with him, and with her the whole luminescent form that emerged from Emmy's body. Close quote. Steiner again. This is a wonderful description of the moment of death, the exit of the etheric body, the transition of the spectrum of death into the cosmic realm. In this spectrum of death, which is described as being spiritually visible, As it exits the body, the self-determined life-will is contained. The unfulfilled karma that exists between Arthur and Emmy is contained in the expression of this spectrum of death. I am presenting this example to you because in the novella that I mentioned yesterday, you could see how the spectrum of death came only to the one person who was still living establishing a relationship with that living being. Here, on the other hand, we are dealing with two purely spiritual entities, with the etheric body that comes from Arthur, which has already undergone a number of transformations in the spiritual world, and the spectrum of death from Emmy, which is just beginning its exit from the body. So in this case we have an old, unfulfilled relationship, unfulfilled karma between Arthur's etheric body and Emmy's spectrum of death, which is just beginning its transition into the spiritual world. In the spiritual world something is playing out that was unable to play out during life, something that had been left as unfulfilled karma. We must try to really and truly understand these first moments that are experienced 
after a human individual passes through the gate of death. Indeed, the things that remain there as unfulfilled karma separate from human individuality in those moments. The human individuality can fulfill that karma only in later incarnations. So it separates and becomes a part of the cosmic world outside of human individuality. It turns into cosmic events and experiences, and some of the things that happen in the clouds, on the mountains, and in the springs, in the things that happen in the unconscious soul processes of the human beings who live here on earth, the unfulfilled karma, that primal source within the spectrum of death that is taken into the spiritual world, is at work, expending its energy and fulfilling itself in all of those places. For cosmic events are constantly at work in human life. We are entirely filled by them and interwoven with them. And so, we must differentiate between what becomes cosmic, as it were, and what remains individual when a human being moves through the gate of death. What remains of the physical body becomes cosmic in the fullest sense. This either happens slowly in the case of a burial or more quickly in the case of cremation. The physical remains transition into the elements, which is to say the world of Earth's physical elements. And it is a very materialistic imagination to believe that these remains simply disappear or play a role similar to the one played by chemical elements. This is nonsense. And tomorrow we will see how the forces that have great significance for the planets continue to live on in them. These remains live on in planetary life. The chemists know nothing about what becomes of the physical body. The most significant condition on earth is the fact that the human being has lived on it and died on it. These are the most important forces that remain. The earth is also made up of the physical aspects of people who have died. In this way, the physical body becomes something cosmic. The other aspects of what becomes cosmic come from the etheric body. And today I have tried to indicate how the cosmic aura becomes cosmic. The rest of what remains from the etheric body lives on as individuality in the higher spheres. You will find more detailed descriptions of this in my book titled Theosophy and also in title An Outline of Esoteric Science. Part of the etheric body lives on as individuality. And I will have more to say about that tomorrow. However, we must be clear about the fact that what lives on individually begins to live in a set of new conditions that are fundamentally different from the typical ones we experience on earth. If you study the Vienna lecture cycle about the life between death and a new birth, you will come to understand some of this. It is possible to describe only some aspects of it at one time. Above all, you can make a clear assessment about the conditions between death and a new birth only if you grow accustomed to living with the imagination that linear time as we experience it, past, present and future, is nothing more than a physical maya that we penetrate in the moment of death. In the moment of death we break through into another world where the past exists not merely in memory but rather stands before us and surrounds us as though it were the present. A world where the human being lives under conditions that reveal its inner being in the form of its external being. People live there in such a way that their inner soul being is revealed and made visible, 
the same thing that was given form by the physical body and physical existence here in the physical incarnation between birth and death. The way in which we must begin to learn to conduct ourselves in relation to those who have stepped through the gate of death relates not so much to an attempt to see them as visions, but rather to have an inner experience of community with their experiences. The individualities of those who have stepped through the gate of death are still there, fully and completely, even though, as I mentioned yesterday and as I will continue to discuss tomorrow, human beings who have moved through the gate of death first have to orient themselves in the flood of consciousness that is experienced. But their essential being is there, even if they are not always connected with their consciousness. They are there, and they can be seen. It is possible to share in the experiences, so to speak, of the essential being of those who have passed through the gate of death. You see, I have made an effort in relation to the sad experiences that we have gone through on earth with the loss of dear friends. I have made an effort whenever I have had occasion to speak, to speak from out of the souls, out of the essential being of the people in question. Tomorrow I will be speaking about something different, but I would like first to say a few things about the three friends of ours who have died recently, inasmuch as I am able to do so here. My only effort here is to speak out of their souls, to speak with the voice of their souls, so to speak. And now if I look back on it, I find that there were good reasons, very good reasons, to speak in an individual and different way in each of the three instances. The three people are, after all, different from one another, and I really do mean to speak in a different way, in the fullest sense. I readily admit that this was not part of my consciousness as I spoke the words. The words developed entirely out of the situation at hand and words that are to be used for spiritual science, and also for things that are a part of life but connected with spiritual science. Such words develop best and most truly when they are not influenced in even the most subtle way by life wishes and desires. If you want to speak properly and truly in the realm of spiritual science, you must hold yourself totally separate from every wish to express one thing or another. You must hold at a distance every desire to have things be one way or another. When you find yourself called to speak at the memorial service for a dear friend, there is of course no desire on your part to have to be in the situation where you need to speak those words. This seems totally understandable. The words are not said out of any sort of desire, but out of necessity. It is understandable that in every single instance of this sort of thing, the only wish you might be feeling is the wish to not have to be speaking such words. This is something, I would like to suggest, that positively influences the generation of words. This is why it was particularly important for me and I say this with great humility, that in the first instance for our dear friend Frau Grossheinz, I spoke merely as the expressive organ for her soul itself. A soul that has lived a long life on earth, one that in its last years of earthly life connected itself with all of its powers of soul to the impulses of spiritual science so meaningfully and energetically, connected itself in a more selfless way than most of us are able to do, when such a soul moves through the gate of death, these living spiritual scientific impulses are really living there in the soul, not just theoretically, but in a very practical way. They are simply alive there in the soul. 
They are there even if the soul has not yet awakened to the point that it has begun to perceive them. They are there and this is the characteristic aspect of the part that separates away. And so you will admit that something lay in the words I spoke today that we might call transformed spiritual science. Spiritual science transformed into will and feelings that must emerge from the soul because it has lived through a long life on earth and moves through the gate of death full of rich etheric forces. And in these instances one is obligated to speak from out of this soul. This is why it was not possible to say anything except what the soul itself might have said. And so those words came, quote, Into the cosmos I will bear my feeling heart, which grows warm in the fires of holy forces. Into the world thoughts I will weave my own thought, that it might grow clear in the life of life's eternal becoming. Into the depths of soul I will plunge devoted meditation, that it may grow strong for the true goals of human striving. Toward God's peace I will strive through the struggles of life and its cares, preparing myself for its higher self. Toward work-loving peace aspiring, within me the intuition of cosmic being, I would fulfill the human duty. So shall I, awaiting, live toward my star of destiny, which grants me a place in the realm of spirit. Close quote. Steiner again. The inner living movements of the soul are represented by the fact that first at the beginning of the ceremony the words had to be spoken Quote, toward my star of destiny, close quote. And then at the end of the ceremony again, quote, toward my star of destiny, close quote. It is the proximity you must have to the one who has passed through the gate of death that causes words like this to be produced, which are particularly fitting to the being corresponding to the person in question. I would like to connect what I have to say about the other two friends with other thoughts that I will share with you tomorrow. The end of Lecture 6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings, please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner, translated by Rory Bradley, and it's entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, 13 Lectures. This is Lecture 7, given in Dornach on the February 7th, 1915. In the previous lectures, we considered what might be called the problem of death, and we have connected that with several painful experiences of the recent past. The first thing I would like to do today is draw your attention to a few more general things connected with the problem of death, as well as a few things that can be investigated with the tools that initiation knowledge provides us with. We absolutely must understand that when human beings pass through the gate of death, they enter a world that is entirely different from the one we usually think of. It is a completely understandable tendency of human nature to imagine that the realm that lies on the far side of death, the spiritual realm that we enter through the gate of death, is similar to the realm of the senses and reason that we occupy between birth and death. I say that it is 
also an understandable tendency to imagine this realm as a sort of continuation of the one we currently occupy. But this is a mistake. It is difficult to find words within the treasure chest of our language that make it even a little bit possible to sufficiently describe what is experienced between death and a new birth. I have often mentioned that our language is well equipped for the physical world and that we must, in a sense, develop a deeper and more inward-looking relationship to these words if we hope to make them capable of expressing what lies on the far side of death. The way in which these words are to emerge from the soul when we are describing something that lies on the far side of death must also be entirely different from the way in which words emerge from the soul into the sensory world, into the world of reason. This way of speaking about the spiritual world and its beings and events is much more an act of giving oneself over to the spiritual world, an act of allowing the words to be conferred upon you by that realm. The kinds of words that I spoke yesterday in relation to our dear friend Frau Grosseins were not formed in the same way that one might form words when expressing something about the external physical world. Rather, they were poured into our souls by the being of which they spoke in such a way that this being actually gave those words, poured them forth leaving us not with the feeling that these words had expressed and objectified something that we then beheld. Instead, we were left with the feeling that something is being expressed through us, that we are simply the expressive organs that allows something to be objectified in a spiritual expression. It is, therefore, an entirely different process a process of giving oneself over to this being so that it might find an opportunity through the mechanisms of our being to express its own nature and its own inner experiences. It is not a matter of adapting to something external, but rather a matter of giving over to the being in question, a matter of placing our words at the disposal of that being so that it might then use our words to express itself. All of this is to say that here we are dealing with an entirely different way of relating to objectivity than the way practiced here in the world of the senses and of reason. This is why a certain flexibility of the inner life, a certain ability to align with various individualities, an enduring ability to step outside of oneself and give oneself over to another individuality are all among the most basic prerequisites for establishing a proper relationship with the spiritual world. If you hope to really and consistently hit the mark, if I may use that phrase, when expressing things about the supra-sensory world and about what lies and about what lives in those who have passed through the gate of death, you must above all else be cured of what could be called earthly egomania. One must be filled with the ability to think not only of oneself, to not be at the center of attention. If you have a strong tendency to talk about, to talk a lot about yourself or to think a lot about yourself, you must overcome this tendency because talking and thinking a lot about what yourself is really the worst way to get to self-knowledge. If you have a tendency to talk a lot about yourself or to judge everything in such a way that you consider yourself, your position in the world and your significance to be more important than everything else, if you have these tendencies, then you are ill-equipped to find your way into the spiritual world or say anything about the spiritual world. 
In the spiritual sense, we engage with ourselves the most when we engage with ourselves least and think about ourselves least in the earthly sense. The thing that is most interesting to us in the earthly sense, the connection between the world and our own person, is the most insignificant and meaningless thing for the spiritual world. Thus we will always find that the path into true spiritual reality becomes the most difficult for us when we feel continually compelled at every opportunity to speak about ourselves, about what should happen to us, about what our potential value might be to the world, and so on. When we live our day-to-day lives in this way, then even in that daily life, which is also ruled by spiritual forces and impulses, we find that things are not right. All sorts of notable connections can be found here. I have come to know people who constantly complain that they find it incredibly difficult to get up in the morning. People who say they find it difficult to resolve to pick themselves up. I have even come to know people who have readily admitted that if there were not an external reason compelling them to get up in the morning, they never would. You can always find an inner connection between a person's way of being in the world and such a tendency as this. Generally, there will always be people who tell you a lot about themselves, about what they like and do not like, the good fortune or misfortune they have encountered, and so on. Those of us who want to prepare for a truly objective grasp of the spiritual world must pay attention to these things. For we must observe and consider life if we want to enter into reality. And of this you can be certain. We as people are always naturally disinclined to obey the directive to take life objectively. We have no greater inclination than to take ourselves completely seriously and consider external life with minimal seriousness. Only gradually do we struggle to arrive at the words that can become good, true light motifs for life. In the case of great geniuses, we often observe how much they undertake, only then to express all of their life's wisdom in a single word. When they express such a word, it takes on a completely different meaning than the one it has in the course of daily life as spoken by someone else. I pointed this out once before. It was during the lectures held in Norköping. I How easily you can say the great and penetrating phrase from the Apostle John, quote, children love one another, close quote but it means something entirely different when some fool, some oaf, running around in the world says it, and not John, who said it at the end of a rich life, during which he lived through many, many things on the earth. When it comes to words, it is not simply a matter of what is correct or proper, but also a matter of the soul foundations that underlie it, of the depths from which it springs. Goethe also strove throughout a rich life to arrive at a beautiful phrase, whose depths ought also to be fathomed. But you cannot plumb these depths simply by believing, in reference to this phrase, that it can be understood by anyone who has lived long enough. Arriving at an understanding of it by this means, it is far too simple. And this may sound paradoxical. Any child is actually capable of this sort of understanding. But the way in which it must be understood, when you understand it, as Goethe did, on the basis of an incredibly rich set of life experiences, is beyond the understanding of any child. I am speaking about the phrases, quote, You yourself live with the world in peace, Close quote. The connectedness of these two sentences, and this is the heart of the matter, 
shows us that there is no self-knowledge that does not lead to a life led in peaceful communion with the world. I would like to discuss all of these things in as much detail as I can, because they are far more important than you might at first believe. But I can really only point them out to you and then leave them to you to meditate upon. In any case, I would like to point them out to you since many people have been saying that there is a lack of good material to meditate upon. There really is no lack of good material if you simply have the good will to allow life to provide you with the material for meditation that emerges from life itself. Now, once we, as human beings, have stepped through the gate of death, we are immediately brought out of all of the maya-like conditions in which we have been living, the conditions in which we have been ensconced for as long as we were living in a physical body. We are brought out of those conditions because they have been imposed upon us by the very fact of our incarnation in a physical body. Above all, we are taken away from a great many routines and activities that we had come to enjoy during the life between birth and death. Those are things that we can no longer do after death, of course, because we lack a physical body. Life itself becomes entirely different, as does our relationship to the world. And if you meditate on the Vienna lecture cycle titled The Inner Nature of Man and Our Life Between Death and Rebirth, you will gain a picture of the way in which we have to relate to the world if we want to form true concepts and ideas about the life between death and a new birth. You need only try to live into the words, to inwardly enact the words that were expressed in a stammering and halting fashion there. With such things, this is always an urgent necessity. During the past few days, I have already drawn your attention to the fact that the moment of death can only be superficially compared to the moment of birth into physical human life. For on a day-to-day basis, if unsupported by clairvoyant knowledge, we do not remember back to the moment of our birth into the physical body. The capacities given to us by the earth do not allow us to remember how, let alone that, we were even born at all. If there are people today who believe that they know everything there is to know with nothing more than their senses, They are forgetting that their senses cannot even offer them an experience of the moment that began their earthly life. We know that we were born only because others tell us that we were, or we know on the basis of a syllogism that is often not even conscious, but rather one that we formulate unaware. If we do not seek the aid of clairvoyance, These are the only two methods by which we can convince ourselves that we were in fact born. You can have someone else tell you that you were born or formulate a syllogism that goes like this. Other human beings were born. I am like those other human beings. Therefore, I must have been born at some point. A true and proper syllogism. There is no other method available to the capacities we receive from the earth. We must either be told about it or we must formulate this syllogism. So our effort to seek enlightenment about our birth already begins to enlighten us about the fact that it is not possible to find a real foundation for truth in the senses alone. The moment of death is thereby unlike the moment of birth insofar as we can always, in the spiritual world, look upon the moment of death, whereas the normal faculties of the physical body do not allow us to look upon the moment of birth. In the spiritual world, during the time between death and a new birth, we can always look upon the moment of death, once 
we have successfully brought it to consciousness for the first time. There it is, but not in the same way that we see it here as an experience of fear. It stands, rather, as a wonderfully magnificent life experience. The soul-spirit human beings exit from its physical sensory shell. The liberation of the will and feeling impulses from the thought being that had been flooded with objects. Let me read that part of that sentence again. The liberation of the will and feeling impulses from the thought being that had been flooded with objects. The fact that after death the human being is not immediately able to glimpse this moment of death is not because we have too little consciousness once we have died, but rather the opposite. We have too much consciousness. Just remember what was said in the Vienna Lecture Cycle. We do not move into a life of too little wisdom, but rather into too much wisdom, into a seemingly unending and all-encompassing flood of wisdom. It is impossible to be unwise after death. This wisdom comes to us like a light that washes over us from all sides, and we actually must learn to curtail it, to gain orientation in an environment in which we have at first no orientation. And so by attenuating the high level of consciousness to a level of awareness that we can bear, following upon the earthly preparation that we had before death, by attenuating it to this level, we arrive at what might be called the moment of awakening after death. Immediately after death, we awaken too much, and we must tone down this overwhelming state of being awake, must dampen it to the point that is appropriate to the capacities that we developed through the experiences we have had in various earthly incarnations. It is a struggle to master ourselves in this overwhelming state of all-encompassing consciousness. And then comes something from which all of us must recover, both those who have passed into death and also those who intend to properly enter a process of initiation must recover, in a sense, from the things that we have grown used to in our physical sensory lives. In order to make this understandable, I would like to connect it with another experience. When we began our spiritual scientific movement with a very small circle of people in Berlin, we were joined by all sorts of people. We were a very small group back then, one day, not long after we had begun our work, an individual came forward and declared that she needed to step away from the work. The reason she gave was that we were not on the right path. According to her, it was not important to be seeking all the different things that we were seeking. The only thing that should be sought is unity. This was a sort of ide fixe for the person in question. In a long conversation, she elaborated on this ide fixe of unity, and then she left us to go and seek it. This person believed that by seeking unity, she would enter into the suprasensory world. But this idea of unity is actually nothing more than the final abstraction of external physical life. This quest for unity is actually the most sensory thing that the human being can look for. We must be cured of this drive for unity if we hope to find a proper place in the spiritual world. Here, in the sense world, it is such an obvious thing to say that we must strive for universal unity. We must look for the unity within multiplicity and diversity. But this is really significant only for the sensory physical world. 
Then we step through the gate of death, and we are no longer within a world of multiplicity and diversity, but rather within something that comes before us as an overwhelming and all-encompassing consciousness. Once we have stepped through the gate of death, we have nothing more or less than unity all around us. There it is a matter of finding multiplicity and diversity. There our only quest must be to emerge from unity and move into multiplicity and differentiation. Now, I would like to give a truly fitting imagination of how you move out of unity and into multiplicity. Just imagine for a moment that we step through the gate of death and into this world of overflowing spiritual wisdom. This is the world that we first move into, a world that is initially confusing when we awaken in it. Let us imagine this world in such a way that we can see an overflowing light surrounding us, a unity that completely fills this world. This is how it first appears to us. We cannot even separate ourselves from this all-encompassing light. The unity is so strong that we cannot differentiate ourselves from it. We have no sense of separation between ourselves and this world. Instead, we are completely integrated into it. Everything is part of a single unity. But now let us think about the answer to a question. I would ask you to think for a long time, and not just a moment, about the answer. Now let us answer this one question. What is it actually, this unity into which we have been integrated? Think about all of the beings of the upper hierarchies. You know about nine of them, or ten if you include the human being. In every level of the hierarchies there are a great number of beings. All of them have thoughts. It is not just the human being who thinks, but rather all of the beings of these upper hierarchies as well. So just think about the huge number of beings that we join when we step through the gate of death. They are all around us. When we step through the gate of death, we are integrated into the whole collection of spiritual beings. We do not perceive them at first, but we are among them. What first surrounds us is the sense of unity. But what is this unity made of? It is made up of the thoughts which drift in and through and around one another of all the beings of the hierarchies. This thought world of the hierarchies is composed of the undifferentiated thoughts of all the different hierarchies with no distinction drawn between what one being thinks as contrasted with another. All of that blurs together into one unity. We grow and extend into these thoughts of the hierarchies. This is the overflowing being of light and thought that surrounds us. This is the unity. We come to live in the thoughts of the hierarchies, blurred into one another to form a unity. This is what we come to live in. And so what must we do in this life after death? What is important is that we establish a relation to the individual beings, that we rise up out of the ocean of thoughts, wherein all of the thoughts of the hierarchies blur together, and establish relationships with the individual beings in their multiplicity. After death, we do not need to establish a relationship with the unity of overflowing thoughts from the hierarchies, because that is already given to us. Rather, we must work through this unity until we can establish a relationship to the individual beings of the hierarchies. How do we do this? At first, this blurred ocean of thoughts from the hierarchies washes over us. Because of the things we have acquired during the time spent in our physical body, our inner being, rising up out of its sensory casing, remains at the gate of death, which we look back toward. 
This being gives us strength of will. Will impulses oriented toward feelings. Feeling impulses oriented toward the will. We become inwardly aware of these impulses as we behold the being that rises up from the physical body, the being that we are after death. This allows us to radiate beams of will outward, so to speak. And now, when we radiate these beams of will, which are created out of the energy of death, born in the moment of death, when we radiate them outward into our surroundings, we extinguish something at a particular point in the spiritual world. And when we direct our will elsewhere, we extinguish something at a different point. And the same is true of a third point or a fourth. In short, at various points in the spiritual world, we extinguish the overflowing world of thoughts through the application of the force of our will impulses. And by extinguishing this thought world at that point, the being of the hierarchy who lives within the spiritual world steps into the frame around this hole in the thought ocean of the hierarchies. In the physical world, we must try to find thoughts to apply to the things that we see. But in the spiritual world, because the thoughts are constantly surrounding us, we actually have to extinguish the thought, to push it away. Then the being steps before us. We must become the master of these thoughts, and then the being approaches us. And the power to become master over the thoughts, the power to push them out of our field of vision so that the being can step before us within the ocean of overflowing thoughts, we obtain this power by beholding the moment of dying. The moment of death marks the magnificent moment of inception for our spiritual life after death and also serves as teacher in the extinguishing. After death, death itself becomes the teacher in this necessary act of extinguishing. It stimulates those forces of will that we must use to extinguish thoughts and generate spaces of the overflowing ocean of light. This is meant to serve as an indication of the different ways in which human beings are related to their surroundings before and after death. In the sense world, we stand there and are surrounded by a circle of air and then must wait until something enters into the circle. After death, we are instead surrounded by a circle of light and thoughts, and we must extinguish a thought that lies within our field of vision in order to then see the corresponding being that stands behind it. For in this we must deal with beings in the way that I described in my book titled The Threshold of the Spiritual World. This is how we move from unity into multiplicity, into differentiation. Monism, in the sense that most mean it, is a philosophy suited only to the earth, and it is nothing more than a chain once you have stepped through the gate of death. In that moment the necessity of monadism arises, the need to seek multiplicity and differentiation. Seeking unity is the last chain of sensory, rational life. What is it, then, that we actually undertake there? It is an action that creates a space wherein the hierarchies can approach us. We are creating a space for ourselves. Our being is then spread out across the entire world. We have pointed these things out many times before. We create a space for ourselves so that objective things can appear to us after death within the frame of the space we create. 
something objective can never appear to us in the spiritual world if we carry our own being into the spiritual world. We can recognize the other in the spiritual world only when we create a space for the other's appearance by extinguishing our own being from that spot. And this occurs in the manner I have just described. This also serves as an inner description of the process needed to connect with the dead in the way that I described at the end of yesterday's lecture. When the need arises to create an opportunity for the dead to speak for and express themselves, you must attempt to push yourself your own thoughts and feelings away from the spot where the dead person is so that impulses can step forward from the depths of being that place words in your mouth without your will. These are words that must come when you hope to allow the objective being of a person who is no longer physically incarnated to express herself. You see that the faculties, which are by and large the weakest part of the human being here in the physical world, the will and feeling impulses, these are indeed the weakest and most unclear parts of the human soul in the physical world, the faculties of which we have the least mastery are actually of particular significance when it comes to perceiving things in the spiritual world. On the other hand, The faculty that is strongest here in the physical world, the imagination, indeed we love to live in our illusions and fantasies because we have the greatest mastery there, is the thing that is weakest in the spiritual world. We cannot do much with illusions in the spiritual world. They simply obscure the overflowing unity of the thought world. What matters is not the development of our imaginative life, but rather the development of our will and feelings. And this is the essence of meditation. In meditation, it is not a matter of what we fantasize. What is important, and I have stressed this often, is that we imagine with great inner strength. It is a matter of inner energy, of strength, of will. All of this includes a will element which we must develop in meditation and which we develop even more strongly when we do the work, the spiritual work that we are supposed to do through and during meditation. The single most harmful thing to making any progress into the spiritual world is the addiction to dreaming, to forming illusions about external reality because this makes the will weaker and weaker. You weaken your will the most when you cultivate the parasites of imaginative life, when you generate illusions about all sorts of external things. You will never move down the path to the spiritual world by distancing yourself from life. Rather, you must become clear about the things you encounter in life. You will never move down the path to the spiritual world by distancing yourself from life. Rather, you must become clear about the things you encounter in life. It is not through the impoverishment of external life, but rather its enrichment that we move into the spiritual world. People will be able to grow into the spiritual world through strength, not weakness. When the external world and the life of the external world are of no interest, this is weakness. It is weakness when we cannot live up to Goethe's maxim, Know Yourself. Live with the world in peace. Before I move into further considerations of death, I would like to draw attention to the fact that all human artistic activity must have as its basis the soul activity, S-O-U-L, that will prove necessary to us after death. For the purpose of artistic activity, the will element, not the visual element, must be filled by the spiritual world. In this time of artistic decline, particularly the decline of artistic work, the opposite is proving to be true. 
in this time of a similarly declining understanding of the world. The moment that imaginative life makes more refined is being carved out. This is why artists of our time are ever more dependent on models and standards. They can hardly do anything without a model or a pattern. This is also why artists are becoming more and more isolated within their art. But being isolated in one's own art can never lead to true art. This is the opposite of what should be happening. What happens, for example, when someone depicts a human being through art, either in painting or sculpture, and has no concern for the inner forces that form this person, no concern for the dynamic element? What happens when the artist simply approaches the person as a model only, as something simply to look at? What happens is that the artist distances him or herself from the actual principle of artistic creation. The beginning of creation happens when one creates a form of voluntary inner seeing, when one does not simply look at something from within but rather penetrates into it and perceives the forces that shape the brow, push out the nose, and so on. This constitutes true artistic creation. And the same is especially true when it comes to nature. In that case, it is particularly important to live into the activity of the natural world. And here I would like to draw your attention to something that we experience shortly after passing through the gate of death, but that remains relatively unknown to us here in the physical world. When we paint, we are chiefly painting the things that pass over the surface of the object we are painting. We paint light and shadow. We paint color. Now, external nature is filled with light and color because it does not integrate them into itself, but rather casts them away. The object is there and it throws light and color back at us. Minerals, for example, are minerals precisely because they do not integrate light and color into their inner being, but repel them externally. The human soul, however, actually lives within these colors. After death, the soul moves immediately into that realm. It recognizes itself in the light and color. But here in the physical world, the soul does not recognize itself within them. When the landscape painters step before a natural landscape, they must have some part of what exists between themselves and the landscape. They must be able to wrap themselves up in it. They must, in a sense, bring something into the physical world that is actually realized only after a person has passed through the gate of death. This is what makes artistic creation similar to the act of standing in the spiritual world, even if the act of living into and being integrated into the spiritual world remains largely unconscious for the artist. And even if the need for something to be awakened through this connection with the spiritual realms, excuse me, spiritual remains unconscious, This is why the construction of our building has been done in the way that we have done it. So that, as I have often mentioned, people are called upon to attend to what is not there, rather than to what is there. I would like to say that even the spaces that have been carved out should be attended to, rather than just the pieces that were left in place. In this sense, a beginning for what must be done in our current cultural stream has been made through this practical embodiment of our spiritual scientific stream. You see, the kinds of projections of the spiritual world into the human world, through what I have called the spectrum of death, which we saw in the artistic works I presented yesterday and the day before, were more typical in a time not long ago. Now it is less typical, and our natural endowment toward it will continue to fade 
making it even less typical. But the less that people here in the physical world can establish relationships with the spiritual multiplicity, the more bound up they will be when they move through the gate of death. The possibility of creating empty spaces will be lost if people continue to move out of relationship to the spiritual world. But that is what absolutely must happen according to the external progression of world events. The old clairvoyance must gradually fade. If we cannot re-establish that relationship to the spiritual world through spiritual scientific development, then people will lose the ability to live in the spiritual world after death. They will lose the ability to be true and full beings. Instead, they will be chained and bound up, as though in a prison, by the one thing that is always left to them, by the ability to look back on life, where beholding the moment of death should actually be something very significant and defining for the human being. When those who have been strengthened, if I may put it thus, by spiritual scientific development, move through the gate of death, they relatively quickly achieve freedom and the ability to act freely in the spiritual world. Just think about how necessary the immense sense of connection with spiritual scientific impulses is for a being to live immediately after death, as was shown in the case observed in the words spoken by Frau Grossheinz's soul. What we see is that the human being receives, through spiritual scientific development, a replacement for what had previously been given as a natural faculty, a relationship to the supra-sensory and to spiritual phenomena. When you are able to see something like the spectrum of death through a natural faculty, and people in earlier times always saw these spectra of death. We simply do not know about this now because it is a capacity that has been lost. Then you see this spectrum of death through an act of separation from your physical body. This enables you to see the particular individual forms of the phenomenon. This separates these particular phenomena out from the unified whole. And this is the important part This act of separating something from the unity teaches you to perform that action. But the opportunity to learn how to separate something from the unity was completely lost with the fading of atavistic clairvoyance and it has to be replaced through a growth into spiritual science. This spiritual scientific strengthening will also be the thing that will bring about the necessary capacities for artistic creation in the future. Sculptors, musicians, painters and poets will be unable to create if they are not filled with what spiritual scientific strengthening can give them. In our time people are still afraid of this. You can hear their fear when a sculptor musician, painter, or poet comes forward and says, quote, Ah, spiritual science, that involves a lot of work and effort, and it will kill my original, primal, artistic abilities. Close quote. You can hear this sort of thing everywhere, but it is merely an expression of the fear of the power that is necessary if art is really to remain viable for humanity in the future. People are afraid of the incredibly strong power that must step forward from within. A time will come in human development when artistic capacities must be ripened through spiritual scientific strengthening. In any case, that would prevent the sort of nonsense that we are seeing now. People suddenly, and with no basis whatsoever, declare themselves artists at the youngest possible age and then actually believe themselves to be artists. Then when their status as an artist does not lead to anything, they believe that the world simply does not recognize them. This nonsense will gradually cease. 
the art of the future will be an art of maturity, and only at a relatively late age will people feel the inner maturity that can lead to artistic activity. People will no longer believe that at a later age in life one lacks the energy, the youthful energy, as people often say, needed to create art. People will actually find, rather, that through deepening and spiritual scientific strengthening, the energies that lead to artistic production in the future are first released from the inner being. But right now, People are still afraid of these energies, just as they are afraid of anything that must be gained through struggle. This is why many artists have an unholy fear of pulling things up from the depths of their inner being. And when they hear that it is not the external earthly individual, but rather the higher individual within themselves that should be creating art, they fall into a state of utter confusion. You can hardly imagine a more complete state of confusion than the one into which current artists fall when they realize that it is the genius within the inner being of a person, a genius that belongs to the spiritual world, which actually creates art. One contemporary artist expressed the unholy fear that he had of this spiritual world in the following words, quote, Genius is a terrible sickness. Every author carries a monster within his heart that consumes all of his feelings the moment they are born. Who shall win the battle? Shall sickness conquer the man or the man conquer the sickness? One must be a truly great man to hold his character and his genius in balance. If the poet is not a giant, if he does not have the strength of a Hercules, then he must sacrifice either his heart or his gift. Close quote. It gives you goosebumps of the soul when you hear such things said aloud. For what we are hearing is nothing less than the unholy fear of the part of us that is connected with the spiritual world. And it is a very consequential thing to say, even if the author is not aware of how consequential it truly is. For the fact that he speaks of giants and of Hercules is incredibly telling. It is telling that precisely these words came into his mouth or into his pen, as the case may be. This might even lead to the perspective that human beings must win the battle by what they are in earthly life, for that meaning lies within these words. A true understanding of the matter would show us that the genius within a human being, the healthy genius, fills and takes hold of that person, making him into its instrument. Another contemporary artist add some very peculiar words to the sentences that I have just read to you. Very peculiar words indeed. He says, quote, Let us bring to mind the tragic downfall of Leocoon, as described in the Aeneid. The citizens of Troy watched with horror and repulsion as the enormous serpent choked Leocoon and his sons. The witnesses felt fear and sympathy, and the likely also felt a desire to rescue the unfortunate men. However different the conditions of their souls might be, the will experience for all of them played a very important role. But then, in the midst of this agitated and horrified crowd, let us imagine an artist who considers the catastrophe playing out before his eyes as the possible theme for a powerful work of art. Amidst the general excitation of the screaming, frantic, praying crowd, he remains the calm observer. In that moment, all moral instincts within him are suppressed by aesthetic curiosity. Close quote. And this is supposedly a necessary condition for artistic creation. We supposedly have people who are not artists standing there, feeling the deepest of sympathy, and they cannot help. 
And then we have this oaf, this dullard, who has no inkling of the pain produced by the situation. And this dullard is supposedly the real artist, the one who can depict this moment, who stands there like a fool just so he can observe the whole thing. This is what we have come to at present that someone can confidently proclaim that a dullard, a complete fool about the phenomena of life, is in fact the true artist, because he is capable of being, in quotes, objective. He should banish sympathy and compassion from his heart and become an unfeeling oaf, and only then, according to these words, can he depict something that will fill others with interest. You cannot be more fully grasped by the most abhorrent aramonic forces than to find yourself in a position where you can put forward such a perspective on art. This is the decadence of our time, created by the fear and anxiety generated by facing spiritual reality. Not to know that if you hope to be an artist, you must be able to experience the events of the world with deeper sympathy. You must actually have a deeper sense of sympathy, as well as the capacity to look at these experiences more objectively at a later time, with this same sense of deep sympathy, in such a way that you are able to love them the way you might love an unknown being. You then arrive out of this even deeper feeling of sympathy at an artistic creation. We have come so far in the perversity of our worldview that the opposite of the truth is spouted as though it were the sum of all wisdom. And I am convinced that there are countless individuals who consider this idiocy brilliant and who think that this praise of artistic dullness is the ultimate discovery of what art truly is. So we find ourselves here in the present, and we must seek the fulcrum of spiritual scientific strengthening that will give us the ability to know ourselves in the world that we will enter during the natural progress of events when we step through the gate of death. And thus, art can appear to us as akin to death, which is to say, as akin to the higher life. To be akin to death is to be akin to higher life. In many ways, to step into the spiritual world, we must acquire an ability to arrive at other imaginations, other ideas than the ones that must fill us in order to understand the world that we occupy between birth and death. We must be sure not to break through the maya into just another instance of the maya while believing that we have actually broken through to the spiritual world. The maya is thicker in certain areas of life than others. When we consider various areas and aspects of life, we find that the thickness of the maya varies. It is woven out of many different things. Although it is all part of the maya, it is woven out of different things in various areas of life. When we approach a child, we learn to recognize it in its physical existence. We develop imaginations about the child that are composed of the experiences that we have formed after approaching the child as a being within its physical body. If we hope to truly recognize this being, when it has stepped through the gate of death, we could make no greater mistake than to carry such an imagination and nothing else into the spiritual world. Recently we went through an especially poignant karmic experience in relation to Theophys. We would have a completely false picture of him if we were simply to perpetuate the imaginations that we formed of the child according to how he came toward us in the physical world, and then to project those imaginations up into the spiritual world. In such a being as this one, 
we can sometimes find a great maturation and ripening shortly after death. We can find the energies that the child brought into the world through birth, which were not fully realized in the physical world because karma did not permit it. We can find these energies interwoven with cosmic forces, and we can gradually perceive how a mature soul that brought itself into cosmic existence through death grows upward toward existence within the spheres. And when such a soul was still a child in its last incarnation, then we can perceive how relatively quickly it grows in order to channel its forces into those of the cosmos. This is when we come to know the person after death, as he channels with his own being the forces that are part of his spectrum of death and interweaves them into the forces of the cosmos. This is how the human being grows into the creative process that one might call, quote, heavenly creation, close quote. Then his willed feeling and his felt will impulses coalesce with the world outside. Just as we gradually grow to adapt our sensory organs to the external physical world as a child, the way we grow into sight, for example, so too do we grow together with being itself after death. We grow together with the unfolding of the will. And if we allow such phenomena to work upon us in a truly spiritual scientific sense, we will gradually notice how the maya of external life is woven together at varying thicknesses at different points. It is difficult to penetrate at certain points, such as at the death of a very young child, because most of the aspects that were a part of the external appearance obscure the things that must step into that space in order for us to have a proper imagination of what that individual is after death. But then there are also people for whom it is relatively easy to penetrate through the web of Maya because the truth of their being was also able to penetrate deeply into the Maya that lives here in the physical world between birth and death. There are also people like this, people who have brought beautiful treasures of inner spiritual wealth down into the physical world through their birth, and who are in the position to weave what they have brought down from the spiritual world into who they are. These are the human beings whom, because of what the Creator has made of them through love, we also must love infinitely. These are people about whom we often do not ask why we love, because it simply seems self-evident. Such beings are like living witnesses of the spiritual world, because they already strongly resemble their spiritual being here in the physical world, and because the veil of Maya can be easily parted through love, so that one can truly see into the depths of their soul. A certain tenderness is owed to such people, a certain desire to be near to them, because they have brought a great gift down from the spiritual world into their physical existence. After death, they exist as though they were living witnesses for the deeply significant fact that the impulses of the spiritual world live on in all things revealed to us here in this world. If we gaze upon such people after death, they stand before us as though to say, quote, This is how we once were, and the fact that it is the deepest, deepest, most inner truth that we were once this way is proven by the fact that we have passed through the gate of death. Close quote. They stand there, even after death, like apostles of faith, like apostles of faith who help us to see spirit everywhere in the life spent here in the physical world. So it is with our dear friend Sybil Kalatza, who recently passed away. She stood like an apostle, 
for the belief that the world in which we live is filled with spirit. And so we must then explain why in her case a particular thing happened. In the sight of her spiritual being, we also had to verify what the shroud of her external life stood for in the physical world, for those who knew and loved her. This is why there is a different sort of tone in the words that had to be spoken from out of her soul because of this particular individuality about whom I said, quote, And your voice ensouled this being, your voice, which bespoke more through the kind of words than through words themselves, revealed what was hidden within your beautiful soul. Close quote. Notice that the description transitions from the past tense, from the imperfect to the present tense, because the beholding of the life in the body has flowed together with the beholding of the life after death. This is expressed in the words. This is the necessary course of the words that must be formed from out of the spiritual world. This is what must be said, quote, It ensouled this being, your voice, which bespoke more through the kind of words than through that which the words revealed, that which, hidden, is present in your soul. Close quote. Quote, is present, not was present. Close quote. It is ongoing, still there. Quote, Yet your devoted love unveiled itself completely to empathic humans without words. This being of noble, quiet beauty heralded the sensitive awareness of the creation of worlds and souls. Close quote. Now, let us consider a soul like that of our dear friend Fritz Mitscher, who died so young to our great sorrow. He was a soul that, for those who knew him, lived in such a way that we might say something of him, meaning it in the most beautiful sense, that some might consider cold and dry, but that nevertheless really expresses the essence of that being. He was an objective man. Fritz Mitscher was a totally objective man. The moments when Fritz Mitscher talked about himself were few and far between, and when he did talk about himself, he was really only seeming to talk about himself. Actually, he was really describing his relationship to someone or something else. His I was almost never the center of his considerations. I cannot say that he ever made himself the center of attention. And it was typical of this man that when he was called upon to talk about himself, as happens naturally sometimes when an older man speaks with a younger man, giving him advice about life and then naturally tuning the conversation to the younger man himself. In those instances, he would evade you and turn the conversation towards something he was experiencing in his surroundings in order to describe it with the art that he was already able to use, having gained it through spiritual science. He was therefore an objective man, a man of objectivity. He did not think about his significance to the world. He did not think about how his eye fit into the world at large. He had practical interests in the most eminent sense, practical interests that could be expressed most characteristically when one is not always so concerned with how they fit into the world at large. Fritz Mitscher belonged among those people who at an early age develop a certain zeal for expressing deep truths to you in passing conversation with the utmost objectivity. He belonged among those who always approach this with the same zeal because they are interested in the matter at hand and not in their own person or in the place of their own individualities in the world. And if he spoke in front of an auditorium full of people, then it would be the purest, most innocent realization of the matter at hand and never the experience of watching someone lose himself 
in the sole impurity of talking about himself. This was something so characteristic of him. And this also enabled him in the most eminent fashion to take up the world in such a way that he really entered into the world through the medium of the idea, the thought, and the imagination, rather than being taken out of the world by them. He always lived into things more deeply, into the connections of the world through his thoughts, ideas, and imaginations. This was how he lived together with the world. This was how he lived with his I, precisely because he spoke so little about it, in the midst of things and not merely in his skin. Such people are really the only ones who understand what ideals in the world are, what life is in ideals and ideas. Life in ideas and ideals does not mean simply that you have ideas and ideals. You can have them, of course, for they are as easy to pick as blackberries. But it is not just about having ideas and ideals. Rather, it is a matter of having ideas and ideals in all of their richness of thought. And just about every person runs away from that. People run from thinking in droves. Oh, my dear friends, you need only call up the imagination, the genuine imagination, of true and pure thinking before your soul, the imagination of the life of pure thoughts, a life spent in thoughts and ideas, freed from the sensory realm. You need only to erect this innocent source of soul existence in your imagination and then try to place the spectra of other people around it. And you will find that people flee in droves from this innocent source of thoughts, freed from the sensory world. Quote, oh, it is sober and dry, it rips love out of the heart, it is cold and frigid. Close quote. That is what they say, and they flee. They flee in droves, and only a very few remain behind in that place of soul innocence. These are the true philosopher souls. These are the people who are truly meant for philosophy. Among them belongs the so- sort of soul that Fritz Mitcher was. In people with such a nature as this, it comes about as something practically self-evident that they grow into the conditions of their life in the most natural manner possible. Or, to put it better, they allow themselves to be carried into the conditions of their lives by karma. This was absolutely the case with Fritz Mitcher. You never saw him take up a place somewhere because of an intention on his part, which is to say, because of an intention connected with his physical body. He always allowed himself to be carried by karma to the tasks that befell him. This is the proper nature of a philosopher who must be led to his tasks and who does not push himself into one task or another out of some sort of egotistical will. Such true philosophers know all too well in both their feelings and their impulses that one is never actually prepared to undertake a task. One can really believe that one is ready to undertake a task only when one is extraordinarily vain. One actually is always anticipating something that one will only later master. Only when you have this sort of understanding do you get a sense in your life of what your inner calling truly is. And only then will life be full, to a certain extent, with the demand to know yourself You learn to know yourself best when you think and speak as little as possible about your I. Then the things you affect and the work you do for life will be full, with the call to know yourself, live with the world in peace. This was Fritz Mitcher's motto. Such a life continues as it was into the spiritual world, remaining just as it was here, except that the seed becomes a fruit in the spiritual world.
We must avoid asking the unreal question, quote, what would have become of such a being if he could have remained for a longer period of time in the physical world? Close quote. This is not a consideration based in reality. The real consideration leads us to the great and wonderful fact that such a soul is integrated into the spiritual world and that what it is now called to carry out in the spiritual is related to what it experienced here between birth and death in much the same way that a fruit of a plant is related to its seed. In other words, our present life is really a kind of seed life for the spiritual life after death. When it comes to a soul with such a nature that lives so fully in objectivity, we must, when considering it after death, sink into the soul the words that will describe both this objective conception of life and also its relationship to the surrounding world standing fully within the world with the other parts that are excuse me with the other beings that are part of the world we must sink these words into the soul this is how i needed to speak about fritz mitcher and this comparison between the seed here and the plant that develops more fully over there can be placed before the soul as a characteristic description of him this is how i explain why the words became what they were. Quote, As a loss that pains us bitterly, thus you vanished from the field, where the earth seed of spirit in the blossom of soul being ripened to your sensory sphere. As a hope that cheers us, Thus you stepped upon the field, where the spirit blossoms of the earth through the force of soul being might reveal themselves to research. A being of pure love of truth was your striving's steadfast aim. Creating from the light of spirit was your life's earnest goal toward which you strove untiringly as a hope that cheered us. Thus you stepped upon the field where the spirit blossoms of the earth through the force of soul being might reveal themselves to research. Hear our soul's plea, sent sent after you in confidence. We have need for earthly work of powerful forces from the land of spirit for which we have our dead friends to thank a hope that cheers us, a loss that pains us bitterly. Let us hope that you, far yet near, not lost, illuminate our lives as a soul star in the realm of spirit. Close quote. And so Fritz Mitcher is one individual about whom we can say these things, which are also real and true in regard to many of our dead friends who have passed into the spiritual world. On the field of spiritual life that is ours to tend, they are our most active co-workers. They become the ones to whom we look with special thanks when we think on the tasks of our present and future spiritual development, tasks that can only be completed slowly and with great difficulty by the forces that we have through our physical incarnation alone. So it seems to me that we should ask of our friends who have passed through the gate of death, as well as our friend Christian Morgenstern, to remain by us as though they were posts to be occupied all over the place. Much can be accomplished in our spiritual movement with the help of their forces which could not be done with earthly forces alone. This must be the last earthly message sent to such individuals, and it must be clearly spoken to our dear friend Fritz Mitcher in particular, who will be a strong ally for us in the manner I have just described. Because of his youthful energy, 
he will be a true comfort, a comfort where comfort is needed. It is needed often. The hard work and striving that we have done recently has brought so much before us. We have seen how great are the barriers on the physical plane, barriers that we had not imagined. How severe are others' judgments toward the things that we are doing and how contrary they often are in expressing their opposition. We need only to think of something like the following example. What I am about to say is not said for any personal reason, because I really feel that I am only a weak instrument for the spiritual movement that carries us all. People out there, outside of our spiritual scientific stream, are writing brochures, brochure after brochure, about how our members simply take up everything on the basis of loyalty and belief and trust, without confirming it themselves. People are claiming, in a sense, that there is nothing but blind faith within our circle. This is how people out there describe our movement, as though everyone who is a part of it is a blindly faithful dullard who follows along because of a sense of trust. That is what is said out there. Within our walls, the sense of trust does not look nearly so shiny and spotless. Meaning the sense of trust that exists in the deeper parts of the soul and not the trust placed merely in the words, in the surface layer. There is, in fact, a great disparity between what people are complaining about in their brochures and what is actually present here within our walls. What I am about to say, I say without any critique or bitterness, and I do not mean to be direct, it to be directed at any one person. But if someone with an eye, E-Y-E, towards some of the things that I said here during the fall had had occasion to write about Dr. Steiner, is just wasting his time with certain concerns, by which I mean the subjects that I was speaking about, that he is wasting his occult powers with these concerns. If someone could just have written that, it would have been a clear indication that the sense of trust that people out there say is the only thing that is keeping us together, even if it is the case that there is trust in the superficial levels of consciousness as a maya, it would be proven that that sense of trust is not nearly as strong on the deeper soul level. In the end, the teachings presented here are not grounded in any authority and are not meant to be taken as dogma. I say this while also wanting to point out that every detail of what I say has been checked. But to do something like declare myself the judge of the full extent of my esoteric research amounts to spiritual tyranny, which absolutely does not arise from what must, of course, be present to some extent, not for the sake of spiritual science, but for the sake, I would suggest, of the community. The spiritual tyranny arises from a subconscious lack of trust. Taking up a set of teachings does not require trust, but if you do not simply take what the spiritual researcher presents of the spiritual world as a codified standard, and instead expect practitioners of spiritual science to discover for themselves the tasks that lie before them and the things that fall within their area of research. This takes a kind of trust that can never be disadvantageous to our movement, because it does not move into the realm of interpersonal relationships and it does not interfere with the teachings. But such a fact, like many similar facts, also indicates that there are still many great barriers and difficulties present for us. And it means that within our spiritual movement we must continue to perform the duties that arise from our insights into inner necessity, even if those look to be distant from what we might desire to accomplish. These duties will always be carried out, even if they make us sour 
according to our usual understanding of the word sour. But in the moment that we see that we may give our dear deceased friends a kind of personal assignment to remain with us and to participate in our work with their energies, we immediately feel a sense of security within our movement that the physical world can never give us. And so by thinking of our dear departed friend, something flows into the impulses of our movement that is supra-sensory, something that comes not just out of the things that we can experience sometimes as inspiration in the physical world. What arises is, in a sense, possibility. Into the maya of our community's work, Something suprasensory flows into the impulses and makes us feel certain. When we do something, it is completed not only on the physical plane, but also concretely in the suprasensory realm that has remained with us, not in its physical being, but through the presence of our dear departed friends. This allows us to be certain of the effects of our work, which will be felt in the streams of spiritual becoming. Quote, Hear our soul's plea, sent after you in confidence. We have need for earthly work of powerful forces from the land of spirit, for which we have our dead friends to thank. Close quote. And so it is that we speak about our departed friends as our compatriots, our co-workers, our comrades, as beings who remain unseen beside us. In this way we can concretely grasp the invisible being, extend our hand one last time in the physical world to our friends, and grasp theirs in the supra-sensory world after death. And in this exchange of handshakes, we see a symbol for the work of a community that should speak not only for the physical world, but whose work should also call out and echo into the suprasensory world. We are trying to build a place for this sort of work here on this hill. Let there be a place here for such work. The end of Lecture 7 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner, translated by Rory Bradley, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life in the World, 13 Lectures. This is Lecture 8, given in Dornach on March 27, 1915. Having spent the last few times that we were able to gather together here on considerations connected with particular experiences, I would like to return today to something more oriented toward general spiritual science. At times, during these Easter considerations, it will perhaps be possible as well to discuss various things and even some specific things, as we will be continuing the considerations begun today through the next few weeks. I would like to start today with something that you have all known for quite some time now. That is, all spiritual scientific knowledge is gained not only with the help of the tools of the physical body, but also through the liberation of the soul spiritual element from those physical tools, so it can connect directly with the spiritual world. This direct connection with the spiritual world is thereby interrupted in daily life by the fact that when we are awake we must always be at the service of the tools of our physical bodies 
if we hope to have a relationship to the world. And when we are sleeping, all of our will is concentrated on our connection with the physical body in such a way that the desire for the body spreads out like a cloud in the soul-spirit element during sleep and prevents us in the ordinary period of sleeping from experiencing anything in the spiritual world that we then occupy. And when we are sleeping, all of our will is concentrated on our connection with the physical body in such a way that the desire for the body spreads out like a cloud in the soul-spirit element during sleep and prevents us in the ordinary period of sleeping from experiencing anything in the spiritual world that we then occupy. Now, today we are interested in the person who truly understands the value of spiritual scientific activity as such, and the relationship of this spiritual scientific activity to the personal striving that brings the human being into the spiritual world through meditation and the concentration of thought, feeling, and will impulses. Above all else, we must be clear about this, and it is a deeply significant truth. The unified whole that surrounds us in our day-to-day world is not present in the spiritual world in the same way. I have already pointed out that this unity is grounded completely in the structure of the sole spiritual human being. Most people, however, are constantly asking over and over, quote, what is the unity of the world? Close quote. How satisfied they all would be if they could just trace it back to a single principle. Indeed, the external physical world presents itself to us as a unified whole, and those who are completely ruled by this devil of unity arrive at all sorts of thought abstractions as they try to find this unifying world principle. Such individuals often share similar characteristics, like an older man who approached me one evening when I saw him again. He shared with me with the most intense sense of joy at discovering something that he had finally found a unifying principle that could explain all of the phenomena of the world. And he said in that state of intense joy, that this unifying principle could be expressed in no more than ten or twelve words. He was so happy about this that he said he could now explain all of the cosmos. He claimed to be able to explain heaven, hell, and earth with just one, with just this one unifying principle. Recently I thought of this experience again when someone wrote me a letter telling me that he urgently needed to have a conversation with me because he had met a person who was able to convert anyone in a matter of five minutes to a worldview that set the soul completely at ease. I hardly need say that there is no time for such exchanges within a spiritual stream that takes itself seriously. But those people who are possessed by a devil of unity which is also simultaneously a kind of devil of comfort, are particularly numerous nowadays. Above all, we must take the things that are printed in title How to Know Higher Worlds very seriously, that as soon as we cross over the threshold of the spiritual world, we are really drawn into a threefold experience. I put particular emphasis on the fact that it is as though the soul is divided in three, and as soon as the soul crosses the threshold into the spiritual world, it is no longer possible to believe in this comfortable devil of unity. Indeed, as soon as we cross the threshold into the spiritual world, we feel that our being actually steps into three separate worlds, that it really actually steps into three distinct worlds. And we must never lose sight of this, that after crossing the threshold into the spiritual world, the experience of three distinct worlds is quite clear. Even the form of the physical body actually belongs to three worlds. 
I would say that this form of the human being, in quotes, that we encounter in the physical world is really the collaboration of three worlds that have a relationship of strong dependence, of necessity to one another. And if we consider the form of the head, then we must be clear, even when just speaking about the head and considering everything that belongs to the form of the head, we must be clear that the formative force, as well as the beings that work on and within the head, belong to an entirely different world than the formative forces and beings of our torso, and different than everything that belongs to our heart and arms and hands. It is as though the formative forces that constitute these material parts of the human being came from an entirely different world than the ones that constitute the head. And then again, the organs of the lower body and the legs belong to a different world than both torso and head. Now you might ask why all of this is significant. It is very significant because the present cycle of the human being is essentially such that a pure, genuine and true experience of spiritual science can be had only when our soul spiritual rises up out of the head. This is, so to speak, the clairvoyant aspect of the human being that can bring forth spiritual scientific considerations that can properly serve humanity in our time. When it comes to this clairvoyant aspect, the soul spiritual aspect has largely risen out of the physical body and connected as though through an electrical current with the forces of the cosmos. This means that everything, the I, capital, the astral body and the etheric body, must rise out. This process of arising is, of course, in connection with the development of the so-called lotus flower. The forces that the lotus flower set in motion lie in the rising or blooming soul-spiritual aspects of the human being. What is gained through the fact that clairvoyance has become a clairvoyance of the head can have spiritual scientific results in our time. For this head clairvoyant experience serves humanity. The clairvoyant experience that came about when the soul spiritual arose from the organs of heart, arms and hands was fundamentally different. That form differed in an inwardly significant way from what comes about through what I am calling head clairvoyance. Lifting the soul spiritual element from the physical heart organ happened through a kind of meditation more related to the will life. It happened through a humble surrender to the world process. Whereas head clairvoyance comes about through more through thoughts, through thought imaginations, but also through emotional imaginations. In general, in relation to these two forms of clairvoyance, it is such that the heart clairvoyance or the breast clairvoyance has by now already developed to the extent that it was meant to evolve with head clairvoyance. Heart clairvoyance leads more to will evolution, to a connection with the actions of the spiritual beings of the lower hierarchies, like those that are incarnated in the various kingdoms of nature. Whereas, head clairvoyance leads more to vision, knowledge, and perception in the higher worlds, which are more important to the human being now. These higher worlds are more important in the sense that the knowledge of these higher worlds is necessary to satisfy the need for certain insights that must gradually move more and more into present humanity. The closer we move toward our future earthly evolution, the less people will be able to live without their souls becoming brittle and arid unless they can take the experience of this clairvoyance 
into their knowledge and insights. The third kind of clairvoyance comes about when what might be called the soul spiritual element is tempted out of the last third of the human body. In that case, toward this end, I will have to point toward an outward movement down below. Even if the phrase is not especially aesthetic, I have to refer to this kind of clairvoyance as stomach clairvoyance. So we can differentiate between head clairvoyance, heart clairvoyance, and stomach clairvoyance. Whereas head clairvoyance leads us to gather experiences about things that are in the fullest sense entirely independent of the human being, stomach clairvoyance leads primarily to experiences that are connected with processes that happen within the human being. The processes that occur within the human being must, of course, also be the subject of research. But there is already research being done about it in the fields of anatomy and physiology, which deal with all of those things. No one should come to the mistaken conclusion that there is no value in stomach clairvoyance in the highest sense of the word. It, of course, has its value. But we must be clear about the fact that stomach clairvoyance cannot teach people much about impersonal cosmic processes, since it primarily teaches us about the things about the things happen inside the confines of a person's skin. Let me read that again. Since it primarily teaches us about the things that happen inside the confines of a person's skin. I will go on to speak about other differences between head and stomach clairvoyance in regard to the moral ethical realm. These two types can be easily differentiated. The heart clairvoyance stands between head and stomach clairvoyance. In regard to ethics, Head clairvoyance is, comparatively speaking, the most important. People who strive in an impersonal manner to arrive at a view of the higher worlds in the manner described in Title How to Know Higher Worlds, people who do not let themselves get discouraged about walking along that uncomfortable but certain path will develop in their clairvoyance an additional impersonal element. This will be an interest above all others in an objective knowledge of the world, of the cosmic and historical processes at work in the world's becoming. This head clairvoyance itself will speak of the human being in such a way as to draw attention to how humanity is established in the cosmic and historical process of life's becoming, to draw attention to the human being without the whole of the world process. The things that emerge from this head clairvoyance will always have an impersonal character. I would say even a universal and scientific character. It will contain communications that are of import for all people. I would ask you to take careful note of this, not just for one person or another. Stomach clairvoyance is filled largely with all manner of human egotism and is thus very easily led down a path whereby the clairvoyant in question occupies himself largely with the occult foundations of his own abilities, with the occult foundations of his own personal value and character. This can be said to be a very natural tendency of what we might call stomach clairvoyance. Now, in regard to the visual nature of these two forms of clairvoyance, there is also a big difference. If you strive, as described in title How to Know Higher Worlds, to free your soul spiritual element from the perceptual apparatus of your head, which is to say that if you tempt the soul spiritual part of your head out of the physical mechanism, and are able to establish these soul-spiritual portions of your head in the spiritual world, you will find it extremely difficult to get beyond shadow-like clairvoyant experiences. 
stepping out of the head is connected, at first, with experiences that lack the colors and saturation of living memories, and therefore come forward quite colorless. Only when you push further and further through the obstacles that lie on this path do these experiences begin to lose their shadow-like quality and to become tinged somewhat with experiences possessing color and tone. The process that plays out here is one in which we first retreat from our heads and then find ourselves in a world that we find very hard to notice. Eventually, when we gain the ability to live outside of our head, these inner life forces grow stronger, and the result is that the forces that are streaming in from all the surroundings of the world start to pull together. Just think about that. These forces have to be pulled together from all around, and only then do we start to receive experiences lightly tinged with color and tone. In order to imagine this, let us say that you have a brightly colored bottle. Imagine that as you spread this bottle out over a large surface, the color becomes much paler, and the more you spread it out, the paler the color gets. Then as you bring it together again, if this were just a pale yellow, you would end up with a very strong, very saturated yellow because the same number of colored points would now be much more concentrated. Now, head clairvoyance looks at the whole cosmos. And what the human being is, according to a clairvoyant understanding of its nature, is spread out across the whole cosmos and must be brought together by our life forces. Thus the clairvoyant is really ready to get only a slightly tinted version of the shadow-like experiences through a laborious course of inner development. And then once you have put in the great effort to have the general experience that really gives you the feeling of being outside your body, and once you have had this experience for a long, long time, and always received a stronger, more intensive feeling of inner experience, but one that is still not colored or toned, then, gradually, the regions of the cosmos begin to approach this head clairvoyance. This is a matter of slow, selfless development. In particular, it must be said that the study of spiritual science is indispensable to this development. We must stress the fact that when spiritual science is presented, it can be understood, this cannot be said too often, that you do not need to be a clairvoyant to understand spiritual science. You must, of course, be clairvoyant in order to experience the phenomena for yourself. But once they have been described, you do not need to be clairvoyant. This understanding of spiritual science must precede the actual act of seeing. We might say here that this is the reverse of what is true for the physical sensory world. In the physical sensory world we first have a proper act of seeing, and then we transition into thought considerations. We form the scientific assessments after the perception. When you move into the spiritual world, the opposite is true. There we must first develop the concepts and imaginations and strive to live objectively into spiritual science. Otherwise we can never be certain that various observations we make of the spiritual world have been interpreted properly. The science must precede the act of seeing. And this is incredibly unpleasant for many people. The fact that they should really study spiritual science. Many people consider this an incomprehensible imposition. After all, they are working to have actual perceptions of the spiritual world. 
It is relatively easy to have such perceptions, to be sure. But in order to interpret them correctly, you need to embark both objectively and selflessly on the quest toward the spiritual. You must truly be filled by the spiritual world. Now quite the opposite is true in the case of what might be called stomach clairvoyance. There we are starting with the aspect of the soul's spirit that works primarily with the physical body. For example, excuse me, for everything that exists in the world has a spiritual foundation. For example, when you eat a bit of kohlrabi, we are all mostly vegetarian after all, and it gets worked on within your organism, you are not dealing solely with a physical chemical process carried out by the stomach and its forces and juices. The etheric body, astral body and the eye are all active behind these processes as well. It would be entirely wrong to believe that they are material processes that do not have an underlying spiritual process. Just imagine for a moment that after a more or less opulent midday meal, you lie down and become clairvoyant, but clairvoyant in such a way that the soul-spirit element of the digestive organs rises up, primarily out of these digestive organs themselves. Then you are living in the soul's spiritual element itself, while your stomach and the rest of your organs go on digesting. And although you are ordinarily unconscious of the spiritual process that is carried out in your etheric body, astral body and eye, when you become clairvoyant, you become conscious of them. And then as you experience yourself in the soul spiritual element, You are able to see all of that work and formation and creation done by the soul spirit in the various limbs of your body during digestion. You see it as though it were projected outward into the world and you appear to yourself as though reflected in the external etheric realm. Because you do not have to draw in the colors from the rest of the cosmos here, but instead are dealing with a process that is already concentrated within the confines of your own skin, you see the most beautiful clairvoyant images. To see a wonderful thing playing out around you in the most magnificent, brightest colors and formative processes, you need nothing more than to consider the digestive processes, or any other process that takes place within the body, in the spiritual human organs. This form of clairvoyance differs strongly from the other in that while the other clairvoyance begins with shadow-like forms and gains a tinge of color and tone only with great effort, this form begins with the most beautiful and magnificent things you can ever see. You can express it as a law. If clairvoyance begins with the most magnificent forms, particular forms with magnificent color, then it is a clairvoyance that relates to processes that are carried out within the individual. I would like to express again that this form can still be of great value for research into the spiritual world. Just as anatomy and physiology must investigate the digestive processes and other bodily processes, so too it is of great scientific value to conduct such research into the spiritual element that lies behind these human processes. But it would be bad if we were to give in to any sort of confusions or delusions about this, if things were not to be interpreted properly. If you were to believe that such a clairvoyance that lacked the necessary preparation were able to offer more than insight into the processes carried out within the individual, and projected out into the objective world, if you were to believe that it were possible to approach the regulating world powers, the predominating spiritual forces of the world, then you would be wrong. Just as you cannot solve the riddles of the world by investigating the human digestive process 
You cannot approach the riddles and mysteries of the world through the development of stomach clairvoyance. So you can see how important it is to orient yourself in the world that you step into through the liberation of your soul spiritual forces. No one should feel any sort of repulsion towards stomach clairvoyance because of the way it has been discussed. But we should all be clear about how this sort of clairvoyance is related to what spiritual clairvoyance can really develop into. And we must also keep ourselves from valuing too highly anything that can be achieved through a kind of clairvoyance that has a solely personal content. Only when we are able to look away from the solely personal aspect of these things, which can also be seen to have a personal content, and to consider them as the anatomist or physiologist does in what he learns through autopsies and other investigations. Only when we move into a scientific mode of considering these things do they obtain any value. By no means should any sort of religious feeling be attached to these things. That can only be connected with the experiences of head clairvoyance. The more we are able to treat the experiences of stomach clairvoyance in the objective scientific way that the results of anatomy and physiology are treated, the more correct we become in relation to it. I will now make the radical statement that not everything found on the path of clairvoyance is worthy of devotion, but everything found there is worth learning. This is how we must look at it. I have said that for our lecture cycle, it is particularly important that we incorporate the results of head clairvoyance into the general spiritual culture of humanity. This is truly important. In relation to this important matter, I would like to mention one side of it today. We live truly in a time during which humanity must be prepared to gradually move beyond mere philosophical idealism and into a true consciousness of the spiritual world, of the universal spiritual world in which we live, just as we live within the physical world. Now let us start with an experience of head clairvoyance that we will easily understand if we have immersed ourselves a little in the things that were said in the Munich lecture cycle that was recently held and that are also printed in my book titled The Threshold of the Spiritual World. I made particular mention there of the fact that our thinking undergoes a change the moment we liberate ourselves, particularly regarding our thinking, from the physical mechanism of the body. I said it a little bit grotesquely there when I said that when we become free in this way, our thinking no longer has the character that it has during normal everyday life. In normal everyday life, We must have the feeling, if we are not crazy, that we are the master of our thought world. And when we have two thoughts, we are the one who connects them or separates them. If we remember something, then we are already conscious of moving in our inner life from a present experience to a past one. We always have the feeling that we are the one who stands behind the weaving together of our thoughts. This feeling ceases the moment we allow our soul spirit in the head to free itself from the physical mechanism. The moment that we develop a kind of thinking that is free from the body. Back then I said it quite radically. I said that it is a bit like sticking your head into an anthill and feeling everything start to move frantically around you. Thoughts begin to develop a life of their own and to interact with one another. And during normal life, when we have two thoughts and connect them, like the two thoughts rose and red, we know that we are the master in our thought world, the one who connects thoughts to form concepts like, quote, the rose is red, 
close quote, or imagine nations like the Red Rose. Things are not the same when we are outside the body. There the thoughts come alive and have their own life. Every thought becomes a being. One thought chases another. Another thought flees from a different thought. So the thought world gains a life of its own. Why does this happen? Well, what we experience in the normal thinking process of everyday life is merely images, merely shadows of thoughts. You can read about this in my book titled Theosophy. As soon as we develop thinking free from the body, every thought becomes like a shell and an elemental being slips into that shell. The thought is no longer under our power. We release it like a satellite into the world and an elemental being slips into it. Our thoughts become sort of occupied by elemental beings. And then this world teems and bubbles and weaves and bobs within us. So we can say that when we plunge the soul spiritual portion of our head into the spiritual world, and the only way that it can be out there is if we are not in our physical body, then, when we plunge it into the spiritual world, we no longer experience thoughts in the way that we experience them in the physical world. Instead, we experience the lives of many beings. As I said back then, it is a bit like sticking your head into an anthill. We experience the lives of many beings, right up to those of the upper hierarchies. If we want to experience an angel, an archangel, or the spirit of an individual, then we must stretch out our thoughts in the manner just described. The being must be encased in our thoughts. We send our thoughts out and the being slips into them and moves within them. When we perceive a being on Venus or Saturn, it happens because we have allowed our thoughts to extend and the being from Saturn or Venus has slipped into them. We must get used to living with our head in the world of these upper hierarchies. Our own thinking stops and our head becomes the locus for the work of the upper hierarchies. Now it is the case that thinking was brought to its most pure level of clarity at the beginning of the 19th century through the philosophy of Fichte, Schelling and Hegel. The heights to which thinking can soar were truly reached in this philosophy. The task that thinking was to complete was finished there. The next step then is for thinking to extend beyond itself and for us to truly move into the teeming, weaving life of thought. In other words, we can say that we are living in a time where humanity is called to perceive the upper hierarchies. We are to be accepted into the world of the upper hierarchies and strip ourselves of the fear of losing our thinking to the life and interaction present in that world. The 19th century was possessed by this fear and terror of life in the upper hierarchies. This essentially led people to pray, although they did not even realize it, quote, Oh, my dear Araman. They were not familiar with Araman, of course, so the words of the prayer were different, Quote again, My dear Araman, save my thoughts from being claimed by the life and interaction of the upper hierarchies, for otherwise I might one day have some sort of being from Uranus or Jupiter or Saturn or the Sun in my thoughts, rather than something earthly, and those beings might run amok, run amok with it. Close quote. You might be thinking that nobody in the 19th century was thinking this, but I will prove to you that they were. Ludwig Feuerbach was a 19th century philosopher who fought especially against the idea of immortality, against any belief in a suprasensory world, because he considered these to be the beliefs of fantastical and mystical dreamers and to be detrimental to all of humanity. 
This Ludwig Feuerbach, in his book titled Thoughts on Death and Immortality, wrote the following sentences. I would ask you to inscribe them well in your souls. Quote, the active person who busies himself with the objects of everyday life has no time to think of death and therefore no need of immortality. If he does think of death, he takes it only as an admonition to spend wisely the time that is given to him and not to waste precious time on useless things, but rather to spend it completing the life tasks he has set for himself. If the human finds his perfection only after his time on earth, up in heaven, on Uranus or Saturn or somewhere else, then there is no philosophy and no science at all. Universal and deducted truths would not be the objects of our minds, nor would thoughts, knowledge and concepts, these purely intellectual essences and objects, be residents of our heads. Instead, those residents would be our heavenly brothers, the beings of Saturn and Uranus. Instead of math, logic and metaphysics, we would have the most exact portraits of these heavenly residents. That heavenly being would reside between us and the objects of knowledge and thought. They would obscure our view of those objects and cause a complete and eternal darkening of the sun in our minds. Close quote. For Feuerbach, the sun, in quotes, is his own thinking. So he has the whole picture of what has to happen. But he has such an unholy fear of it that he prays to dear Araman to protect him from what the human being might actually be responsible for accomplishing here. He thinks that there would be no math or logic in our heads, but only beings from Saturn and Uranus. Quote again, they would be nearer and more closely related to us than thoughts, ideas, or concepts, for they are not merely purely spiritual or abstract beings like these, but rather are sensory spiritual beings, beings that only express the powers of the imagination. Our entire mind would become merely a dream, a vision of the beautiful future. He who is hindered by the demands of reason from swimming about in this boundless ocean of imagination will recognize that in the depths of our mind the life light of the angels and all of the other similar heavenly beings is extinguished as though by air that they cannot breathe. Close quote. Steiner again. So if these beings were to enter into our thoughts, then our minds would become a dream, writes Feuerbach. He feels secure only in the realm of thought. And if the beings of angels and other heavenly beings were to enter into these thoughts, he would feel insecure. This is the prayer to Araman, that he might shield humanity from any knowledge of the spiritual world. Written in the 1840s by Ludwig Feuerbach, that opponent of any spiritual worldview. What does that mean? This means nothing less than that the time is ripe for arising to the spiritual world. For if you simply take seriously what this man described, then you will have found the path into the spiritual world. You need only to fight against the connection with Araman. So you see, it is not the fault of heaven, if I may put it this way, that spiritual science is not penetrating into our culture, for it works its way into the minds of its opponents. It wants to come into the world, so it is not heaven's fault. The gods are giving humanity wisdom. Spiritual science is entering. Just as people have been arming themselves under Araman's directive, it is now up to us to no longer arm ourselves but rather to have the courage to take spiritual science truly and completely seriously. This is what we have to say about these developments in the 19th century. We have to say that in the spiritual world it was predestined that after the era of idealism, the era of spirit would come. And it is up to humanity to open its senses and its heart-mind to take up this spiritual world. 
the kind of materialistic worldview that found its most philosophically gifted proponent in Ludwig Feuerbach, is like an onslaught, an attack against what is meant to come into humanity. The spiritual forces come down from above. From below, the forces of understanding and recognition must also arise. We might say that Ludwig Feuerbach managed to find a very characteristic way of expressing himself. The darkening of the sun in the soul must begin when thoughts begin no longer to be thought, but when the beings of Uranus, Saturn and Venus begin to play within them, the beings of the upper hierarchies. A darkening of the sun in the mind would come then. People have an unholy fear of this, but this darkening of the sun in the soul is not created by heavenly beings. Indeed, those beings want to bring their light to humanity. The darkness was created by people through their connection with Araman and by the cloud of fear that they have spread throughout their auras. They sought to launch attacks against the entrance of the spiritual world. But this much is clear, that the darkening started with people. And we also have to say that this darkness continues to grip people more and more, this obfuscation of free cognition that would approach a clairvoyance of mind. This is something that people created themselves. And we can see that during the 19th century, people had a certain love and sympathy for all sorts of brief, inconsequential thoughts. In short, for everything that in the end really did not need to be thought at all. There was a preference for anything that you would not have to be accountable for later. People loved unbiased and objective knowledge and thinking less and less. And so it should be no wonder that eventually this love of nebulous, unclear and incomplete thought took on a morally repugnant character in public life. But as this character was fostered, All sympathy for the thinking life went stale, which then spread out into everyone's general behavior. This atmosphere generated a very strong counterforce against against spiritual science, which resounds with clarity in every aspect. Spiritual science must have a love and sympathy for consequential, finished, and not half-finished thoughts. It must, be not, it must not be content with things that are unclear and dark. It must, rather, follow everything that brings light to the world, not those things that shine a false light on a small area. And in this regard, we still have a great number of things to combat. You can have really strange experiences sometimes when your karma brings you to them. And it does do that, indeed. You see, several years ago, you could read an article in a newspaper called Hochland, Highland, that was directed against spiritual science and presented all manner of foolish nonsense against it. It was widely read, and the author was considered a particularly excellent philosopher, particularly because the newspaper Hochland did everything that it could to tell the world that they had found a capable philosopher in Dr. Lutislavsky, who wrote the article and could take the field against spiritual science. Now, recently the following has occurred. This Dr. Lutislavsky wrote a letter to Karl Muth, the editor of Hochland. The letter displeased the editor so much that he said in his country, He said that in his country only the residents of madhouses would write the kind of garbage that was found in that letter. Then the editor published the things that the philosopher wrote in the Zdeutschen Monatsheften. The content of what he wrote is not important to us today. I simply want to draw your attention to the fact that the same man who published this then had to add, quote, in publishing this letter from Lutoslavsky, it might also be advantageous to learn something about his personal relationships. Close quote. Then he, Mut, offers several strange biographical details about Ludoslavsky. 
and then publishes a letter from him, in which he says that such gaps are the sort that you expect to be filled in only by an inner hatred. And so, the fact of the matter is that the man whom the editor of Hochland is now tearing down is the same man who was brought forward as a battering ram against the spiritual scientific worldview. I believe that if someone can be called a fool, then you have the right to consider him to be a person who might talk like a fool in other circumstances. And it would be more consistent for the editor of the newspaper if he would only say that back then he let such a foolish man pass judgment on Dr. Steiner's theosophy. He is guarding himself against this. People have no real interest in true consistency in the moments when it really is most important. But through such things we get a feeling for the origins of the forces that are working against theosophy and spiritual science in the truly scientific sense that we practice. I mentioned this particular instance because karma has directed me toward it in the last few days. Karma is indeed a peculiar thing. I am passing a bookstore, someone walking with me, who probably has no idea that there is anything notable about it, points toward a book in the window. I go into the bookstore, buy the book, and there within it I find this stuff. Karma leads us well, even in everyday life. Based on what I could see on the cover of the book, there was no indication that this article which casts the author in such a strange light would be in there. You could bring up many similar things and set them before your soul. But you should also understand that in connection with the things that I have just said, the responsibility that is placed upon every one of us by such things grows ever greater the more we think about them. There is no requirement from any sort of authority for anyone to have one thought or another, or to form one judgment or another. It goes without saying that everyone could think about this article differently and that there is no particular direction for how to think about it. What matters is that our sense of responsibility should grow ever greater and that we see that we must do everything we can to find the ways in which spiritual science can be introduced into contemporary world culture. And some of the things that have happened recently in connection with world events on the large scale make it absolutely urgent that certain things which have remained dormant be brought into the open soon. These are the thoughts that I wanted to introduce into your considerations in order to show how Araman's influence on thinking during the 19th century brought about an occasion for pushing aside the spiritual world, even though it continued to have an effect on the thoughts of those who denied it, because its time has come. Quote, the time has come, close quote. These words from Goethe's titled Märchen are quite fitting here. All of this must be affirmed and supported in the near future. The end of Lecture 8 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, 13 Lectures, translated by Rory Bradley. This is Lecture 9, given in Dornach on March 28, 1915. This evening will be dedicated to a poet who tried to take hold of certain mysteries of poetic creation in a more significant way than he believed that he had previously achieved. We will direct our attention to the re-enlivener of the Nibelungenlied, Wilhelm Jordan, who reached the height of his creative ability in the middle and latter third of the 19th century. 
He is a poet who is too little valued, we might say, in regard to his will, as is often the case with similar artistic undertakings. Using the material from the Nibelungenlied, Wilhelm Jordan tried, in a sense, to resurrect the essence, the art of the Nibelungenlied, in a contemporary form of poetry. After Frau Dr. Steiner has read several passages from Wilhelm Jordan's poem, I will try to cast some light in my closing remarks this evening on this attempted renewal of an old form of poetry from the standpoint of our spiritual, scientific, artistic worldview. First, though, let us allow several passages to pass before our souls. These passages should enable us to see how Wilhelm Jordan tried to renew the old form of poetry through the inner strength of language. Since everyone already knows the content of the legend of the Nibelungs, we all know how it expresses the essence, actions, and desires of people from a time long ago. Afterward, we will address just how much this essence, these desires and actions, are really expressed in the Nibelungen Lied itself. But we all know that there are really two figures in the Nibelungen Lied who drive the plot, two female figures, Krimhilda from Burgundy and Gunhilda from Eisenstein, far across the sea. I'm going to say Eisenstein on that. We know that Krimhilda is to be married to Siegfried of the Lower Rhine. And we know that this engagement is proceeding under difficult circumstances. We know that Krimhilda's brother Gunther wants us wants to woo Gunhilda, but that Gunhilda is very, very difficult to win. And Gunther is not the man who is able to win her. But Gunther promises Siegfried that he will give him Krimhilda as a bride if Siegfried helps him. Gunther to woo Gunhilda. Siegfried is the strong hero who can defeat the seemingly unconquerable Brunhilde in a fight. We will talk about this more later. Siegfried is also the hero who is shrouded in occult forces, we might say. And so it happens that when Gunther is supposed to win Brunhilde in a fight, Siegfried is able to stand by his side, invisible to her through the use of occult means, a magic cape. And so it is actually Siegfried who manages to defeat Brunhilde. Gunther is considered the victor because people cannot see Siegfried, the true victor, beside him. Gunther is thus able to take Brunhilde with him back to Worms. Then it happens that again Gunther has to fight Brunhilde once she is his wife. Here again Siegfried has to step in for him and Siegfried takes away Brunhilde's ring and belt while she is left to believe that it is Gunther who wrenches these things away from her. But this then causes a great jealousy to develop between the two women, between Krimhilde and Brunhilde. This is all sufficiently well known that I do not need to tell it all in detail. I would simply say that in the Nibelungen Lied we clearly see how Brunhilde becomes increasingly jealous of Krimhilde and this jealousy finds a kind of echo in Krimhilde's heart. We see the flames of rivalry grow threateningly between the two women. This comes to a head when Krimhilde, who now possesses Brunhilde's ring and belt, confronts Brunhilde, and her possession of these objects makes it clear that it was Siegfried, her husband, who actually defeated Brunhilde. That means Brunhilde essentially has a weakling at her side for a husband. This leads Brunhilde to conclude that Siegfried must die, since he essentially betrayed her, for he should never have given Krimhilde the ring and the belt. Siegfried should never have betrayed the secret that should have remained between him and Brunhilde. All of this comes to us in a particular way in the Nibelungen Lied, except that if we trace all of the motifs of the Nibelungen Lied throughout the work, one thing remains unexplained. This unexplained something can be immediately explained if we fill out the Nibelungen lead with what is no longer there, with the things heralded to us by old legends, 
from an age that was even grayer than the one in which the Nibelungen lead was set down. We should pay attention to the fact that Brunhilde is essentially the representative of an old being, a Valkyrie. Brunhilde is established as the late earthly incarnation of an old powerful being, a Valkyrie, and we must take note of how this affects the present. As I said, this is not spoken in the Nibelungen lead, but is characteristic of the old legends. If we take this detail out of the older legends, then we understand Brunhilde's demonic quality, and we also understand that in the events of the Nibelungen lead, something great and significant is playing out in the guise of events that might not otherwise occur between individuals in the earthly sphere. Brunhilde then appears to us in her later incarnation as a diminishment of what she once was as a Valkyrie. But still we see that she has brought forward something from her Valkyrie past that makes her into a demonic being. Something can be similarly observed in Siegfried. In his case, as well, we should try to see how he was incarnated in an earlier age, in which he was a different man, from whose essence he took something that he brought into the Siegfried incarnation. This is how it was possible for him to defeat Brunhilde, who is also more than just the Brunhilde that is living there in earthly life. In this sense, Siegfried stands before us as someone in whom the sun forces continue to live on, S-U-N. The sun forces that were more developed in an earlier incarnation than they could be within a person of a later age, the age in which Siegfried lived as Siegfried. In the same way, the forces of the Earth Mother lived more strongly in Brunhilde than they could have lived in a female figure from the age in which she incarnated as Brunhilde. So it is that the externally incarnated souls of these individuals come before us as mysterious beings. And then we can understand that all of these mysterious things connected with old legends and old forces, which are not actually contained in the Nibelungenlied itself, were the very things that Wilhelm Jordan wanted to call up when he attempted to depict what lived in the events of the Nibelungenlied, though not in the text of the Nibelungen lead itself. Readers aside, the name uh, is Wilhelm Jordan. I'm assuming that, that Jordan is pronounced in a German way because of the first word Wilhelm, but I am not sure, so I'm not trying to say that in any affected way. I'm just considering it to be German pronunciation to the best of my ability. <laughs> Readers aside, ended. And we can also understand why in Wilhelm Jordan's version the jealousy that exists between Brunhilde with her Valkyrie soul and Kriemhilde, who is depicted as the Earth Mother par excellence, does not break out in the same way as it does in the Nibelungen lead. Rather, it comes to a head during a depiction of a solstice feast from that time. As it is depicted, the sun god Baldur has been conquered by Hödr and forced by his death at Hödr's hand to descend to the realm of Hel. He is mourned by his bride Nana, for whom he has vanished from the realm of light. In Kriemhilde's soul, she must have felt some sort of intuition here. Quote, here is a depiction of the sun god torn away from the old goddess, and so too was the hero of the sun torn away from me. Close quote. She knew this only as an intuition in her soul at first. She certainly did not call him the hero of the sun, but such ideas drifted about in the subconscious of this mysterious individual. Perhaps she still carried these ideas from earlier incarnations, when more was woven into the soul than it was in the later times, when those souls became the earthly figures from the time of the Nibelungen lead. And so we can understand why the passions of Kriemhilde and Brunhilde flared up as this drama about the old sun god played out before them. Then, afterward, Kriemhilde reproaches Brunhilde at the baths, and Brunhilde comes to the decision to make Hagen her wrath, to whom she has entrusted herself into the murderer of Siegfried. 
who betrayed her. This is how Wilhelm Jordan seeks to reinvigorate the things that lived in olden times. He also seeks to do so in such a way that in his resurrected work, the effects are still felt of the interweaving that was present in the poem at a time when the human soul stood in a more intimate relationship to language than is the case today. At that time, the human soul still felt the seething and weaving and working and being, the weaving and waving expressed in the words of the language. And how curious it is, the poet resurrects this sense of oneness with language, which was the particular characteristic of older poetry. That is precisely what we would like to present to you today through the example of a few passages. But in these old verses you will find none of the external synthesis of end rhymes which brings the rational element into artistic formation, but which is also always something that is built into the artistic structure of the language from without. The poetry of older times sprang directly from the organism of the language itself. And for people now it sounds strange when true value is given to this form of poetry. If you really elevate this inner sense of being interwoven with the weaving effects of the working soul, it seems unnatural to people now. But Wilhelm Jordan had the courage to do just that, to draw out the innerness of alliteration in our language, which is not well suited to it. And when he recited his Nibelungenlied himself, he sought to present this very particular old essence of poetry, of alliteration in verse, to his contemporary public. You can really hear the alliteration when it is spoken. Uh, I'm now going to be, there's quotes and interspersions in those quotes. I'll do my best. Quote, Where now Rhenish florets fuse the famous fiery milk for men, from essences of earth and sunbeams. In the town of Worms there once one was not permitted with shovel nor rake to disturb the ground. For there, somewhere in the broad Maifelt, upon a gentle height lay the holy Holt, and at its edge, Ein Rhein, there now stood a stage, the stately setting for the Baldur play. Close quote, Steiner now. Nowadays there is no longer any feeling for this most inner relationship to the language. Quote again, Where now Rhenish florets fuse the famous. Close quote, Steiner again. We are now going to present this old song of Baldur as an example of this resurrection of alliteration, so that you may hear what an old song would have elicited. Long quote now. As the sinking sun showered the stream of legends, the emerald Rhine, blushing in parting, with jewelry and glowing gold, upstream and downstream slid countless ships through the gleaming waves near Worms, carrying the people from the festival play homeward. Clear tones from human tongues rang out in rhythm with the regular rushing and rapping of oars, in several boats that drifted near to one another. The people sang the song of longing, the nana bore down to the realm of night when the mistletoe murdered her. Listening at the window of the prince's palace, Krimhilde lay and waited for her husband, anxious, Fearing the bitterest reproaches, her soul apprehensive, filled with longing and pain, yearned for her faraway beloved. She felt herself guilty and foresaw the fate that lay in his approaching footsteps. Thus bleak and fearful in her soul, she heard the morning song. While the comfort of most ancient sages rang out from the Rhine, their lips stirred gently and let the words of the song, which she had known from earliest childhood, also be heard in her own ear. Subquote, o Balder, my lover, where are you hidden? 
Hear how Nana is unspeakably afraid. Appear, beautiful one, and incline to Nana, caressing and kissing the lover's lips. Close subquote. Then the burning meadows rang out in plaints, in sighing voices and songs of death. The flowers faded, turned pale, shed their leaves. Summer killed them with a scorching beam. At the funeral of divine Lenz, he fell apart and followed him into fiery death. Subquote, O Balder, my lover, my longed-for love, unspeakable yearning burns in my breast. Close subquote. Then the sound of the loved one resounded from the deep. Subquote, I have forsaken the world of light. You seek for me in vain. O Balder, my lover, where are you hidden? Tell how Nana, by love, may release you. Do not call me back from the depths of death. What you love you must leave, and only the grief is long. Close subquote. O Balder, my lover, now darkness shrouds you, so then take Nana too down into the night. Close quote. Steiner again. The old clairvoyance dies and disappears. The human being stands alone, abandoned, and looks for what disappears, longs for it. Nana, the world soul, seeks Baldur, the sun god, who has gone to hell in the land of the Niffel. Now, Hagen must gradually begin the preparations that might eventually bring about Siegfried's death. I cannot fully describe everything that Wilhelm Joden has wonderfully derived from both the old legend and his own fantasy, to show how profoundly Hagen prepares Siegfried's death. I will simply draw your attention to the fact that part of these preparations involves burning down a tower. The fiery glow of this comes through the window into Gunther's chambers, and here in Wilhelm Jordan a feeling is reawakened, which is connected with something that I will talk about later, if time allows. The very particular old feeling for nature, which human beings today have no concept of, is reawakened here. In the light of the fire, human knowledge is kindled, a knowledge that is still connected with direct external appearance, a knowledge that still has something like a touch of the soul that liberates itself into the dream realm and can also still connect with the external forces of nature. And as fate looms over Siegfried, and as the Norns interweave his destiny with death, the old song of the Norns, the song of the elementals of fate, pours out of the souls of those who are most affected by it. Quote, Was not the fire over there long extinguished, the smoke dissipated? See how a gloomy cloud escapes from the black ruins. It rises as a shadow in the stars glow, like storm-driven dream shapes. Over the Rhine, on smoky wings it floats. Three dark sisters, giant forms, now stand resting, high in the air upon the ruler's palace. Spindle and spool, shuttle and reel, sharpening stone and scissors, they hold in their hands, and they spin and spool and stretch the threads and reel and eave and sharpen the scissors and model songs so soul-crushing that, so shaken by fear of death, the deaf sleepers in the castle sob in their dreams. For whether the ears slumber unsuspecting, conscience awakes in listening hearts. Jealousy has flown the net of the curse. The house is desecrated. Hells rules it. The serpent settled it. Then the seed of the sin further proliferated the desire for gold. Well does the loving light god form on the tree full of seething poison a pure sprig and may bold apprehension of the goal of the future protect the wonder on Hinderberg's heights. In vain 
The tempter corrupted these too with hunger for gold, with hot desire. Then the will arose to push toward the throne, falsifying the man's word, true betrayal. The model is broken in the morning. The scissors of guilt undo the wondrous web. Sons of the same tribe fight one another. Infants already savor death in their milk. The tendrils of vengeance there bloom from the blood, destructively plunging the tribe into the dust. Now in unceasing rage they must murder them. The daughter destroys the race of the serpent. The net of the Norns, braided with curses, the henchmen of hell, this horrible house, its bragging and flaunting with marvelous luck, now pay off tenfold the Nibelung's trouble. Close quote. Steiner again. As Siegfried draws ever closer to his death, he becomes ever more interwoven with nature. As I said, in olden times, a clear, almost clairvoyant feeling for nature could be perceived in an almost tragic way. And through this clear, clairvoyant feeling perception, Siegfried sees his fate hovering before him. But Siegfried also sees the workings of his soul's fate interwoven, inwardly interconnected with the whole course of earth evolution. And it is as though the fate Weavings and workings of the earth's soul are written together with those of his soul there within his heart-mind, which has become clairvoyant for that moment, as though a darkening of the sun that produces in Siegfried the feeling of the sun's forces disappearing also signal the similar disappearance of the sun's forces for the earth itself in the coming period of winter on earth where the inner strength of the sun is to die. The things that flow spiritually into the human being from the sun are also to disappear. Siegfried feels these things welling up in his own heart-mind as he approaches his fate. And by considering the darkening of the sun, he is able to wrest from that a glimpse of the gradual dying of the sun's blaze in the workings and weavings of the cosmos, and in the conjunction of the cosmos with the earth's workings and weavings. And so then he sees the gradual fading of the glow of his own soul, in a sense of his own heart-mind, there in the dying forces of the sun. And an old song, learned abroad in Iceland, on the far side of the sea where Brynhilde is from, comes to him. He who has suddenly become clairvoyant in his senses. A frightened sense of foreboding settles over his soul. It is reflected in a deeply inward connection with the clairvoyant feeling perception of his own very personal fate. Quote, the hero obeyed and toward evening hurried down alone. And the evening also grew within him. A gloomy prescience of a sad end surrounded his sunny fate with shadows. Yet he had no other choice than to ponder the gruesome words of the crazy woman and so and to sift from the madness the sick soul's meaning denied him any other option. By evening it was all about him. But still, high in the sky the sun shone, nor did he see any streak of floating merging clouds, however far he gazed. But this blueness was like that steel. The birds fell silent, hid themselves quietly in the treetops, hiding their heads in brightly colored plumage. Only bevies of swallows still swooped uneasily, and their chirping rang out like desperation. The mouse scurried out of his hole, the marten stalked the drowsy birds like a furtive assassin. Hideous moths flew up, and bats. The chuckling screech owl and the groaning eagle owl exulted, delighted to be hunting so early. Darker it grew, and yet all things still stayed wonderfully clear. Yes, shadow and light were more sharply contrasted. 
Then precisely in the shade of the sheltering lime tree he understood the riddle of his feet. Through the gaps in the leaves, where the quivering light reached the grass on the ground, were formed not the usual circles, but rather sharp sickles. He looked up to heaven, still blazing there, like a half-moon, splendid, gazing at him. He peered round, and behold, there the sun clearly reflected, in the form of a sickle, a blackish swamp, weakened and softened. Then an anxious foreboding of coming disaster filled the heart of the fearless hero. Yet no longer for himself. How his undarkened spirit now stretched to the soul of the earth, filled with thoughts of the night, the twilight of the gods, the day of decline emerged from the future, and a primordial song, learned in Iceland, loudly rang forth from the lips of the hero. Up there is hardship too, and threatens annihilation. In heaven also, so I hear, lights already go out and destruction awaits the proudest stars. The night, too, will one day draw near that no morning will ever follow, for the sun will be ailing in the coming summers. There was already once a winter that lasted forever, whose skulking skies never parted, never opened. As the Alps now bristle with eternal ice, so the landscapes lay burdened with glaciers for the sun was ailing in summers past. And another such winter will come again, where terrible frosts will follow the spring. Dense smoke will darken the source of existence until it is hardly recognizable like dull coal, where the sun will be ailing at the turn of summer. A whale will roll there through icy water and swing his tail as he swims south, In the icy waters his fins interlock, his pulse congeals on palmy shores, for the sun is ailing. And it is nowhere summer. With such a song Sigrid wanders alone toward evening until from a distance he finally becomes aware of the prince's camp, where, oddly illuminated by the waning sun, Waning sun, the Burgundians appeared as spirits and shadows, who still awaited salvation in a sleepy grove at the trackless foot of the cliffs of Ida. Close quote. Steiner again. We can begin to approach the material that Wilhelm Jordan sought to renew in his own way during the last third of the nineteenth century only if we are thoroughly convinced that the perspective of spiritual science is necessary in order to arrive at a relationship to what is contained in this material, which is so rich in content. From a spiritual scientific perspective, the material and the language belong together when it comes to such things, which is why I have pointed to both the language and the material itself today. The significant experiences for the early Middle Ages that were commemorated in the verses of the Nibelungenlied were diminished and forgotten in the age that followed. It was an age that from the perspective of spiritual content was much different from the one that preceded it. What comes up for us now when we immerse ourselves in the Nibelungenlied was not there for people in the 16th and 17th centuries. It really was not there. At one time it was there, through the recitations that were the customary way of presenting the verses to people. The content was elevated to the greatness and significance of the human essence. But when Central Europe was conquered by foreign empires, the fate of Central European spiritual life was that all of the things that had once led to its greatness were forgotten. This is the only reason that it could have happened that the material for the Nibelungenlied was recovered from individual pieces of handwritten manuscripts. And this is common for many of the great treasures of past ages, in which such significant lives 
in which such significance lives. This very particular sort of fate that was determined for the treasure of the Nibelungen lead is common. What do we actually find in the stories from the Nibelungen lead? People step before us, and as soon as we get to know them through this piece, we know that more is living in them than can ever come to full expression or direct revelation through the earthly shells in which they battle and contend with the affairs of life. More is living in all of these souls than can be brought into external reality through their bodies. This is very true for Brunhilde. It is very true for Siegfried, and even to a certain extent for Hagen. In the case of Kriemhilde and Günther, on the other hand, we see that they are people with souls that fit more readily into the age in which they live. In Brunhilde and Siegfried, beings have been incarnated who no longer fit into the age in which they live. Siegfried is still a sun hero. Brunhilde is a Valkyrie, a world mother. As such, they both have relatives. And this is also why Brunhilde, the Valkyrie, can be conquered only by Siegfried, the sun hero. Kriemhilde and Günther are beings who fit more readily into the age in which they live, for they have already lost the old clairvoyance. Gunhilda and Siegfried still have it to some extent, and so does Hagen to a degree. But Siegfried has to live in the age in which he has incarnated. He has to live with the essence of his soul in that unfitting age. And the way in which he lives out his life shows us his soul in a particular way from a spiritual scientific perspective. His soul was once in the body of an ancient initiate, a primitive human being in an early incarnation who is deeply familiar with the qualities of the spiritual world. And if we look at Gunhilde's soul, the Valkyrie soul, from a spiritual scientific perspective, it shows us that it contains something of the soul beings that were still able to appear in human beings in ancient times with their dreamlike clairvoyance. In more recent times, such beings are visible only to heroes. When led by the courage of the warrior, they move through the gate of death into the spiritual realm, where they encounter souls like Brunhilde's in the form of Valkyrie souls. Now, these people are placed into the world of physical earth events, and thus what is erected over these souls is something that can only be set up as a tragic fate. Even in the courage and bustle of battle, the suffering, the tragic element, the lament that moves in and throughout the Nibelungen lead is being readied. For these souls carry something within themselves that no longer can be fully a part of their immediate present. We might say that in the unconscious memory of these souls, something of the former greatness of the earth still lives, something from the old Atlantean ages. This is how great and powerful these souls once were. The extent to which earthly experiences can play out in such souls, the loyalties between such souls and their relationships, is what the Nibelungen lead seeks to depict just as the older legends so beautifully told of individuals like Siegfried. Let us imagine for a moment that Siegfried was a soul in an earlier incarnation, familiar with the workings of the spiritual world. Standing powerfully there within that spiritual world with its forces of soul, with his soul element, and now he is born as Siegfried. Then, forces turn up in his soul that lead to what he was once interwoven with, to what no longer exists as dreamlike clairvoyance and is now hidden in the shallows of physical existence. So he is driven toward something that he can no longer see properly, and at most he sees it in very disjointed moments. He is driven to dragons and toward enchanted individuals, and then the things that he can no longer see properly are interwoven with the courage and the lust for battle that live in his heart. 
and the dragon blood on his skin turns his skin to a hard, stony skin because he bears within himself the power of what he once had as a kind of sight. Above all, the memory of it all is there, the sense that there was indeed a humanity with a dreamlike clairvoyance, for whose souls a portion of the suprasensory world and its workings and weavings lay open. But this power of sun vision has faded. The sun has set on this form of clairvoyant vision. Baldur has faded, and Nana, the human soul, perceives the tragedy of this fading of the old powers of sun vision. Let us place ourselves into the atmosphere from which the material of the Nibelungen lead is woven, into the morning of this fading clairvoyant sun vision, into the knowledge that this power of sun vision is now present at most in the forces of will transformed into the working of the will forces. The hollowness and professor itis, in quotes, of the nineteenth century transformed this deeply tra- tragic sense of the fading visionary powers of old sun in later human souls into the abstract parable of springs fading in Baldur. And furthermore, this same hollowness and professor itis brought about the rise of all these abstract, learned, dodgy, preposterous symbols from out of the learning, mislearning, and perversity as it abused the great and powerful things that lay in tidings of the fading of that ancient dream-like visionary power from the human soul. In Nana we see the human soul mourning for Baldur, with whom it had once been connected in the form of that visionary power from old sun. The human soul now languishes in the dark realm of hell, since all that remains to it is the gold of reason and understanding, which it can seek only with the powers of its own reason, bound up in the head, and the powers of the earth, which is to say the stuff of the material senses. Only when we truly understand the mood that permeates all of the Nibelungen material do we truly understand what lives and moves within it. Then we also understand how we can see in the events that occur within it something like a projection of what lived in ancient times, things that now live only in weak echoes within the human beings who live during the time that the epic speaks of. And so we see that in ancient times the visionary power that arose in the human soul was connected with the visionary power that lived in other human souls. But we also see that in a later age when such connections between souls' visionary powers are no longer possible, people no longer find the companions whom they seem meant to be with. This is because the once powerful visionary powers have reincarnated into a body that cannot fully express these old powers of the soul. Siegfried cannot find Brunhilde. Siegfried frees Kriemhilde, who was actually born into her present moment, and Gunther, who was also actually born into his present age, frees Brunhilde, who bears a soul that is equipped with the old powers, with the visionary powers of old son. And so, in a time that is preparing for the age of materialism, the souls become intermingled and confused. This is what leads to their tragic fate. This transition from an ancient and souled age full of visionary powers to a more modern age based solely on reason and the senses plays out in the fates of human beings. And if we ever find ourselves in a position to derive more from the depths of soul spiritual science, we will find an endless amount of depth in material like the Nibelungenlied. One day we will be able to draw out all of the things that live in this magnificent ancient legend. In our time we can only gesture in broad strokes toward the deep content of the Nibelungen material. 
But a person like Wilhelm Jordan did have a clear consciousness of everything that I have been saying, although there was no spiritual science when he was alive. He, nevertheless, had some inkling of it from a period that I mentioned to you yesterday, as well a time when Ludwig Feuerbach in the 1840s grasped an eminently spiritual thought in the interest of fighting against it, since he was, after all, against all spirituality. The gods give us everything. It really just depends on whether people are capable of grasping it. But Wilhelm Jordan really immersed himself unfathomably, deeply, in the workings and weavings and ebbs and flows of his age. He had a prescient feeling of something in those depths, and so he sought to renew in his own way what lives in the Nibelungenlied. It was no longer as bad as it had been during the 17th century and the start of 18th century, which was the time of budding materialism, when people had completely forgotten the Nibelungenlied, along with everything else that was spiritual. That was a time when no one knew a thing about the Nibelungen Lied, and it was left to a deeply profound Swiss man who became a professor at the Joachimsthaler Gymnasium in Berlin, Christoph Heinrich Müller, to draw attention once again to the greatness and the significance that is contained in the Nibelungen material. Müller was the first one to publish any of this treasure, under the title Trimhilde's Wrath, taken from the von Hohenem manuscript in Vorarlberg. He had found two different manuscripts. A text that has served to elevate countless souls over the course of centuries once again had to be saved from complete oblivion. And when Müller, this Swiss professor teaching in Berlin, pointed out the great significance of the Nibelungen Lied, Frederick II, the pupil of Voltaire, wrote to him and said, Most esteemed teacher and scholar, you have far too favorable a judgment of those poems from the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, whose publications you have demanded and which you consider so useful for the enrichment of the German language. In my view, they are not worth the paper they are printed on, and it serves nothing to rescue them from the waste bin of oblivion. At least in my book collection, such wretched stuff shall find no place on the shelf. I would rather it be thrown out. The copy that was sent to me can thus await its fate in that great library. Many inquiries pledged, but never such a one as this, your otherwise gracious king. Potsdam, February 22, 1784. Close quote, Steiner again. I do not know if this is still the case, but our friends from Zurich would know. For a long time this letter was displayed under glass in the Central Bibliothek, Central Library in Zurich, so you could see it as soon as you walked into the library. But as I said, in the first half of the 19th century, some people became aware of the great, of the true greatness of the Nibelungenlied, and Wilhelm Jordan now had the need to do something to awaken the age in which the true Nibelungen material could live. But that age was one in which people had a very different relationship to language than the relationship we currently have to it. And those who had the feeling that something unnatural lived in the peculiar alliterative quality of the language that Wilhelm Jordan sought to form demonstrated through this very feeling that they could no longer have the old intimate relationship to the language that people had who knew that something of God's word was at work in the effects of language. That was a relationship to language in which people still felt that the connections that lived between things and their thoughts must somehow come out in language, in the weaving and living and working and being of language. In any case, our age is one in which materialism has taken hold of absolutely everything, including our relationship to language. In everyday speech, we no longer have any sense of what language once was, how it flowed from the living life of the soul, how the soul was intimately interwoven with language. Wilhelm Jordan still had a sense that language is connected with the spiritual realm, 
Language has become abstract in our time and consists of nothing more than signs for the things that are to be expressed. The spirit no longer resonates with it. It is no longer a spring that flows from the inner life, from human breath and breathing. Just as my hand is a part of me as I use it to make a gesture, so too did speakers of earlier ages perceive something like gestures or gesticulations of the being of breath in the movement and life of words. But for this to be the case, language had to be richer than it can be today, when it has been reduced to the level of signs, and the soul no longer perceives the connection between speech and thought. Now, we refer to a, in quotes, plucky hero, without giving it a moment's thought. If we were to resurrect a person from the Middle Ages, and if he were to hear what we call people, that we call people plucky heroes, he would not be able to keep himself from laughing. It would say, quote, a brave hero? What is that supposed to mean? Close quote. He would have the feeling that plucky, in German tapfer, meant plopping and waddling, tapsen. He would say, quote, you could call a hippo or an elephant tapfer, but not a hero, close quote. And he would never call a hero great. Great and small were only sensory concepts for him. We call our heroes great because we no longer have a concept for what the word expresses. That is the purely sensory perception of a looming figure. The people of the Middle Ages had instead a rich treasure, far richer than ours, of ways to refer to a hero. For example, a hero was rash, balda, and when a person from the Middle Ages heard that, he still had a feeling for what lay within it. Or a hero was rigid or tight, string, a rigid hero. What would a contemporary person make of that? A person from the Middle Ages would know that a rigid or tight hero was one with powerful muscles. Rigid was a way of describing the hero's figure in regard to his muscles. A person from the Middle Ages would laugh especially loudly if he heard us say that, quote, a hero is gutsy, mutik, close quote. He would say, what do you mean by that exactly? A gutsy hero is one whose guts, whose feeling heart, gemüt, has gotten away from him. A person who is particularly passionate. They would never have said a gutsy hero. But you see, back then the language was much, much richer with words than it is now. Our language has lost many words, for that inner relationship to the language has been lost. Let us take one example that lies very close at hand. I would like to make you familiar with this one. Let us imagine that a person wanted to say, quote, The men were awaiting their horses, close quote. Back then, he could have said, uh, here's the maybe German or some old German, I'm going to read this, Varun Veros an Vatu Vigio. Here we have that alliterative language. If, for example, someone wanted to say, quote, the man was at home among the servants, close quote, and if he had also wanted to use the same word for man, he would not have been able to achieve the same alliteration. For this sentence, quote, the man was home was at home among the servants, close quote, he could have said, quote, Zeg was in Zelda undar gesindun, close quote. It was possible to connect the word for home, Zelda, with this other word, which can be used for man, Zeg. Or, for yet another example, if one wanted to say, quote, the dearest of the men was Dietrich, close quote, and now, quote, de gano de quisto diotriga, close quote. It was possible to find multiple forms and words to express the idea of man or men. All of this is lost. And we have to translate all of these sentences in the same way, using the words man and men, man und mena. Our language has completely lost this inner relationship to thoughts and to expression. 
Wilhelm Jordan has tried to reestablish this sort of relationship, and he has accomplished that insofar as he was able. Of course, he was no longer able to really call up the same quality that the old language had, an inner interwoven connection with the sense of the living thought beings in the words themselves. People now are content to say things like, quote, the man has a home, close quote, or, quote, the man has a house, close quote. People from the Middle Ages would never have spoken so simply of, quote, house and hearth, in quote, in their language. Or they would not easily have said, quote, with my senses I perceive something, close quote. They would have sought rather to break up the thing they perceived with their senses into component parts, so that it came toward them in a more concrete, definite, and fully formed, excuse me, fully developed form. So, they would say something like, quote, Hugi endi herta, close quote. We might say now that both of these words mean, in quotes, sense, so that the phrase could be translated as, quote, sense and sense, close quote, because this distinction between Hugi and Hertha has dissipated. Again and again you feel a kind of unfathomable content in this ancient language. Wilhelm Jordan wanted to rescue at least a little something of this inner life of the language. And so a conflict between this desire and the abstractness of our modern language arose within him. And he wanted to rescue the small possibility of establishing that ancient intimacy in language which exists solely in the German tongue and no other. It goes without saying that people now will read something like the lines that I read for you as analogies, so that the content of the lines are nothing more than a spoken sign for the analogous sense perception. The vast majority of the European population has no other feeling than this, that language is a sign for the sense perception. And so they are satisfied when they hear, I'm going to read this and give it my best shot here in German, quote, Wo nun rheinische Reben die Welt berühmter, feuriger Milch für Männer mischen, von Säften der Erde und Sonnenstrahlen, im Weichbild von Würms. Close quote, read without emphasizing the alliteration. Steiner again. It is certainly true that in this case one is simply using the language as a sign. There are languages today that even drop many of their syllables because the language has turned completely into a sign system and no longer lives in the act of speaking it. Above all else, you will never be able to penetrate to the true living principle of art if you have the feeling that language is merely a sign system. For this feeling can suffice only for prose. Poetry demands that language be given an inner form, and not merely the mechanism of an end rhyme. It must be given an inner form, just as a living organism has an inner form, through alliteration or assonance. The relationship of a mechanism to an organism is the same as the relationship of end rhyme to alliteration. Wilhelm Jordan sought to restore this efficacy to language. He sought to give to language the power that could be traced back to that ancient age of clairvoyance. In that ancient age of clairvoyance, people would not have been able to speak as we do now in our materialistic age, when people no longer have any feeling for the inner workings of language. In the ancient age of clairvoyance, people had both the need and the desire to illuminate the essence of the word with the light that lived in their thoughts. Wilhelm Jordan had an intuition for this. I often heard readings in the style of Wilhelm Jordan, particularly from his brother, who was a friend of mine, and you could always sense the longing to elevate the alliterative essence, to elevate the artistic over the unartistic over the merely rational sense perception, quote again, wo nun reinische Reben die Welt berühmter, feuriger Milch für Männer mischen, von Säften der Erde und Sonnenstrahlen, 
im Weichbild von Worms. Close quote. Steiner again. I can imagine that the contemporary materialistic individual of reason might consider this nothing more than playing around. Since 1907, we have worked to find the necessary form for modern declamation that would allow us to present in public speech the things that should be resurrected from ancient times. The first attempt which we had planned to undertake during the Munich Congress in 1907 was never publicly presented. But I think the things that are and are not possible in present-day language will have been made clear to you by today's attempt. But we can say nothing except that no one can accomplish the impossible. And our language has become such that it is impossible through alliteration to bring back in the fullest sense everything that lived during the period of old son clairvoyance. And the fact that Wilhelm Jordan wanted to do this was a mistake on his part. We might go so far as to say. It was an heroic effort but also, in a certain sense, an heroic error. But what did we learn? We learned that it is no longer possible to truly resurrect the alliteration of ancient times, of times that still echoed with the unmediated reverberations of a dreamlike clairvoyance. Language has become materialistic and abstract. But spiritual science will bring about a new form of artistic creation, a creation with an inner sense of form, whereby we will once again take hold of the word through an unmediated grasp of the spiritual. Such attempts have been made. Consider the seventh scene, the scene of the realm of spirit in the portal of initiation, and several others in which the attempt has been made through the grasp of the spiritual to move also into the spoken realm. The attempt has been made through images to bring such art back into language, which also then expresses the spirit to some extent, to allow it to resonate through words. Only in the German language is it even somewhat possible to express such a thing in our time. Here we also have an area in which we can see that it is predestined in the course of human evolution that the spirit be re-enlivened and made strong, that we no longer remain at the level of rational sense perception, but once again grasp the greater power of words. Then the things that have become the new runes, R-U-N-E-S, will once more rhyme in speech and through rhyme speak. The rune is the unmediated intertwining of the expression with what it expresses, so that the expression is no longer a mere sign. Again, we have an area in which the necessity of a spiritual, scientific worldview for our age is expressed in a deep and profound manner. If only many people could see, and as soon as possible, how much human life withers when it is not fructified by a new burst of spiritual light. For language itself, which lives among human beings as though it were a kind of physical aura, has become abstract, materialistic, and based solely on rational understanding. When we speak, not only when we think, we have all become materialists. But what has already turned to straw in our words so that we feel nothing but the plodding tapson in our pluck, tapfer, must be reclaimed by the soul, by the soul and not by the mechanism. For language has already become nothing more than a mechanism. The spiritual scientific stream must also reanimate the soul of language. And this wrestling with language in order to reanimate its soul can be perceived if we immerse ourselves in the sort of artistic striving that we see in an eminently philosophical person like Wilhelm Jordan. But the particular falsification that we call 19th century, in quotes, literary history, must be entirely rewritten if humanity hopes to arrive at a conception of what actually occurred. 
You will find other people named as the great authors of the 19th century in those literary histories. While those who undertook true and honest artistic projects, such as Wilhelm Jordan's title Demi- Demiurgos, published in the middle of the 19th century, are tossed aside by literary pedagogues like Karl Rudolf von Gottschall. In our time, who is aware of the fact that Wilhelm Jordan tried to depict the migrations of people here on earth in his title Demiurgos? This drifting of peoples across the earth is a reflection of something that occurs in the supra-sensory realm, meaning that the people in that work are signs for things that play out in the suprasensory realm. Nowadays, who is even aware that a person like Wilhelm Jordan wrestled with such great and significant questions during the dawn of this modern era? But the sun of this new age, the sun of spiritual science, will awaken from the stream of artistic life in a manner altogether different from the counterfeits that are given credence in schools and literary histories, works in which the new materialistic soul merely reflects upon itself and hungers for the content of the work because it sees such a great similarity in it with itself. Let us truly feel the magnitude of the task of spiritual scientific thought and sensibility. We can feel it by making ourselves conscious when we are speaking with straw words rather than ones that live and grow like the plants that once sprouted and flourished between the souls who sought to communicate with one another. True life will flow into the stream of existence when the spirit of spiritual science once again fills people with the meaning of that life. The end of Lecture 9 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161 by Rudolf Steiner entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, translated by Rory Bradley, this 13 lectures, this is Lecture 10, given in Dornach on April 2nd, 1915. Churches call their parishioners together throughout the year with a ringing of bells. Bells ringing mark the time. They are important announcements of time, and they also mark the times when the parishioners are called to the church. This significant sound of ringing bells is stopped among certain church communities during the period that begins with Good Friday, commemorating the death of Christ, and the bells are not rung again until Resurrection Day, the festival celebrating the resurrection of the power that we have often spoken of in our spiritual scientific remarks as the power that gives the earth meaning. The significance of this intervening time lies in the remembrance of the fact that the power that gave meaning to earth evolution has been reunited through sacrificial death with the depths of being. This time is denoted by the dissonant tones of the wooden instruments that are used instead of bells to mark the passage of time. The ringing of the bells again on Resurrection Sunday is meant to signal that the music of the bells has been blessed and made meaningful by the presence of this meaning on earth, and that these bells marking the passage of time will then continue to ring for all believers throughout the Christ-filled year. We have tried in many different ways to approach the meaning and essence of the power that flowed into the impulses of earth evolution through the mystery of Golgotha. You will have seen from the various remarks made that every path the soul might take toward this power is but one of many 
and all of them only partially evoke the sensibilities and feelings that allow you properly to take hold of all that should be revealed when you speak the name of Christ or speak of the mystery of Golgotha. Today we will once again select one of those many paths. Again it will be but one of many, for only by venturing down many of these paths that lead to the mystery of Golgotha can you arrive at an understanding suitable to the particular age in which you have incarnated. The path chosen today is one that will present to our souls the manner in which certain peoples, who knew nothing of the mystery of Golgotha, the peoples of early Europe, had to take up that mystery after having made preparations for it in their hearts and souls. In several of the earlier lectures, I indicated that a tragic feeling for nature was connected with northern European evolution during a particular period of time. This tragic feeling was radically different from the feeling for nature that originated in Christianity and spread throughout southern Europe during the first Christian centuries. The feeling for nature from Greek and Roman culture was, to a certain extent, connected with a kind of retreat from nature, a pulling back from the natural world. In these southern countries where Christianity spread in Greek and Roman culture, the concepts of sin and guilt were inwardly and intimately connected with the things that people felt flowed into the human soul from the natural world. Quote, retreat from nature into the climes of spiritual life, the climes from which Christ descended for the salvation of humanity, to bring meaning to the earth. Free yourself from all that is purely natural within the human being and turn toward that which can heal, that which can save you from the sins of nature. Close quote. These are the kinds of phrases that came in southern Europe out of that early Christian feeling for the natural world. The Celtic Germanic population was ensouled with an entirely different feeling for the natural world when they took up Christianity. It was impossible for them to simply flee from nature or connect it with the concepts of sin and shame. Over the course of many long centuries, the natural world had become far too important to the European populations to allow them to simply abandon it. They had grown together so intimately with the natural world that by the time they took up Christianity, although it was possible for them to turn toward a world other than the world of nature, they could not bring themselves to just say, quote, away from nature, close quote, this call away from nature, this looking and striving toward the fields of the mind, caused them great pain and sorrow in the soul. It caused them great distress, because in the background of all the wonders of the heavenly realm, there was a sorrow about all that had to be lost in the natural realm. And if you were to ask why such a feeling was there in the soul, you would find that the connection between these souls and the natural world still echoed within them from a not-too-distant past, a past that was much closer to them than it was for the Eastern or Southern European populations. It was as though something of that holy sense of well-being which accompanies a connection with the natural world and with God in the natural world, still lived in their hearts and souls. The sorrow, the pain, the mourning come from the feeling that a necessity, a prior world necessity, had caused the abandonment of what had once connected people with the holy element, the divine and the natural world. It was not merely a feeling that the natural world is being punished by sin and guilt. Rather, it was the feeling that in losing the natural world, something once infinitely worthy had been lost. 
It was not just the feeling that people were supposed to turn away from the natural world. It was, rather, much more the tragic feeling that something holy in the natural world had also turned away from the human heart and soul. And that now, what people had once honored in their connection with the natural world was to be experienced through the elevation of the mystery of Golgotha. This feeling was far more real and also infinitely more tragic when Christianity took hold in these regions than was the case in the regions south of the Alps and in the east. There is no better way to become clear about the meaning of the old sensibility for the natural world than by turning your eye, E-Y-E, toward what might be counted as a kind of anticipatory sense of Christ's sacrificial death in the European populations, by turning your eye toward the significance of Baldur's death and displacement to the underworld, to the world of hell, to Niflheim. I have often indicated that in our time it is difficult to call up into your soul everything that was once connected with the myth of Baldur, with the myth of this unique ancient sun god who was honored and worshipped by the peoples of northern Europe. And it is indeed difficult to make this clear in a time when people believe that the human soul, at a particular point in human evolution, has always appeared and experienced things in the same way that it appears and experiences things at this moment. We must instead convince ourselves of the thought that in ancient times the human soul was capable of having entirely different experiences than the ones it is capable of having in later periods, and that all of this is connected with a whole experience of natural existence. Just imagine for a moment that the human soul once looked out into the natural world through the human eye, E-Y-E, in an entirely different way than it currently looks out into the natural world through the current human eye, and that it once listened to the natural world through the human ear in an entirely different way than it currently listens to the natural world through the current human ear and become clear about the transition by selecting a comparison that even if it seems a bit radical, can nevertheless make the difference very clear. Now you look out into the natural world through your eyes. You see the green of the plants, the green-blue of the forests, the blue of the heavens, the colorful variegation of the flower beds. Now imagine that a revolution in human existence on earth were to occur because of some prior necessity, so that people suddenly lose their ability to see colors. And now the entire natural world would appear to be nothing but gray upon gray. And when you look at the heavens, you would see nothing but a different shade of gray than when you look at the gray meadows. And you would see nothing but different nuances of gray, black, and white when you look at the colorful beds of flowers. If you imagine such a revolution in the human perception of the visible natural world, you would have some sense of the sort of thing that actually happened during the period when the possibility was lost for people to look out across the meadows and see all of the many different elemental beings connected with the growing, intermingling, and essence of the flowers and blossoms. Because of a pronounced revolution in the ability to look at the natural world, the possibility was lost to look up at the stars and see the living spiritual beings of the planets intermingling with the stars in the ether. I have often indicated that it is one of the most untrue sentiments that people express when they say that nature makes no leaps. This saying is not true. Just as it is a great leap for the plant to transition from the green leaf to the petal of a blossom, so too it was a great leap in human evolution as we moved from ancient clairvoyance, when people saw the elementals moving and living there in the world, 
to the current form of seeing, in which we simply see the colorful bed of flowers spread out before us. What a tremendous leap! And the people who made up the peoples of Europe during the time that coincided with the period in which the mystery of Golgotha had already taken place in the East, those people still had a living sense that this older form of seeing was once there, that their forefathers had lived under conditions in which they could see the living beings in the meadows and the woods and in the infinite expanse of the heavens. And they had the feeling that all of that had vanished, dried up and died out. They had a feeling that when earlier people turned their eyes toward the moon at night, this moon did not appear to them merely in the form of the bright sickle, but that this bright sickle was surrounded by living spiritual planetary beings that said much to the human soul, and that this ability was then lost in the periods in which they had to live. When those souls asked themselves what had happened to cause the natural world to be so emptied of the divine, to spread such darkness in places where there once had been spiritual light, the person who led these people said that once in the world of the gods there was one named Baldur, in whom the force of sunlight had been drawn together. But, Because of the dark's hatred, Baldur had to abandon the field of vision that he had spread out across humanity's earth horizon in order to go to hell in the underworld. The visionary power of ancient times vanished. The bright sunlight has gone down. The bright light of the ancient gods has set. And the dead shine of sunlight is now reflected only through the light of the moon sickle. The world has become materialistic. The natural world for which people mourn and feel sorrow, the natural world that people now want to fill solely with the concepts of sin and shame, appears to be what was left behind, what was once unified with the divine and once sent the echoes of the divine to human souls. Thus the feeling that one might have about the death song of the ancient sun god Baldur was activated. He is no longer out there, surrounding our powers of vision. He has withdrawn to the underworld, leaving behind the mourning natural world to us. But where has he gone? Where in reality is this realm of hell, that realm of darkness to which Baldur has withdrawn? Where is he? I would say that our materialistic age will be able to prepare itself for such sensibilities only when it adopts the concepts mentioned here. Let us ask ourselves what it meant in ancient times when people turning to the natural world said to themselves, Baldur is there. What did that mean? This meant something truly real, something you cannot understand if you believe that the formation of the human constitution was always the same as it is today. Then a person in ancient times went outside and perceived things in the meadow. He could not always do it, but only at certain times. But because he could sometimes do it, he knew that it was possible that those living elemental beings that I spoke about were there. What was it like when that person was indeed able to see those elemental beings? It was not merely an act of looking. It was not the dead capturing of a sight. But rather it was connected with a living feeling, with a living perception. A person walked through the wood and looked at the spirits, the elemental beings. But he did not merely look at them. I would say that he drank in their being with his soul. He felt their skin as a refreshing soul-spiritual drink. He felt the breath that emanated from the elemental beings in the woods and the meadows penetrating into him through the etheric body. They make a body young. One might have that feeling, 
going out in the morning when the remains of the dawn make the elementals of the wood and meadows visible. They make a body young. They give it strength. And this power endures within you. You were really there when the elemental natural world made you young. You were truly present. But then what happened to all of these forces that kept the body young? They vanished from the external world and you could only have a sad, half-conscious connection with them. Where did they go? They continued to be active, but they were active only in unseen and unheard places, as it were. They were active, but they acted upon human nature in a way that humanity was no longer conscious of. And then came a time when, as people became aware of these forces, they had to say to themselves, quote, There are forces at work within me that I once had the power to see and whose influence on the external world I could notice and perceive. But now I can know only that they act upon me in a dark and unseen place. The god Baldur had been inserted in the realm of hell, into the darkness within the human being itself, into the underground places of the human soul. Where is Baldur? The priests who had to explain the secret to people who asked this question, where is Baldur, had to say, quote, Baldur is not in the visible world. As a human being, you need creative powers. The creative powers that kept the body young. Powers that you were once allowed to absorb half-consciously. Those powers are now active within you, completely without your knowing it and in such a way that you can derive nothing from them through your knowledge. Because you need these forces in those invisible places, Baldur has vanished from the visible realm and retreated to the world of your unconscious interior. This caused humanity to feel something that can be expressed in this way. Quote, As a human being, One part of me stands in the realm of hell. I cannot see how the creative powers of my life reach out from that realm and take hold in my soul body. The god Baldur is in the underworld, in hell, and he works in invisible ways upon me. The old sun clairvoyance of Baldur's realm has set and passed. Close quote. This mood of mourning sorrow and pain, is one that the soul may call forth, for it is not an irrelevant, egotistical human sorrow. It is a sense of mourning that the human being feels in connection with the cosmos. It is cosmic mourning, cosmic sorrow, and cosmic pain. And then tidings came that what had retreated into the realm of hell had been reanimated by another power, a power that you can rediscover through deep insight into your own interior, the place to which the ancient power of Baldur had vanished. Baldur is in the realm of hell, but Christ has descended into that very realm, into the realm of humanity's own subconscious essence. There he revives Baldur. And if we human beings have sufficiently immersed ourselves in precisely what humanity has become throughout the course of earth evolution, then we rediscover the creative powers that kept humanity young. You will find again what you have lost, for the ancient Baldur has descended into your own realm of darkness. There the Christ has found him. And he has revived the very thing that Baldur and his power once were to you. This is what the priests could proclaim to those among the peoples in that region who truly felt the deep secret brought by the message of the mystery of Golgotha. The Easter message appeared like a holy memory of very ancient holy ages. But it was also a memory that simultaneously offered new life. Still, every person had to realize, quote, the power of the ancient Baldur was too little to last for the whole of human evolution. 
a higher power had to enter to give back to humanity what it had to lose, what only Balder had. Close quote. As the tidings of Christ resounded in the memory of the ancient Baldur and his death, the resurrection of ancient power resounded within the human soul, into which that power had descended through Baldur's death, a power that was now newly awakened. To approach the meaning of the mystery of Golgotha for earth evolution, we must ask ourselves what the feelings and sensibilities were with which humanity encountered Christ during his lifetime. It is not a matter of coming to an abstract concept of the being of Christ or the mystery of Golgotha. Rather, it is a matter of being able to answer the following question for ourselves. Quote, what can the impulse that ran through the mystery of Golgotha animate in the deepest depths of the human soul? Close quote. Let us take a look at this mystery of Golgotha and how it was celebrated by the various religious denominations of the old world. On Good Friday the burial of Christ was celebrated. The bells went mute and silence spread across the earth. A person who was alive during the centuries that I am speaking of would have thought, quote, The world has become silent. There are no sounds or tones. The Christ has descended into the parts of the soul to which Baldur had to descend because Baldur's power was not enough to sufficiently elevate the human soul. Christ is down below, down in the mysterious depths where I also stand, when I look upon the unconscious creative powers within me. Close quote. The human heart can mystically see through all of this when it meditates on the following. The impulse of Golgotha has left this silent world. It resides below, where you are as well. Wait. Wait, and this impulse from Golgotha will unite with Baldur in the spiritual worlds to which your soul will also belong, if only it follows the paths that lead into your own underground places. During these Easter days, this impulse will reanimate Baldur. And within yourself, O oh human being, you will discover what declined and vanished from the world that surrounds you when Baldur disappeared into the depths of your interior. Take up, O oh human being, the living concept of Christ that entered through the mystery of Golgotha. It will arise again within your soul, not before your external eye, as the elemental power, the soul-enlivening creative power, so long as you become properly conscious of your interior life in the light of the moon, far from the sun. Wait, wait until it arises, the one who will revive Baldur. Once you had a world, in this world you needed only to direct your senses toward the natural world that surrounded you and the enlivening and souling power of the elementals in that natural world flowed toward you without any action on your part. A realm of spirit was woven through all of natural existence, and simply by waiting for a proper glimpse of your surroundings, you lived in a natural world that was not without spirit. You lived in what lives behind the natural world. You lived in the very existence of nature. Now you no longer find the spirit in the natural world. You must seek it through a deep re-enlivening of your own interior life with the power that entered through the mystery of Golgotha. Nature, you were once expressive, so expressive that humanity's true and genuine home appeared in your forms. This is something that Balder took with him. It is no longer there in nature but is instead to be found in regions that you cannot see with your external eye. But this old realm whose expression and forms once comprised the surrounding natural world still exists. You will not find it if you simply walk the path of nature alone. You will find it 
if you connect with the impulse that entered through the mystery of Golgotha. The natural world is not something sinful and guilty. It has been abandoned, abandoned by the sense of home that must be sought by those filled with the power of Christ. You might notice that you can still hear echoes in these Christian times of what ancient peoples took into their memory from the death of Baldur. And you might see that they used these echoes to connect Baldur's death with the tidings of the mystery of Golgotha. These echoes can be heard once the tone of sorrow and mourning for the natural world, which I just described, has gradually faded out and died away. To be sure, the demeanor that looks solely toward Christ and his sacrifice, solely toward that heavenly home, this attitude fills the Christian worldview. And so, among the peoples of Europe, another attitude became gradually more distinct, an attitude that saw the natural world not as an abandoned child, but as the lesser child, so to speak. But if you listen not only to the meaning of the words, but also to the way in which the words were used, as the tidings of the mystery of Golgotha spread across Europe in the 8th and ninth centuries, if you hearken to the way in which people were speaking about the fact that the true home of the human soul was not to be found in the earthly world, you can still sense something of that ancient tragic mood about a natural world deprived of Baldur. As I said, you simply need to listen, not to the words and their abstract meaning, but to the way in which these feelings about the natural home and about this other home for the human soul resound within the words. If you simply listen through to the feelings within the tidings of the mystery of Golgotha in the 8th and ninth centuries, you will see that such echoes existed even after Christianity had spread even after there were people seeking to spread Christianity in the form that had been taken up in the East. We have religious texts from this period that were composed to some extent by Europeans, and one of these European religious texts is the so-called title Harmony of the Gospels by Othfried, a monk who lived in Elsass. He learned the mysteries of Christianity from Rabanus Maurus and then sought to put what he felt to be the significance of the Gospels, the message of the death and resurrection of Christ, into his native language. Ottfried was born in Weissenberg in Elsass. He translated what he felt to be the significance of the Gospels, what he felt and perceived about the Gospels, into a language that was spoken at the time in Elsass. Readers aside, this is not the A-L-S-A-C-E, Alsace, but Elsass, E-L-S-A-S-S. End of readers aside. Let us listen to a few lines of particular interest from these Christ tidings by this Elsass monk from the ninth century. And let us attempt to listen, not to the abstract sense of the words, but rather listen through to hear the sadness felt for the abandoned home that humans once had in the natural world. To that end, I will first read to you the lines in the original language and then translate them into a more modern language insofar as that is possible. Readers aside, I have tried to read this. I cannot do it. I don't know what it's in or how it sounds. My apologies. So I'm just going to go directly to the translation. End of readers aside. Let us... Now try to offer this as close as possible in modern language. Quote, We feel suffering and pain for much that was dear to us and tolerate bitter times here, now. Now we are mourning with our pain here in the country. Steiner says he means the country of the earth. Back to the quote. In many different groupings because of our sin. Work. Steiner again, in earlier languages, work meant something more like troubles or toils, back to the quote, whose many labors are now visited upon us. We can know nothing of home, we who are destined for sorrow and abandoned. Woe, you foreign land! Oh, how hard you are! Steiner, thus he speaks to earth. Quote again, You are truly heavy, 
I say that to you everywhere. Weighed down with worries, ever shifting, are those who are without their home. I have felt it in me. Never have I felt something dear in you. Never have I found in you any other possessions than a pure sense for mourning, a heart full of sorrows, and a variety of great pains. Close quote, Steiner again. And so from the soul of that monk we hear what was felt at the time toward the natural world. And over and against this feeling there was a sense of the power that had entered through the mystery of Golgotha. It is very hard nowadays to revive a sense of how the great periods of celebration were elevated above everyday life in those times, when people still had a more living sense of what was being commemorated as Baldur's death, and of what had once more been taken up through the power that entered through the mystery of Golgotha, after a long and mournful period of abandonment. People first recognized the bitterness of death when meadows that allowed humans to see the elemental life forces no longer sprouted on the earth, when the earth itself seemed to offer only the forms of death, the death with which Baldur had united. And then by placing this death, whose bitterness they had only just learned on Good Friday, by experiencing it on Good Friday, Easter Saturday, all the way through to Easter Sunday, people then sensed that this death concealed the victorious power of life, which entered through the mystery of Golgotha and would always continue to re-enter human souls during these days of sorrowful celebration, in which, according to Angelus Silesius, both the death and rebirth of Christ are to be celebrated. Understanding of the power of Christ's death and sacrifice was infinitely more living during the periods of time when it was connected with the deceased Baldur. Once in the realm of the Aesir, Baldur enlivened the elemental beings through his power. He looked down upon earth from Breideblik, that was the name of Baldur's mountain, like the silver sunlight reflected off the moon. He went down into the dark depths on Good Friday, Easter Saturday, and the eve of Resurrection Sunday. One looked down into Baldur's new realm of death, but with the knowledge that down there in the realm of death was a seed that connects with the earth's evolutionary impulses and will bring about new life when it arises. This is the death that is felt in the power of the seed, moldering in the depths of the earth, which brings forth new plants. The new tidings came as powerful words of God to those who had learned to comprehend death through the fate of their god, Baldur. For three days they could perceive the effects of the power that had killed Baldur, the power that even Baldur could not defeat. This is why the sensibility that animates our soul during the silence surrounding us on these three days is altogether unique. It is and must be unique because we must, for the sake of humanity's ongoing development, feel that death is taking hold in earth evolution ever more intensely, that the once paradisiacal natural world must become ever darker and more deathly quiet around us, that the ever-victorious forces of life are maturing toward an ultimate death of being itself. This is how we look upon these three days, down below in an abysmal realm filled only with death. Christ is stirring. We follow him there because we know that some piece of our own being extends into this abyss of earthly existence. And because we know that we will elevate this part of ourselves only by connecting through the power that entered with the mystery of Golgotha with what would otherwise be purely death within us. Thus we descend into the depths and know that we must differentiate feelings and sense from one another, that we do no good if we do not consciously appoint these distinct feelings to certain days. We should rather learn that these are the days in which the soul must connect with what it can learn about death, about the death that made it necessary, the death that brought with it the need for Christ 
to descend down to it. Tomorrow we will look at the mystery of Golgotha from another side. But as I said, many paths lead to the summit where the deep meaning of the mystery of Golgotha will gradually become more understandable for us. This can happen only when we consider not only the victorious Christ, the solely victorious Christ, but also when we consider the Christ who is connected with death. And what death means for the whole of human life will perhaps become a little more clear if we immerse ourselves in the feelings and senses that one can have about the myth of Baldur, about what became of Baldur, the living power of the sun that affected all of the elemental world after he had died. If you animate this feeling in your soul, this feeling connected with Baldur's downfall, by saying, quote, just imagine how we would feel in a future world in which we remember that once there were gods who allowed us to see the surrounding world in a colorful collection of sensations. Now everything has just gone gray. Close quote. The fact that this is not our future, and it would have been if Christ had not come into the world, has been brought about by the victorious power of Christ. That which people do not yet believe, they will, they one day will, that the Christ power, which currently can affect only the human heart itself, will one day have an effect throughout all the cosmos, specifically in the earthly portion of the cosmos, and so far as it offers rejuvenating, enlivening power to the human being. Today we will also call before our souls the sense of how justified it is in encountering such a feeling that brings the human soul together with the cosmic Christ to consider what the Gospels mean about Christ's cosmic power, what they say when they want to show that Christ is a universal cosmic power who commands the winds and waves. The peoples of the 8th and 9th centuries felt a great deal precisely in conjunction with this glimpse of the Christ who would control the winds and the waves. They said, quote, Balder was in fact the one who made it so that we could truly and magnificently see the elemental world that worked and wove around us. But when we take up Christ and the power of our soul, Christ has the power to reawaken what was lost in Balder's death. Just as Balder appeared in the wind and the waves, so too Christ does Christ appear in the wind and the waves. It is not an abstract soul power. It is a power that works upon the winds and the waves. Close quote. And you may also be able to hear echoes of something else if you listen carefully to the Gospel text, the Heliant. This is another poem from the 19th century in addition to the one by Ottfried in which the feeling is strong, even if it is unspoken, that indeed Baldur once lived in the natural world. To be sure, the poet of the Heliant has long since discounted Baldur. He also was not interested to bring this idea to his people through abstract understanding. The idea of Baldur should have long since rotted away, but in his use of words he becomes particularly heartfelt when he is able to show how the power of Christ moves through nature, through the winds and the waves. It is as though one cannot help but become aware, even if not fully, quote, yes, the power that is greater than Baldur's power, the power that entered through the mystery of Golgotha, as if affected the winds and the waves. And this is what you feel in the words with which he tells of the scene in which Christ stills the winds and the waves of the ocean in the Gospel. The scene makes a strong impression on him, particularly in the way the poet wants to direct the soul in his mysterious fashion toward what it can feel in the activity of the natural world, in the way that this natural world is filled by the divine through Christ. The poet chooses particular words in which Christ's greatness can be strongly felt in the soul words through which the holy singular power of Christ can speak to the soul. Quote, because the people saw how Christ directed the winds and the waves of the ocean, close quote, here the Heliant expresses in a particularly heartfelt manner what the people felt 
toward this power of Christ, this Christ being, this individual Christ who entered through the mystery of Golgotha. Continue, quote, The people began to wonder among themselves, and several of them spoke with these words, subquote, What a powerful man he is, to whom the wind and the waves pay heed, close subquote. Continue, quote, Both of them listened to his message. There, the child of God, Close quote, which is to say humanity, continue, quote, the child of God was protected from danger by it. The ship sailed on. The young men, the people came to land and said, God be praised, and told of his great power. Close quote. Thus writes the poet of the Heliant in one of the first proclamations about the greatness of Christ, which lies symbolically today in the depths of death. And back then it sounded like this from the Heliant, uh, eight, chapter 8, perhaps, 30 to 38. Again, readers aside, my apologies, I simply cannot read this, uh, so I'm just going to skip it. Uh, all right, end of readers aside. Steiner again. So the people who came to land proclaimed God's great power. End of lecture 10. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Artistic Sensitivity, as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life and the World, translated by Rory Bradley. That's 13 lectures. This is Lecture 11, given in Dornach on April 3, 1915. Festivals and holidays are occasions when people can collectively contemplate important and significant matters of the soul and of evolution. In that light, It is quite appropriate that on the occasion of these days of sorrow we are taking up these considerations which might come to an individual during meditation or simply arise in the soul but which these holidays allow us to discuss together. Yesterday I gave some clear indications about the fact that the burial of Christ Jesus on Good Friday and the resurrection on Easter Sunday are symbols of something very important for both human and cosmic evolution. These are the days in which the human soul can actually experience, or at least feel its way, into one of the deepest and most inner aspects of its being. The symbol for the fact that the Christ being, or shall we say the incarnation of the Christ being, remained in a state of death on earth for three days, is connected with the deepest depths of the human being. We know this already from other lectures and discussions. And perhaps today, with this group of gathered friends, we can remind ourselves of an important mystery that is connected with this symbol. If you truly have a complete sense of the symbolic significance of Christ's burial, of what it means that he lay in that grave and experienced death, If you immerse yourself in these symbols properly, and if you are fructified by the achievements of spiritual science, then you will really experience something both in your feelings and thoughts that is connected with the deepest secrets of human nature on earth. If we ever finish this building here, there will be a specific place where we will have an image carved out of wood of the victory of the Christ being over Araman on the one side and Lucifer on the other. This image will represent the significance of the earthly relationship between Christ, Araman and Lucifer, which was reflected in the movement of the Christ being through the mystery of Golgotha. And now it might be said that If you really let the significance of Christ's lying in the grave work deeply and truly upon your soul, then a feeling will arise in your soul for the true meaning of Christ's battle against Lucifer and Araman. In order to understand this, let us bring up several things before our souls that we already know. 
particularly in ancient times. People have alluded to the fact that something like the death and resurrection of a god was prepared and anticipated in the old religions, and that they have gone on to believe that it is possible to conclude that the Christ event was merely a transmutation of something like, shall we say, the death and resurrection of Adonis. But such claims only show that the person who makes them lacks a true understanding of the Christ event. This is because when we this is because we can see in the nature of the Adonis story and the others like it the being of the natural world, a state of being that recurs every year and is connected with the natural world and that actually belongs to the natural world. The story of Baldur, which we discussed yesterday, is fundamentally connected with the appearances of nature and with the things that human beings in ancient times could observe in them. All pre-Christian religions were at their root religions whose devotional aspect was connected with what human beings who still possessed ancient clairvoyance could perceive in the natural world and its processes. And even today, the Eastern religions really have not moved past this point. Christianity has moved beyond it, for Christianity can be called an historical religion in the fullest sense of the word, a religion through which we arrive at what must be understood in the progress of human history and human evolution on the earth. The very fact of earth history comes about for the first time through the mystery of Golgotha. The essence and true significance of the mystery of Golgotha is that the Christ event, the event at Golgotha, stands at the midpoint of an earth evolution that goes through a period of ascent and then a period of descent. This has been described often. You could also say it the other way round, that it descends and then ascends. Furthermore, the very idea of history itself makes sense only because of the Christ event. Now we must answer a question. What is this historical progression anyway, which results from human actions and runs through the course course of earth evolution like an extension of the natural world. What is, in quotes, history actually? What are the occurrences that are played out in the progress of human deeds, feelings, and thoughts? What is that, anyway? When you stand with soul vision, honed by spiritual science, before the being of Christ Jesus lying in his grave during these days of Easter, then you will truly understand what history is. The meaning of history arises in your soul in that moment. It is that you become aware, if you have sharpened your soul vision through spiritual science, that history here on earth will one day become nature on the planetary body that earth will one day take on as a new incarnation. The history of earth anticipates and prepares the natural world of Jupiter. The historical events of Earth are a kind of prophetic proclamation of the natural events of Jupiter. How is that? Here on Earth, human life in its physical incarnation progresses in this way. We are planted into physical earthly existence through birth, We undergo an ascending course of physical development into our thirties and then a declining course of physical development after that. At the beginning of this earthly existence is our physical birth and at the end of it is our physical death, or rather what we call physical death. If a human being on earth does not participate in the powerful and essential inner experiences of the soul, then the middle of earthly existence in the physical incarnation, I would say somewhere in the mid-thirties, passes more or less unnoticed, at least in most cases, given the general level of self-awareness that people exhibit. This will be entirely different once humanity has gone through its time on Jupiter. It will be completely and utterly different. I will not speak today about the completely different way, completely different from the physical birth that occurs on Earth, in which the human being will enter life on Jupiter. I can speak about that at another time. 
And the human being on Jupiter will also leave behind physical existence in a completely different manner from the physical death on Earth. But the midpoint of life, in other words, the equivalent of what we experience in our mid-30s, will become very powerful and significant for the human being on Jupiter. I would put it this way. Something will enter into the life of the human beings who have evolved into an existence on Jupiter. At the midpoint of their existence, they will experience something like a combination of what birth and death are to human beings on Earth at the beginning and end of our physical incarnation. In other words, imagine that human beings will experience something in the middle of their incarnation on Jupiter that is roughly equivalent to what would result if you were to mix together birth and death. Now you must not imagine that you could simply combine these two things just as they manifest themselves as experiences on earth. Rather, birth and death must be brought together through a kind of chemical bonding. If you combine oxygen and hydrogen, something results that is nothing like either the hydrogen or the oxygen, that is, water. At the midpoint of an incarnation on Jupiter, the human being will experience a kind of combination of earthly birth and death, but one that is necessarily different from the kind of combination that one might come up with through an idea-based intellectual mixing of these two occurrences. So you see, existence moves forward step by step, and by the time we get to life on Jupiter, we must imagine that at the midpoint of a human being's life on Jupiter, something like what I have just described enters into existence. As you know, all of human consciousness on Jupiter will be quite different from our consciousness on Earth. To learn about the various stages of human consciousness from life on Saturn to life on Vulcan, you need only read what is written in the Akashic Record about them. You will then be able to recall that on Jupiter, a higher form of image vision enters in, an imaginative consciousness that represents a higher level of consciousness than what we experience on Earth. So we will grow into a consciousness that is not as disoriented as Earth consciousness, one that takes up the impressions it receives from the outside world in an entirely different way. Images in the form of imaginations will be generated from these impressions through internal will forces, in the same way that I, capital as a human on earth, might perceive something and then sketch it or draw it. This is roughly what consciousness on Jupiter will be like, except that the very act of perception on Jupiter will be entirely different than it is on earth. There, on Jupiter, the human being will seek out the images the kinds of things that turn into represented images on earth. They, too, will form something like paintings, but they will be the internal processing of incoming perceptions and make up the content of the imaginative consciousness. The human being will enter into Jupiter existence in order to obtain this imaginative consciousness. And, Just as earth consciousness undergoes a process of development during childhood, so too will this imaginative consciousness undergo a process of development, a process of unfolding. Then, when the middle of a human life on Jupiter arrives, at this midpoint of life on Jupiter, something will enter in during a period of time that we can symbolize as three earth days, That is, the Jupiter consciousness will experience a repetition of Earth consciousness, a short repetition, for it will last for only a few days. So a part of the experience of life on Jupiter will include a brief renewal of Earth consciousness in such a way that the human being in the midst of life on Jupiter will again feel and experience the world as an earthly being. Having gone through a period of time with the imaginative Jupiter consciousness, human beings will experience a period in which they have only Earth consciousness once again, a consciousness that is as unlike Jupiter consciousness as our dream consciousness is 
to our waking daily consciousness. When human beings step into this period of Jupiter-Earth consciousness, this repetition of Earth consciousness, we will experience a desire to undergo a kind of internal taking stock, a kind of review of everything that we achieved and gained as human beings on Earth, what we achieved and gained in the past. As I said, we will have this Earth consciousness for only a brief period of time during our lives on Jupiter. But during this period of time, we will feel an intense need to look back on our past as human beings. That is why this renewal of earth consciousness will be there. And when we look back on everything, the question will arise in each of us, what did you actually achieve during your past incarnations? What did you achieve and gain through what you became as a human being on earth? Each of us, we'll have to ask these questions out of a kind of cosmic necessity. Just as we must eat and sleep here on earth to survive, so too will it be absolutely necessary during this brief renewal of earth consciousness to ask ourselves, what did you achieve by becoming a human being? Why have you become a free and independent person? In that moment we will witness the sum of our experiences on earth. And in posing this question, in witnessing these experiences, what each of us has achieved and accomplished will step before our soul in a powerful Jupiter dream. But this Jupiter dream will be as real as all of our real perceptions on earth. It will not step before us as a dream image. It will have as much reality as the earthly human being that we see when we look at ourselves now. And then it will happen that a figure will step before us who answers our question clearly. And the being that steps before us as an answer to our question, the being whom we must then face, do you know who this being will be? It will be Lucifer. And Lucifer will say, quote, See now, that in everything you became in the past as a human being, you belong to me. Close quote. And you will certainly know that this is Lucifer, just as you recognize another person when he steps before you, and you perceive him now as a human being on earth through physical perception. You will know that you, that you worked for him in everything that you sought to become as a human being. Then you will recognize the full significance and power of the Christ. For you will recognize that you are not in a position by yourself to make any choice other than to follow Lucifer into his realm. Only because the Christ event, the Christ being, exists in human history, only this allows us to see that this Christ being did in fact enter earth evolution with gifts to bestow upon us. This is a fact that we will truly realize only then, during life on Jupiter, when we realize that it was the Christ being alone who enabled us not to walk the path with Lucifer, but rather to follow the path of cosmic evolution. For what does Lucifer want from us? What will he want from us then? He will say to us, This experience that you are having, this repetition of earth consciousness, is a very significant thing for you. For things will be different on Jupiter, entirely different. On earth, when we reach our mid-thirties, we continue to do the same thing in the second half of our lives that we did before. We eat and drink in order to preserve the physical organism. We do this after we turn 35, just like we did before we, before we turned 35. Things will be entirely different on Jupiter. On Jupiter you will not need to eat and drink in the same way that you do here on Earth, but you will be connected in a similar way to the processes of that physical body, in a body that now belongs fully to the Jupiter incarnation, just as you are connected to the processes of your own body here on earth through food and drink. 
From the moment in which earth consciousness is recalled onward, you will never be able to have the same relationship to your surroundings on Jupiter that you had before. If I may put it somewhat trivially, you will no longer bump up against it. I might be able to use this comparison. Were something similar to be the case on Earth when you turn 35, the conditions in your organs would change so that you could no longer breathe the earth air or digest the sustenance that the earth provides. Think about what it would be like if when we turned 35 we had to undergo a kind of development in our physical bodies that renders our organs unable to go through more years on earth. Something that made our physical body unable to bear anything that grows on the earth. This is how things will be, in a sense, on Jupiter. Of course, the conditions will be entirely different, but it will be the case that in the second half of our life on Jupiter, we will no longer be able to have direct physical contact with our surroundings. This will be a natural law on Jupiter. It will be an absolute natural law. Through the power of this natural law, Lucifer might possibly be able to lead our soul, which will still be very much alive, even though the body to which they are connected will no longer be able to sustain itself on Jupiter, were it not for the fact that Christ will be able to show us He has gathered treasures within us in the first half of our life on Jupiter that will sustain us during the second half of our existence on Jupiter. On Jupiter, Christ will not only demonstrate his ethical character to the outer world, as we saw here on earth, he will also be the inner nourishment of the second half of our life on Jupiter. And this sustenance will be simultaneously of moral significance. Only by gathering these sustaining treasures within us will Christ be able to free us from Lucifer. Were this not to occur, if Christ were not able to free us from Lucifer on Jupiter, then Lucifer would take our soul away with him. Our body, which will then be unable to have any connection with the physical world on Jupiter, will perish, will fall away from us. And Lucifer will show us, quote, Look there, I am taking your soul, but your body is falling away from you into Araman's coffers. He will have them now. They will go on living with him. Close quote. Everything will depend on our soul's ability in that moment when earth consciousness is recalled to look back and remember how it was filled with the mystery of Golgotha during its time on earth. How it was filled with the understanding that the Christ entered into human development and the historical development of earth evolution. Just think about the terrible circumstances of the human souls on Ju- Jupiter who look back on this time and have to say to themselves, quote, During my time on earth, I denied Christ. I did not want to know about Christ. I rejected the opportunity to learn at the proper moment about the Christ being who entered into earth evolution through the mystery of Golgotha. I cannot remember anything that happened on earth through the Christ. Close quote. If there are souls during the Jupiter phase of evolution in whom all memory of the Christ has been erased because they did not choose to fill themselves with understanding of the Christ event during their existence on earth, then a fearsome judgment day will come for them. Christ will not take them on to nurture and sustain them during the second half of their life on Jupiter, but instead will point the way with one hand to the place where Araman will take their physical remains and with the other to the place where Lucifer will lead their soul away. And now, with the understanding that spiritual science can give us of the mystery of Golgotha, turn back to the symbol of Christ Jesus lying in the grave. 
if you do not see a purely physical symbol there, but rather connect it with everything that you can know about the mystery of Golgotha, and if you have also developed certain faculties that allow you to see what spiritual science speaks of, then this symbol of Jesus lying in the grave will appear to you before your soul's eye, E-Y-E, as a vision of the future condition of the human being on Jupiter. In the old places of the initiates, the students had to seek, under the leadership of their initiates, what was called in the old mysteries, quote, beholding the sun at midnight, close quote. Physically, we see the sun during the day. At midnight, initiates see the sun straight through the earth, even though the earth is physically opaque. Insofar as they could see the sun right through the earth, the sun was stripped of its physical existence. On the other hand, the secret of Christ, the sun spirit, had been written onto the existence of the sun, and the students of the ancient initiates prophesied the secret of the Christ, the sun spirit. It was a higher form of seeing the natural world, a kind of natural clairvoyance. The symbols of Easter can show us a process of becoming clairvoyant within the historical life of the human being on earth, a process of starting to see clearly that we have already made our pact with Lucifer and Araman, and that only Christ can release us from it. The meaning of seeing the sun at midnight for the students of the ancient initiates can gradually become the devotional reverence that the Christian feels toward the mystery of Good Friday and Easter Saturday. We have every reason to concentrate during these days on all that is connected with the inner sense of tragedy, on the quite proper sense of inner sorrow felt in the depths of the human being. We would never have been able to become free beings on earth if we had not entered into the relationship with Lucifer and Araman that I have described today, if we had not made it possible for ourselves to go the way of the paths of Lucifer and Araman, during these days we can all call to mind the tragic element that lies in the depths of our being by saying to ourselves, quote, My freedom would never have been possible if it were not also possible for me to follow Araman and Lucifer. Close quote. And we can call up this consciousness by beholding the symbol of Christ lying in the grave. Christ, who was able through his actions to undo what had to be done in the interest of human freedom. In these days that are dedicated to commemorating the burial of Christ, we may find a murmur in our souls telling us that we are justified in feeling sorrow for humanity that the human being is not only cause for rejoicing, but also a true and significant reason to mourn. There are, after all, many days throughout the year in which we can think more about what we have become because of the fact that earth evolution was not simply abandoned and that Christ was resurrected into earthly existence. But during these days, we can pour forth everything that made the mystery of Golgotha necessary, everything that might live in the human soul as a kind of cosmic sorrow. And if you have gained some feeling for what the human soul has been connected with through history, then these days are ones in which you can experience sorrow about human evolution. Actually, it would be much better to say that these days are ones in which you are permitted to experience sorrow about human evolution. And if this feeling is a living one, then the black decor that we select for the room during this period of time is justified. This is why I was so disturbed yesterday when I saw the red shining out from within the black. Red is the color that we may again encounter after these days of sorrow are past. The sorrow about this deep tragedy connected with the essence of the human being. It was in bad taste from both a Christian and an artistic point of view, that red was hanging here yesterday. These things must also be learned. But once you have learned them, you will be able to feel how these external forms have a deep significance 
and are connected with what could be called the human souls growing together with cosmic experiences. Is this not expressed through the very observance of Easter itself? The period of Easter is determined by cosmic events, the first Sunday after the full moon that follows the equinox. The signs that tell us when Easter occurs are up above in the heavens. A barbaric scientific perspective has been demanding in the last two years that Easter should fall on the same day every year. If this demand were to be realized, it would be a very clear indication of how much humanity is trying to distance itself from a truly spiritual life, one that cannot be developed unless people become aware that their soul does not live simply in the midst of everything that circulates on the earth. One could use the exchange of money as an external symbol for this act of circulation. For everything that is symbolized in this monetary exchange, it would be quite comfortable to have Easter occur on the same day every year. But for everything that flows into the human soul from the life of the cosmos, it would be fatal if this barbaric scientific perspective, which wants to fix the dates of Easter, were to succeed, since we would no longer look to the cosmos to determine when these days should fall. Such details allow us to see how humanity is sailing headlong into Aramonic materialism. We need more people who, through a commitment to spiritual science, become wise to all of this. Surely you are familiar with Michelangelo's powerful work in the Sistine Chapel, titled The Last Judgment, either with the original, which has deteriorated considerably, or with the reproductions in prints. When you really consider the composition of this work, which depicts the judgment of the world, what would you say that this image of the judgment of the world actually is, now that you have drawn closer to spiritual science? Earlier I said that anyone equipped with the full potential of spiritual science, who steps before the symbol of Christ lying in the grave on Good Friday and Easter Saturday, will see if he or she has progressed to the point of truly being able to see such things, a vision of the Jupiter human being arise before the soul. If you have not yet come to the point where you can see such things, but have achieved a felt understanding of spiritual science, you will nevertheless be able to arrive at a thought that is just as correct as the vision, if on a different level. This thought is especially relevant for this epoch. Painters equipped with all of the visual art of the present will allow the symbol of the mystery of Golgotha to work upon them and then seek to answer this question in their paintings. Quote, what will appear before me when I begin with the symbol of Christ Jesus lying in the grave? then cast my eye, E-Y-E, toward the interior life, still holding on to everything that I gained through my consideration of this other symbol? What will appear before me? Christ appears to me in all of the majesty that he will one day have on Jupiter, binding Araman in the underworld with bands of light, so that he cannot reach humanity and conquering Lucifer so that he cannot mislead human souls down his path. Close quote. All of this is commensurate with what the human being can gain through spiritual science. Everything that can appear before the human soul in our time was for earlier generation, which is to say for us in an earlier incarnation, clothed in the image of the Last Judgment, as Michelangelo painted it on the wall of the Sistine Chapel. This image is simply a prophetic forerunner. The true image is the one that I have just described to you. People who are taught only by a Christian feeling and not by spiritual science have seen only what can be understood through the mystery of Good Friday in the form of the Last Judgment as it was depicted in paintings. 
But we live in a time of transition, and the souls who are more advanced, even if they have not yet taken up spiritual science, can be the most conscious that we are living in a period of transition, a period about which we must say, quote, just as people once looked at the Last Supper as an expression of the Easter mystery, or rather of the mystery of Good Friday, human beings today have lost their understanding of this. But a new understanding must arise, one that is achieved through spiritual science as it has been described today as we celebrate the occasion of Christ's burial. Close quote. I have often spoken in this room about things that Hermann Grimm was able so beautifully to see. In his title, Life of Michelangelo, he spoke extensively about Michelangelo's last judgment in the Sistine Chapel. It was not, unlike other university-educated people, someone who tried to describe things, in quotes, objectively, and I say that in quotes, but rather he was someone whose soul, sensibility, and feelings were present throughout the process of researching. Therefore, Hermann Grimm wrote the following words at the end of his section about the Last Judgment in his life of Michelangelo. Quote, it is difficult, if not impossible, to speak about such things. Close quote. He meant the things that are connected with what the Last Judgment depicts for the human soul. In Michelangelo's age, it was not yet difficult to speak about such things, particularly in painting. Michelangelo did, in fact, speak about them through paintings. And those who were initiated in the mysteries of religion were able to speak about them. It has become difficult through the passing of time. Quote, it is difficult, if not impossible, to speak about such things. Our feelings about them lie in depths that the light cannot manage to penetrate. But we certainly would not presume to declare that the physical images given to us as holy bequests are merely shadows. Close quote. So he says that even in our current age, we should not presume to say that what Michelangelo thought of as real in the life of the human soul and depicted on the canvas is nothing but a fantasy. Deep and profound thinkers like Hermann Grimm do not presume to do so. Others, who are more like Ludwig Feuerbach or David Friedrich Strauss, are so bold as to say of Michelangelo's work that it is a heap of fantastic ideas, parenthesis, or, if they decide to say it more politely or in a more contemporary fashion, they say it is a fantasy, but they mean that it is a heap of fantastic ideas. Close parenthesis. Quote, We certainly would not presume to declare that the physical images given to us as holy bequests are merely shadows. But as the course of spiritual evolution has shown me, these imaginations must become ever more prosaic, and other things must come to take their place as the symbols of eternity. Close quote. He sees that something else must take their place, but he seeks in vain for this replacement in the cultural periods that are within his grasp, and I would say, that his ensuing words sound almost tragic, quote, For without symbols, whether they be visible images or thoughts, we cannot be settled. No matter how much we understand that all symbols are merely metaphors, empty for those who do not imbue them with content from their own souls. But since the Last Judgment stands on the wall of the Sistine Chapel, it is no longer a metaphor for us, but rather a monument of the fantastical soul life of a bygone period and of foreign people whose thoughts are no longer ours. Close quote. This is the confession of a soul speaking in all sincerity to itself, just as a mind must confess to itself when it is unable to simply remain at a prior state of existence. Quote, we can live now into the future, even if we have lost what the human soul saw and perceived in its consideration of the Good Friday mystery. Close quote. These are the words of a mind that senses that the old has passed and that looks into the present, the words of a mind that seeks in vain for something that can replace the old. 
such a mind as this in old age, passes through the gate of death with these thoughts, quote, Where, where, O soul, O human soul, which once immersed itself in the holiest secrets of world evolution by looking upon Christ lying in the grave? Where, O human soul, will you find what your thoughts and feelings about these secrets must become? Where, O human soul, will you find something that fills you in the same way when you gaze upon Christ in the grave, when you behold this mystery of Good Friday? Where, O human soul, will you find this? Close quote. With such thoughts, a mind like Hermann Grimm's passes through the gate of death. Now you will understand the meaning of what I said a few days ago in this room. There are souls who pass through the gate of death and take hold of a feeling, a wholly new feeling, for what the human being truly is, just as our friend Christian Morgenstern did, with a consciousness illuminated by spiritual science a clear consciousness of everything that had been lost to the human soul. Filled with a consciousness of the new teachings of Christ, he carried new thoughts about the Christ events and their connection with human evolution through the gate of death into the spiritual worlds. The souls who longed for these thoughts, the ones who were able to carry only incomplete thoughts of mere pictorial images of a prior age on their own journey through the gate of death, found in our friend Christian Morgenstern a contemporary who was truly illuminating. Superficial people believe that the human being who has passed through that gate then gazes upon all of these secrets. This is not the case. For just as we are prepared through the embryonic period for our life outside of our mother's body, so too do we prepare for the life between death and a new birth during this life, in a body on earth. And for those souls who pass through the gate of death without having taken up any thoughts about the mystery of Golgotha during their time in an earthly body, the revelator was the person who appeared and illuminated their soul with the full potential of the knowledge of the Christ. Let us fill ourselves reverently with such thoughts at this time of year. Let us take them up concretely as they appear before our souls in connection with this anthroposophical society. Let us take them up concretely and try to understand them ever more deeply during these days when the mysteries of Good Friday and Easter Saturday give us the power to do so. Let us make use of these holy and tragic days to allow ourselves to be moved by what this occasion can call up in our souls, the glowing depths of human existence as it has developed through its time on earth, but through the other heavenly bodies in which the earth shall be reincarnated. Let us attempt to allow Easter to be a sign, an image in the deepest sense, of all that connects the essence of the human soul, as well as our self-knowledge, with the eternal. The end of Lecture 11 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161 by Rudolf Steiner, 13 lectures, translated by Rory Bradley, entitled Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach, to knowing life in the world. This is Lecture 12, given in Dornach on May 1st, 1915. There has been one essential feature that has been a part of all the conversations that we have been having recently. This essential feature has been the expression of the fact that we can observe the necessity for a new impulse in human culture 
at this moment in evolution, that is, the impulse of spiritual knowledge. What these lectures should have demonstrated from a wide variety of vantage points is that a certain period of time has passed that had a particular character, and a new age must now begin. The age that has now passed was one characterized by the most intensely materialistic ways of thinking and feeling, one in which materialistic thinking and feeling gained ever more ground in the inner life of the human soul. But just as a pendulum that has swung all the way out to one side then has to swing back in the other direction toward the other side, so too we now stand at the beginning of an age in which the human soul must be seized by the sense that spiritual impulses and spiritual forces are hidden throughout the sensory and material world. And spiritual science is to carry forth the knowledge and experience of these spiritual forces that lie behind the sensory and material appearances and events. The spiritual forces that for centuries humanity has paid little attention to and taken little interest in. We all know that nowadays, if you assert that it is possible for the human soul to step into the spiritual worlds, you will be denigrated and called a heretic. We are aware that a wide variety of life factors, consciously or unconsciously, turn against the rise of a stream such as the spiritual scientific one. You might think that at this moment what spiritual science has to offer about the arrangement and regulation of life and its circumstances seems completely absurd, foolish and fantastical. But if you take a look at what certain individuals, I would say wiser individuals, have accomplished out of a basic life impulse, then the things spiritual science describes look altogether different. I would first like to draw your attention to the fact that wiser individuals of the present are not completely closed off to what spiritual science wants to accomplish. Even if they are closed off to spiritual science itself, they are not necessarily closed off to what spiritual science wants to achieve. There are many, many examples of this that could be offered. Today I want to offer a characteristic example related to a fairly significant philosopher of recent memory, the recently deceased Otto Liebmann. Most of you will not know the name Otto Liebmann, and that does not matter. But I would say that Otto Liebmann is one of the most perceptive dissectors of human thought life in the recent past. He made inroads from many angles into what might we might call the theory of cognition by consistently posing the question, quote, what can human thought comprehend of reality? Close quote. I would like to read for you a short passage from the philosophical writings of Otto Liebmann because it is characteristic of a man who spent his entire life really working to understand the basis of human thought and what the present moment might be able to say about it by uh, really building upon all of the scientific knowledge that had been gained. Otto Liebmann said that someone might hit upon the idea that within an egg there was not only egg white and yolk, but also an unseen spirit. This spirit would then materialize. And when it was finished materializing, it would break the eggshell with the tip of its beak, run over to the grains, and peck at them. At first, he says, it might occur to someone that a spirit was in the egg, and once the eggshell was cracked, the spirit would come out and pick at the grain. How would others respond? That is, those who were coming from a perspective that was trying to build a world view out of contemporary science. They would say, quote, if someone says that there is a spirit living inside of an egg, then that person is a fool. Close quote. 
That is what these clever folks would say now. It is precisely what they do to those who call themselves theosophists or anthroposophists. But what does the philosopher who has worked so hard to dissect human thought have to say? He says, quote, The only objection that one could raise to this claim is that the proposition in is nonsense because it is being used in a physical sense. In a metaphysical sense, it is entirely correct. It is entirely correct that we can do nothing with the imagination that a spirit is physically within the egg. But we understand it metaphysically. Then there can be no objection. It is simply an unusual use of the preposition. Close quote. So the fact is that this philosopher, who wrote two intelligent books titled Analysis der Wirklichkeit, Analysis of Reality, and titled Gedanken und Tatsache, Thought and Facts, wrote in the second volume of titled Natur Erkenntnis, Knowledge of Nature, a passage about this invisible spirit, in which he admits that one can stand at the apex of current philosophy and still cannot help but admit that an invisible spirit may indeed be hiding there within the egg. Of course, Otto Liebmann would never deign to see that there is anything reasonable about spiritual science. You might ask, why not? Why would he, or someone who thought like he did, turn toward spiritual science, take a good look at it, and realize that it essentially seeks to do nothing other than assert that in reality this invisible spirit is really there, within the egg. The names really do not matter. We would call it the etheric body, that is then replaced later by the astral body. The spiritual scientist also describes what is found within the egg as an invisible spirit. So the spiritual scientist would really say nothing different from the other man, that Liebmann describes. But it is not so easy to make the turn to spiritual science. It is berated as foolish and fantastical, despite the fact that its perspective is being energetically defended by those working on contemporary science and theories of cognition. Is it so different from saying that an invisible spirit is within the egg to claim that in the physical human body anatomy and physiology are the only concerns of the physical scientists, there is also something hidden and invisible. And if you want to get beyond using the preposition in, and this is indeed important to the philosopher, then you point to something spiritual science says, that this invisible spirit consists of the etheric body, the astral body, and the I, capital. It can be easily shown that spiritual science does not actually do anything that is not truly demanded by all the thinking and cultural processes of the present. Of course, the spiritual scientist needs to go somewhat farther because it cannot simply be satisfied with a vague sense that there is an invisible spirit in the egg, particularly when it comes to talking about human beings. In that case, we must be clear that the invisible components of the human being have certain characteristics and certain inner qualities of reality. When it comes to an egg, you can have a sort of spectral imagination of it. Quote, there is a spirit in there, close quote. But when you start talking about human beings, you must be clear that the human being develops consciousness while it resides within a human body and it develops consciousness precisely because the physical body is such a complicated apparatus. In this you get a sense that the invisible spirit referred to must count as something that lies at the very foundation of the visible. If the external body has consciousness, then it goes without saying that you must assume that the inner body has consciousness as well and that you cannot think of it as unconscious. Science would then ask us to see this 
supposition of spiritual science, in such a way as to say that within the physical body there is a spiritual human being. And the nature of this inner being's consciousness is precisely what spiritual science is directed at. We now know, and have known for a long time, what answer to give regarding the exact characteristics of this invisible spirit that underlies the human being. If we first take up the current philosophical perspectives, then we will again find ourselves admitting that an invisible spirit underlies the human being. Now, we ask ourselves, can we know something about this invisible spirit? Indeed, just as the human being gains knowledge of the external world through sense perceptions and through the thoughts that are connected with the brain, this knowledge of the invisible being can be taken further, for within that spirit live our imaginations and what we have here described as an imaginative knowledge. It is possible to see that an invisible spirit resides not only in the egg, rather the etheric body resides within the human being. This is written about already in my books. And when the etheric body is given the correct opportunity, it is possible for it to separate from the physical body and develop imaginative knowledge a knowledge that works in and on the imaginations of the world and that appears before the soul in the form of this moving imagination. Now the question must be posed. What is the real reason that spiritual science has so many opponents now, despite the fact that in essence these same people who do not even understand themselves arrive at and talk about the same things that spiritual science says? My dear friends, in regard to this, something must be said that is, shall we say, dangerous to say, or at the very least, it is not lacking in danger to say. Why would Otto Liebmann, if he had a spiritual scientific book in his hand, doubtless say something like, quote, This is too foolish for me, close quote, even though he himself would be standing before the gates of the spiritual world? Why did he live in this strange state of self-denial in which he stood before those gates? But when somebody came to him and tried to open them for him, he would say, quote, No, I am not going in. Close quote. Why? It is not particularly rational. Sometimes we can achieve something through comparisons, and so I would like to answer this question with a comparison. Why are there people among the best individuals of the present, who are so afraid of spiritual science. I would like to draw your attention to something that we have already spoken about, that is about what I said about sleep and fatigue. Currently people are talking a good bit about why human beings have to sleep, and people simply say that they must sleep because they are fatigued. In other words, Fatigue is seen as the cause for sleep. This is how many people are talking now. Now, everyone knows from everyday experience in life that fatigue is not the only cause for sleep. Let us say an independently wealthy man comes out of courtesy to some nice lecture, and often barely after the beginning of the lecture he immediately falls asleep, even though he is not tired. From this we all can conclude that fatigue is not the only cause for sleep. Quite the contrary, we would express the truth of the situation more properly if we did not say, quote, we sleep because we are fatigued, close quote, but rather said, quote, we feel fatigued because we want to go to sleep, close quote. That would be the more proper way of expressing it. The essence of sleeping is really that human beings, by separating the I and the astral body from the physical and etheric bodies, can then enjoy, or we might even say digest, the physical and etheric bodies from without. When human beings are fully within the physical and etheric bodies, 
then we live consciously in the external world. Pay close attention to what is being said here. If the eye and astral body are outside of the physical and etheric bodies, then we direct all of our will and desires toward the physical and etheric bodies, and we enjoy and digest them from without. When we are within the physical and etheric bodies, it is the external world that makes impressions on us. Now, everything in the world is based around the principle of periodicity, just like a pendulum. When the pendulum reaches a certain high point on one side, then it swings back down, and then it reaches the same height on the opposite side through the force of motion that it gained by swinging down. Just as the pendulum can go only so far before it has to go back and rise up to the other side, so too are sleeping and waking set at opposite poles from one another. This is perhaps the crudest way in which to explain it. Let us assume that during the period between waking and sleeping, we took an interest in the external world and what was happening in it. Doing so was like what happens when the pendulum swings out to one side. If we have engaged pleasurably with the external world, then we eventually become satiated with the external world and the normal need arises to enjoy ourselves, to engage with ourselves in the same pleasurable way with which we have just engaged with the world. We fall asleep. And once we have derived sufficient enjoyment of ourselves, then we can wake up again. This is a back-and-forth process, a periodicity that runs quite regularly, as a machine does in the external world. But Araman and Lucifer can take the human being out of this very natural process. And so, when a person goes to a lecture out of courtesy, and not because he really wants to listen, he can depart from it and redirect his interest. He departs and enjoys himself, because he finds himself more interesting than what is happening in the world around him. So you can see that the person who falls asleep at an abnormal time simply has no interest in his surroundings, in what is happening in the world around him. Nothing different is going on with the kinds of individuals I was just speaking of who gesture toward the things that spiritual science has to offer. When it comes to spiritual science, Otto Liebmann is like a man who goes to a concert or a lecture out of courtesy and then promptly falls asleep. He goes but does not actually want to take up what is being offered there. We can say the same thing in a more elevated style about men like Otto Liebmann. They come to philosophy, to the land of the spirit, through connections that exist in our world. They write a dissertation and a book and then are sent to be teachers at an upper school. They prove themselves to be good thinkers and are sent to the university. The whole philosophical endeavor is just a disguised form of worldly courtesy. It is courtesy. One need not feel inwardly called to the land of spirit. They go to the gates, they go in, and they fall asleep. Not immediately, like the independently wealthy man who is taken to a concert and falls asleep even if he is not tired. They fall asleep because there is a lack of interesting things to engage the object consciousness, and they cannot awaken into imaginative consciousness. If you are not able to awaken into imaginative consciousness, then you fall asleep the very moment that someone starts to talk about the spiritual world. In other words, it is just too difficult for people to take up spiritual science. And therefore, it is not altogether safe to say such things, because then people start saying to you, quote, Ah, so you are the ones who keep talking about things that are so difficult and onerous for other people, for other important people. Close quote. But the fact that we are aware of the difficulty does not exactly make us proud or haughty, we do know, however, that what we have to take up together 
will be railed against by the world because people do not want to engage with such complicated things precisely because those things are too difficult for them. Let us now take a closer look at the difficulties that present themselves. We will start to get at them by asking the question, what comprises the normal thought process for human beings between waking and sleeping? What makes it up? Now, a crudely materialistic thinker will tell you that thinking happens because the human being has a brain with an incredibly intricate structure, that processes happen within this brain, and that a thought arises because these processes are happening. Thinking is a result of brain processes, he will tell you. I have already drawn your attention to the fact that saying this is equivalent to saying, quote, I crossed the street. There are footprints and tire tracks there. Where did these tire tracks come from? Well, the earth below must have made them. The earth itself created those footprints and tire tracks, close quote. The person who thinks the brain itself is able to produce such thoughts is working on the same logical level. It is exactly the same thing as a person walking across the street, seeing all sorts of tracks and saying, quote, Aha! This must be the earth's doing, the earth which is filled with all sorts of intricate forces that then produce these tracks. Close quote. This is the same thing as having a physiologist come forward and look at the human brain and see the many processes happening there and say, quote, All of that is the product of the brain. Close quote. The tracks that crisscross the surface of the earth are not created by the earth itself, but rather by the people and the cars that move across its surface. And neither are the processes that the anatomist and physiologist have discovered created by the brain, but rather by the forces that move within the etheric body. Here we arrive at the fallacy of of materialism. There is nothing in daily life that does not make an impression upon the brain. Just as every step makes an impression on the earth, and just as you could prove that every one of your steps makes an impression on the earth, so too could you prove that everything that is wished and thought makes an impression and has an effect upon the brain. But this is only the footprint, as it were, that is left behind by the thought itself. The thought actually comes from the etheric body, and in reality everything that you experience as thought is nothing other than the inner activity of the etheric body. For as long as we are in our physical bodies, we need the physical body for thinking. And this is why it is actually very easy to see why materialists do not arrive at the truth. The materialist says, for God's, quote, for God's sake, there you admit that you have to have a brain or otherwise you cannot think. And so you must also see that the brain actually does the thinking. Close quote. But this conclusion is only as clever as it would be to say the following, quote, I can prove to you that the print you see on the ground there was made by the ground itself. I will remove a section of the ground, and then you will see that you cannot go anywhere without it. Close quote. The ground is necessary. In the same way it is necessary that we have a brain, so that we can think while we are within our physical bodies. It is necessary to become clear about these things, because it is how we learn to recognize the falsehoods under which the thinking of the present suffers. To recognize the full sum of incorrect things with which our thinking misleads itself. And also to recognize that we must heal these problems by engaging with that complicated form of knowing that does not take the physical body into consideration. When we move in our physical bodies, we must have a ground beneath our feet. When we think in the physical world, we must have some sort of counterpoint as a kind of ground for this thinking, namely the nervous system. 
But if we are able to shift the work of thinking back into our astral bodies, then our etheric bodies will become for our astral bodies what our physical bodies are when we think in the etheric body. If we move into imaginative thinking, then we are thinking with the astral body, and the etheric body then contains the footprints or traces, just as the physical body contains the footprints or traces of thinking when it is carried out in the etheric body. And once we are outside of the physical body, after death, and have also cast off our etheric bodies, as I have often described to you in the past, then our counterpoint is the external etheric life force. Then we are inscribing into the actual cosmos what the astral body and later the eye will develop. This is the process that we undergo during what is called the first stage of initiation. This process is the one in which we shift our thinking, parenthesis, it is not thinking anymore, but the activity of thought is retained, close parenthesis, from the etheric body back into the astral body. We give over the task of keeping the footprints or traces of this thought activity, which had previously been held by the physical body, to the etheric body. This is the essence of the first step of initiation. The shift of the activity previously carried out by the etheric body onto the astral body. Thus we see that when we are living in imaginative knowledge, we pull back to a certain extent from the physical body and retreat to the etheric body, thereby leaving no further traces upon the physical body. And so it happens that, for those who have undergone the first stage of initiation, this physical body from which they have retreated becomes objective, since it now exists for them external to their astral body and eye. Before, they existed solely within that physical body. Now, it exists external to them. They think, feel, and will totally in the astral body. They influence the etheric body and leave traces there. But they no longer influence the physical body and see it now as something external. This is generally the normal course of the first stage of initiation. It expresses itself somewhat differently in each person's subjective experience. Now, I would like to use a sort of schematic drawing to make this first stage of initiation clear to you, and there's a drawing. Let us say that this is the human head, and then we have the etheric body surrounding that head. When the human being begins to develop in the way I have just described, then the etheric body grows like this. And the thing to note here is that this parallels the occurrence that we call the blooming of the lotus flower, excuse me, of the lotus blossom. The human being grows etherically, as it were, out of itself. And the thing to note here is that by growing etherically out of itself, the human being also develops something outside of the body that we might call a kind of etheric heart. As physical human beings, we have a physical heart. We all know how to evaluate the difference between a dry, abstract man who thinks like a real machine and a one who really has his heart in everything he does and experiences, meaning, of course, the physical heart. We can all tell the difference between such people. We do not expect that the dry, skulking person who does not really have his heart in anything that he does or experiences has much real knowledge about the physical plane. In parallel to the experiences that I described in titled How to Know Higher Worlds, a kind of spiritual heart external to the physical body takes form, 
just as the circulatory system forms in the body with the heart at its center. This network stretches outside the body, and then we start to feel connected in a heartfelt way with everything that we learn to know and recognize through spiritual science. We simply must not demand that a person have the heart within the body in something related to spiritual science. Instead, the person must be in it with the heart that exists outside of the body, with that heart really come to spiritual knowledge fully. When you read through a piece of spiritual scientific writing, it is certainly possible to say, quote, this is all just dry, it is science. I really have to study and learn this. I already have to study and learn enough in my life, and now I have to study everything spiritual science says as well. There is no heart in that. Close quote. You will find the heart in it if you simply immerse yourself in the material deeply enough. To be sure, many people say, quote, Ah, theosophy must simply be nothing more than saying that people need to become one with the world through the eye. Close quote. Becoming one, developing the God within the individual and discovering the divine eye are popular phrases well loved by those who want to be theosophists or who want to know something about theosophy. All of this comes from the fact that people do not want to get involved in developing a warmth of heart even after they are no longer supported by the life warmth of the physical heart. Lichtenberg said, quote, When a head and a book collide and there is a hollow sound, the book is not to blame. Close quote. We could also say that when a person encounters spiritual science and finds no warmth of heart in it, spiritual science is not to blame. Everything that I have described as the normal path to clairvoyance consists in the human beings lifting the etheric body and, and indeed all of the other higher aspects of the organism out of the physical body and developing a heart external to the physical body. So, what about normal everyday thinking? You see, an everyday thought is developed within the etheric body but then it encounters the physical body and makes impressions all over the brain. If you want to bring your before your soul the essence of everyday thinking, you could say that in everyday thinking you think in the etheric body and the thoughts fall onto the nervous system of the brain where they make impressions. But these impressions do not go deep and they echo back. And this is how thinking is reflected. And in this reflection, it becomes conscious. So thinking is really a process in which we have a thought already in our souls on the level of the etheric body. It makes an impression on the physical brain, but cannot penetrate it and has to come back. This returning thought is what we then perceive. And this is where the physiologists come in and show us the footprints and traces left by the thought on the physical brain. What would happen if this thought were not to return, but rather go into the brain and generate processes there? If it did not return, then we would not perceive it. It would simply move into the brain and initiate processes. It is possible to imagine that the thought might not return, but would instead remain in the brain. Then we would have no consciousness, for consciousness comes about only in the moment when the thought is reflected back. But there is an activity of the soul that goes into the physical body in this way, the will. The will is differentiated from thinking in that thinking is reflected by the physical organism and then its reflection is perceived, but the will is not. In the case of the will, it moves into the physical organism and then calls up a physical process there.
This results in our moving our hands or something like that. The will comes about very differently than the thought. The thought comes about precisely because it is reflected. The will, on the other hand, moves into the physical organism and is not reflected. Rather, it initiates certain processes within the physical organism. Now, in another part of our bodily organism, it is possible that something like this, which is actually moved into the body, nevertheless is returned. Follow carefully what I am about to say. In using our brains to think, things proceed so that the thought activity begins in the etheric brain, is bounced onto the physical nervous system, and thereby comes to the level of consciousness. When we move into clairvoyance, we push thinking back a little bit. We think with the astral body, and the thought is thrown back by the etheric body. Here, and there's a drawing, uh, number one on the left, is the external world, and here is the physical body, in the case of thinking with the brain. Here, in the case of a clairvoyant individual, is the external world, which we then work upon with the astral body, see drawing two on the right side. The etheric body throws back what the astral body generates, and the physical body is excluded from the whole process. Here, referring to drawing one, when we will something, the soul activity moves fully into the physical body. When we move or shift a hand, it is the soul that does this. But its activity must bring about inner organic material processes, and in these processes the soul activity is brought to completion. I would like to say it this way. In the case of the will, the soul activity expires in the material activity of the body. Now, ask yourself, quote, how do we actually live when we live in our thinking? Close quote. In our thinking, we live very near to the boundary of eternity. In the moment that we exclude the physical body and allow our thoughts to be reflected by the etheric body, we are living within everything that we carry with us through the gate of death. On the other hand, for as long as we allow our thoughts to be reflected by the physical body, we are living in what we have between birth and death. But when we will something, our will belongs completely to the physical body. Our physical body is there to complete the activity of our will. Whereas thinking stands right before the gates of eternity, the will is intended solely for the physical body. Remember what I said in one of the earlier lectures. The will is an infant, and when it gets older, it becomes thinking. This accords with what we might say today from another vantage point. The will is bound up in temporality, and only by having the human being continue to evolve and become wiser and wiser, filling the will ever more with thinking, shall what is born into the will be elevated out of temporality and into the eternal, freed from the body. But in a part of the body, something else is active. The underlying nervous system, the system of ganglia, the nervous system of the stomach, the solar plexus is often counted as a part of this same system. As it currently develops within the human being, this nervous system is an incomplete organ. It is present only in its very first initial form. Later it will develop further. But just as we know that a child is able to develop some of the characteristics that can also be developed as an adult, 
so too can we know that this nervous system, which currently serves to attend to organic activity, will also develop further. This nervous system, which runs in conjunction with the actual brain and spinal column, and nearly all of the nerves that extend into the various limbs, this nervous system in the torso and stomach is not yet so developed as to be able to do the things that it will be able to do once we are living on Jupiter. There the brain and spinal cord will have regressed somewhat, and the nervous system of the torso and stomach will have a completely different formation than it currently has. At that point, it will extend across the surface of the human being. For everything that is at first within the human being will later be laid across the surface. As a result, for everyday life between birth and death, we do not make direct use of this nervous system, but rather allow it to remain in the unconscious. But then it can happen under abnormal circumstances that what lies in the will and the appetitive faculty goes into the human organism and then, again under abnormal conditions that we will discuss, gets thrown back from the stomach nervous system, just as the thought is thrown back by the brain. The will moves into the ganglia system, but then, instead of turning into activity, it gets thrown back by the ganglia and something happens within the human being that normally only happens in the brain. A process begins that can be described as follows. When you look at the transition from our normal waking consciousness to a state of clairvoyance, you can see how, in the normal nervous system, our thoughts, feelings and will are reflected. The feelings and will only in so far as they are thoughts. But otherwise, the things that are a part of the will are allowed to move completely in to the physical organism. But in the state of clairvoyance, we also develop, outside of the physical body, as it were, a higher form of organ as a kind of counterpart to the brain. Just as the everyday brain is connected with the physical heart, so too is the thinking organ that develops outside in the astral body connected with the etheric heart. This is a higher form of clairvoyance, head clairvoyance. But a human being can also go in the other direction. You can move into the organization with what exists with that, in quotes, infant will in such a way that the will becomes thinking, even though one normally goes from thinking to will. This is the deeper foundation for what I mentioned some time ago as the difference between head clairvoyance and stomach clairvoyance. In head clairvoyance, a new etheric organ is formed through which one becomes independent of the physical organism. In stomach clairvoyance, you call upon the ganglia system to something that is normally unseen and unconsidered. This is why the experiences of stomach clairvoyance are more fleeting than our normal experiences when waking. They have no meaning for the soul after it is moved through the gate of death. Everything that is gained through head clairvoyance has a lasting spiritual significance, even for the soul after it has moved through the gate of death. Indeed, it has more significance than one's experiences in daily waking life. The things that are gained through stomach clairvoyance have even less significance than the knowledge of everyday waking life for the life after death. That somnambulant clairvoyance has a lower, not higher position than waking everyday consciousness. This is not to say that all sorts of poetic and other characteristics cannot be developed through stomach clairvoyance, because in the moment that stomach clairvoyance begins, it is really the ganglia and not the will that are inserted into the physical body. As a result, the activity of the etheric body is held up in the ganglia, 
and then streams back. And you become aware of things that you cannot become aware of through your brain. You can perceive thoughts that cannot be perceived through the brain. But there is still a subordinate activity at work. So you see, we can make a sharp distinction between head and stomach clairvoyance. Now you might ask, quote, how can I tell whether I am developing stomach or head clairvoyance? Close quote. I can only tell you that head clairvoyance will develop only when we seek it through the ways in which it comes to us through meditation and concentration and when we fully develop everything that we receive on the paths of meditation and concentration. Stomach clairvoyance does not come about through meditation and concentration. Stomach clairvoyance happens when we perceive the ganglia system, and this happens only because of certain abnormal conditions that arise in life. It is more comfortable to be someone with stomach clairvoyance because in a certain sense it happens automatically, whereas head clairvoyance must be earned through great effort. This is why it is best not to say when clairvoyance seems to arise automatically that those who have this gift that they have not worked for but must be graced by God. It is actually best to be somewhat skeptical in these situations. It is possible to show a number of examples of ways in which stomach clairvoyance can come about. The only way that head clairvoyance can come about is that those who work regularly and diligently through meditation and concentration bring themselves to a certain stage of an initiation process. In regard to stomach clairvoyance, I would like to present one of the most harmless ways in which one can become a stomach clairvoyant, for it is not exactly safe to speak about such things. Let us assume that a man grows up under conditions that lead him to develop an early desire to become a, in quotes, great man in the external physical world, like these privy counselors, civil servants, and heads of state that are out there. In other words, let us assume that he develops early on the desire to become a privy counselor or hold some other position in the administration. Having such a desire means that one is ambitious. This ambition lives in his desires. It can really burn there, quite terribly, in fact. The person becomes clear with himself, quote, you will become a privy counselor, close quote, but His desire burns him, and he goes through the world with this burning desire, and he grows up with it. And so it happens that his desire does not always move regularly into the physical organization. Something is disrupted. If that man were to become a privy counselor, then he would not become a stomach clairvoyant. If he wants to become a privy counselor but does not become one, and moves through the world with this burning desire which eats at him and eats at him, then he can become a stomach clairvoyant. But this desire must be very strong. Since there is no one here among us who wants to become a privy counselor, I am safe I am safely saying all of this. Oh, excuse me, I can safely say all of this. When this desire eats away at someone, it sticks in the physical organism and the ganglia system will start to throw back these desires. And it is possible that the person becomes a stomach clairvoyant through these reflected desires. Then, perhaps, for example, the man lives at, in Berlin at 25 Schönhauser Allee and his neighbor who lives at 23 Schönhauser Allee actually becomes a privy counselor. It is possible that he might perceive this event through a particularly well-formed stomach clairvoyance. This has to do with the fact that his ganglia system becomes particularly sensitive by the internalized desire to become a privy counselor. And if the other man becomes something else in a similar vein, then he might be able to develop a very sensitive and intense clairvoyance for such things as well. 
This kind of clairvoyance normally develops in regard to something in particular. Since you know that there are other desires in life than the somewhat harmless ones that I just mentioned, you can see how these other desires would lead to different forms and particularities for this kind of clairvoyance. They flow into the physical organism because they remain, because they remained unfulfilled in life, even though they continue to exist. And so you see the kinds of desires that lead to the incitement of stomach clairvoyance. It is always incited by desires, even if the person, excuse me, even if the people who have it do not always recognize it. In the burning desires that are reflected, events are also reflected that can then be perceived by the etheric body. Now you can more clearly see the differentiation between head and stomach clairvoyance. We need this because it is connected with what I will be talking about in more detail tomorrow. The end of Lecture 12. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 161, by Rudolf Steiner, translated by Rory Bradley. Thirteen lectures, uh, entitled Artistic Sensitivity, as a spiritual approach to knowing life and the world. And this is the last lecture, lecture 13, given in Dornach on May 2nd, 1915. Yesterday I drew your attention to the way in which the human being can leave the physical body with the higher parts of its organism, with the etheric body, the astral body, and the eye, and also to the fact that once we have left the physical body, we can undergo the first stages of initiation. Once we have done this, we come to the realization that what we call the spiritual activity of the human being begins not just once the human being enters into initiation, rather it is always present already in everyday life. We need it especially to emphasize that the activity by which our thoughts come to consciousness is actually carried out in the etheric body, and that this activity, which lies at the foundation of thinking and is carried out in the etheric body, is only then brought to consciousness through its reflection in the physical body. But it is carried out in the soul's spiritual element, The human being who is standing in the world and just thinking, truly thinking, is actually performing a spiritual activity. We could say that this activity simply does not come into our consciousness as a spiritual activity. When we stand before a mirror, we are not conscious of a face, but rather of the reflection of the image of a face in the mirror. So, too, are we not conscious of thinking in everyday life, but rather of the mirror image, the image of the thought reflected by the physical body. In the case of the will, things are different. So, let us think about this carefully. Everything expressed in thought is an activity that does not happen within the physical body, but rather entirely outside of it. It is an activity that is simply reflected by the physical organism. Let us consider the fact that we as human beings are actually always completely within the soul spiritual element. If we wanted to depict it schematically, we could do it as follows. And there's a picture. If this, A, depicts the physical being of a human, then thinking happens entirely outside of this physical part, and what we perceive as thoughts is reflected by it. So, in our thinking, we are always outside the physical body, 
and the spiritual knowledge of this really consists in nothing more than seeing that we are completely outside of the physical body in the process of thinking. Something is different is true of will activity. Will activity really penetrates into the physical organism. What we call will activity goes completely into the physical body and generates processes there. And the result of these processes is what produces willed movement in human beings. So we can say that for as long as we, as human beings, are within the physical world, the basic energy of the will flows out of the spiritual element and into our physical organism, where it initiates certain processes that are completely contained within our skin. Between birth and death we are filled by will forces, whereas thinking does not happen within our physical organism, but rather outside of it. From this we can conclude that everything related to the will is intimately connected with the human being's existence in a physical organism between birth and death. The will truly is connected in a very inner way with us, and all of the expressions of the will are tied up with our physical organism for as long as we live between birth and death. As a result, thinking really has a kind of liberated and independent character that separates it from the human being in a way that never happens with the will. Try for a moment to really think about the great difference that exists between thinking and everything that belongs to the will. Spiritual science is the proper tool for casting these intensive spotlights on certain riddles in life. Is it not the case that everything we can recognize through spiritual science basically just leads to the formation of questions that must indeed be answered? Think about this for a moment. Let us say that someone goes to a lawyer with some sort of case. The lawyer hears about the matter and he takes the issue to court on behalf of the client. The lawyer will look for every possible clever rationale and will be as clever as he can possibly be in order to win the case for his client. He will make use of every ounce of reasoning and understanding that he possesses in order to win the case. What would have happened, believe me, life will give you clues about this, if the opponent had managed to beat out the other man and had gotten to this same lawyer first? This hypothetical situation probably happens a good bit. The lawyer would have heard the opponent's side of the story and then gone to court with every bit of his cleverness and reason to defend that client's case, to defend it with pieces of evidence intended to do in the other person. I do not believe that anyone is inclined to deny that such a hypothetical situation might actually occur. But what does this hypothetical situation prove to us? It shows us how little the human being is really connected to his reasoning and his understanding with his thinking powers, because he is able to put them as easily at the service of one man as he could put them at the service of another. Now compare how different this is when it is a matter of the will, when the person is engaged with his feelings and desires in a situation. Try to think clearly about whether a person who came to something out of his will would be capable of the same thing in a similar situation. On the contrary, we would say that he is not quite right in the head if he were capable of the same thing. A person is intimately connected with the will, very intimately connected indeed because the will flows into the physical organism and directly causes processes in the physical organism that are a part of the makeup of our personalities. So we can say that spiritual science 
is capable of illuminating precisely those facts of life that appear so mysterious and riddle-like to our soul, if we simply sit and think about life. Spiritual science will continue to enlighten humanity about what happens in everyday life, because everything that happens is dependent on supra-sensory causes. The most everyday things that occur are just as dependent upon the suprasensory and can be recognized only when we turn our gaze toward that suprasensory realm. But now, let us consider the instance in which the human being passes through the gate of death with the soul. Here we have to ask, quote, what happens to the thinking forces and the will forces? Close quote. After death enters in, the thinking forces of such an organism cannot be reflected according to the same process that we otherwise use during the time between birth and death. The most significant thing to know is that this organism casts off everything that exists for us contained within the surface layer of our skin. So the thinking forces cannot be sent back by that physical organism. But the thing that initiated inner processes within that physical organism also goes away after one has passed through the gate of death, because that physical organism is simply no longer there. But the thinking forces remain, just as we continue to exist during moments when we can no longer see ourselves after we have stepped away from the mirror. During the period of time when we stand in front of the mirror, our face is reflected to us. If we were to step away sooner, then our reflection would also cease sooner. The thinking forces are reflected for as long as we remain alive in the physical organism, but they continue to exist even after we have left the physical organism behind. So, what enters in then? Thinking forces cannot be perceived in and for themselves, just as the I, E-Y-E, cannot see itself, so too is thinking unable to perceive itself. It must be reflected by something. The physical organism is no longer present. So how will the thinking forces, which is to say what they generate, be reflected if we have set aside our physical organism? Here something enters in that is not exactly native to current human understanding, but that we must understand if we truly want to grasp a life between death and a new birth. You can grasp this through the teachings of initiation. In initiation knowledge, even during life within the physical organism, the human being does not recognize itself through its reflection in the body but rather through a reflection outside of the physical body by leaving the body behind and recognizing itself without it, shutting out the mirror of the physical body altogether. If you develop such knowledge in yourself, you will see how the thinking forces can come to consciousness outside of the physical body. They come to consciousness by having later thoughts reflected by prior ones. So pay close attention to this. When you are initiated and you leave your body, you do not perceive your thoughts by having them reflected by your physical body. Rather, you perceive them by having the thinking forces that you are currently sending out sent back to you by something that you previously thought. So you have to imagine that things you thought previously reflect the forces that are unfolding through thinking when that unfolding happens outside of the physical body. I could put it a bit more precisely. Let us assume that someone moves now into the state of initiation. How can that person then perceive something of his or her thinking forces in this state of initiation? The initiate sends out these thought forces and they encounter something that was thought the day before. Those thoughts 
from yesterday are written in the general world chronicle that you know as the Akashic Record. And the things that today's thinking process generate are reflected in those previous day's thoughts. From this you can see that one is completely right to strive to make one's thoughts as strong as possible, so that future thoughts might be properly reflected in the thoughts from the day before. This is accomplished through intense concentration and various forms of meditation, as we have already described in various lectures about the knowledge of higher worlds. In this way, the thought, which is normally fleeting, become so condensed and concentrated within you that you will then be in a position later on to have your thinking forces reflected in these earlier concentrated thoughts. And this is also how consciousness is generated after death. Everything that you as a human being have experienced between birth and death is written spiritually into the great chronicle of time. And just as we cannot hear without our ears in the physical world, so too are we unable to perceive anything after death without the fact that our life and everything that we experienced between birth and death is written there into the world. This becomes the reflecting apparatus. I already drew your attention to this fact in my last cycle of lectures in Vienna. Our life itself, which we lead here between birth and death, becomes the sensory organ for the higher world. You do not see your eye, E-Y-E, or hear your ear, but you do see through your eye and hear through your ear. If you want to perceive something with your eye, then you have to do so by way of external science. The same is true of the ear. The forces that you develop between death and a new birth are designed always to stream back toward the life that you have just lived on earth and to be reflected by it, to be perceived by the human beings who are living then between death and a new birth. From this, you can see why it is nonsensical to speak about earthly life as though it were some sort of punishment or otherwise something superfluous in relation to the whole life that human beings live. It is absolutely necessary in order to be able to perceive things, to have a kind of eyes and ears for the life between death and a new birth. We must be placed into these lives on earth because these lives will become the sensory organs that we need in the spiritual world during the life after death. The only difficulty that presents itself When imagining this is that when you think about a sensory organ, you tend to imagine something in space. But as soon as you move through the gate of death or into the realm of initiation, space ceases. Space has meaning only for the sensory world. What we are stepping into here is time. And just as we need spatial ears and spatial eyes here on earth, we need temporal processes there. These are the very processes that are carried out between birth and death that send back the capacities that we develop after death. During our lives, between birth and death, everything lies before us, perceptible in space. After death, everything happens for us in time, whereas before, everything was always perceptible in space. The particularly difficult thing when speaking about matters of spiritual science is that as soon as we turn our gaze toward the spiritual world, we have to unlearn the whole perspective that we have developed here for our spatial existence. We have to forget about that perspective and learn to recognize that space does not exist anymore and everything exists only in time. As a result, even the organs that we develop are temporal processes. If you want to orient yourself to the conditions of spiritual life, you not only have to learn something different, you also have to completely turn yourself about, remodel yourself, readjust your life, 
so that you gain a whole new way of imagining things. And this is the most difficult part, which I alluded to yesterday, and which causes so many to shy away, even if they have a very smart-minded philosophy about the physical plane of existence. People cling to their imaginations of space and cannot reorient themselves to the imaginations of a life that plays out solely in time. I am well aware that there may be some souls who say to themselves, quote, but when I imagine my way into the spiritual world, I simply cannot imagine that this spiritual world has no spatial extension. Close quote. This is certainly true. But it is far more important than anything else for us to make the effort to move away from the kind of imaginations that we use for the physical plane if we hope to move into the spiritual worlds. If we imagine all of the higher worlds only according to the model and standards of the physical spatial world, then we really cannot gain any true thoughts about the higher worlds, apart from some fantastical pictorial thoughts. The same is true in the case of thinking. Thinking continues after death in such a way that it is reflected in what we have experienced, in what we were in our physical existence between birth and death. These processes that we lived through become, in a sense, our eyes and our ears after death. Try to bring yourself closer to the meaning of the following sentence through meditation. Your life between birth and death will be employed as your eyes and ears. It will provide you with the organs that you will carry between death and a new birth. But what happens to the will forces? The will forces create life processes within us that lie within the boundaries of the body. They bring about life processes within us. The body is no longer there once the human being has stepped through the gate of death. But all of the spiritual surroundings are there. Just as the will worked its forces into the physical organism, so too it continues to stream out of the human being after death. It spreads itself out into its surroundings. This is the opposite of what happened in physical life, when the will worked its way more deeply into the human being. You will gain an imagination of this outward streaming motion of the will into its surroundings when you contemplate the things that you have to gain through meditation about the inner culture of the will if you want to progress in the area of spiritual knowledge. If you want to content yourself simply with understanding the world with your senses, then you will look around and see something blue, a blue surface or maybe a yellow one. If you want to remain fully in the physical world, then this will be enough for you. We have spoken about this before. When you really want to have an artistic worldview, you have to get beyond this purely sensory understanding. For example, we need to experience blue as though our will, the forces of our heart-mind, were let loose into space itself, and as though the thing that streams toward us as blue could then stream back out into space like a moment in which we experience devotion, as though we could actually pour ourselves out into space. Then the actual essence of blue streams in and flows outward again. But then, over there, where we encounter yellow, the will does not penetrate into it. It, push, it is pushed back. There we feel that the will forces are not able to penetrate and are actually pushed back against themselves. If you really want to prepare yourself to develop the soul forces that will lead you into the spiritual world, you must connect what I have just said with something real in your soul. You have to establish some sort of genuine connection with the fact 
for example, that when you see a blue surface, you can say to yourself, quote, that blue is welcoming to me. It allows my soul to move together with it for a great distance. But this surface, which is yellow, pushes me back. In that case, my soul forces come back into my soul like the jab of a needle. Close quote. But something similar could be said of anything that you perceive. Everything has this sort of nuance. The soul forces of the will are poured into the world and then can either be pushed back by that world or sink into it. You can develop this by schooling your soul forces with colors and other impressions of the physical world. You will find the details of this described in my book titled How to Know Higher Worlds. Once you have developed this, once you know how it feels when your soul forces become blue, parenthesis, two in quotes become blue is the same thing as saying that they are sympathetically taken up, becoming yellow is the same thing as saying that they are pushed back, in a way identical with antipathy, close parenthesis. Then you have these forces within you. Let us say that you have experienced the soul nuance of being taken up sympathetically by something. And now you no longer encounter that something as a purely physical being. Rather, you encounter a spiritual being. And it might be the case that you and this other being experience that same sympathy and the soul forces that you have developed flow into it in the same way. This is how we perceive the beings of the upper hierarchies and the elemental world. I would like to give you just one example, one that should not be taken as crude, but rather as entirely objective. You can develop forces not only in relation to your sense of color, you can also develop all sorts of soul forces. Just think of making an effort to feel self-knowledge, about how it is really taken up in the soul when one does something quite foolish. In everyday life we simply pass over such feelings, we do not become conscious of them. But if you really want to develop your soul, you must have a feeling for the inner experience of doing something really dumb or foolish. And you will notice that when you do something foolish, soul forces of the will stream outward and can be thrown back at you by something. But they are thrown back in such a way that when we perceive the reflections, we mock and ridicule ourselves. This is an actual experience. If you pay attention to what happens when you do something dumb, you will feel ridiculed and mocked. And now you can develop the feeling of what it is like to be mocked by the spiritual world. Then if you go to a place where there are the kinds of nature spirits that we call gnomes, you will have the power to perceive them. You gain this power only by developing the feeling that I have just described. The gnomes behave in such a way that they are always mocking, making all sorts of gestures and grimaces, laughing at you and so on. But you can perceive this only when you observe yourself in moments of feeling foolish. It is a matter of gaining intimate powers through these exercises of immersing ourselves in our surroundings with our will then our surroundings will come alive and be truly living. So we can say that while our life between birth and death becomes an organ of perception in the spiritual organism that we inhabit between death and a new birth, our will becomes a participant in the spiritual surroundings that envelop us. We can see how the will streams outward both in initiates and in those who have died, for example, in the seeing of gnomes. And if you see gnomes, this is as, this is as an example of the elemental world. Now, think about the fact that there was a philosopher in the second half of the 19th century who made a big impression on many people, Schopenhauer. As you know, he had a big influence on Nietzsche and on Richard Wagner. Schopenhauer traced the origins of the world, as others have done, to other origins, to what he called will and representation. 
He said that will and representation are what lie at the foundation of the world. But then, influenced by the Kantian way of thinking, he went on to say that representation is always nothing but a dream image, and that you can never penetrate through that image to reality. The only way to get through to reality is through the will. The will leads us to the reality of the thing. Schopenhauer went on to philosophize in an impressive manner about representation and will. He is always on firm ground, so to speak. But he is also one of those people that I described as walking up to the gates, but then remaining outside of them, not going inside. If you actually take him at his word, then the world is merely a representation, and it is also merely a dream image. And you can then refrain from trying to recognize the world in the representation, but still recognize the representations themselves for what they are and do something with them in their own soul, in your own soul. In other words, meditate upon them, concentrate on them. If Schopenhauer had gone one step further, he would have said, quote, I must dispense with the representation. If it is merely a product of my inner life, then I have to make use of it internally. Close quote. If Schopenhauer had taken this step, then he would have been led to further cultivate the representation by reworking it through meditation and concentration. And when he said that the world is will, indeed, when he started to describe the will in the natural world, parenthesis, as he did in the brilliant treatise titled On the Will in Nature, close parenthesis, he did not take his own statement seriously. When he described the will, he made use of the representation as an aid, and this denies all of the power of knowledge. This is the kind of foolish idea that is the equivalent of grabbing yourself by the hair to pull yourself out of the swamp. What would he have had to do if he were going to take his statement, quote, the world is will, close quote, seriously? He would have had to say, quote, all right, So that means you have to pour your will out into the world. You have to use your will in order to slip into the things themselves. You have to immerse yourself in the world and send your will out into the world so that you experience the color blue, not merely as a representation, but rather attempt to feel how the will immerses itself in it. You need to experience your own dumbness, not merely as a representation, but rather experience it in such a way that you can take up the things that can be experienced in this process of doing something foolish. Close quote. You see again that it is possible to arrive at a spiritual aperçu, an aperçu that leads only to be that needs only to be taken up seriously. Readers aside, the word is A-P-E-R-C with a little mark underneath the C-U. A-P-E-R-C-U. And the readers aside, Apalsu. If Schopenhauer had gone on, then he would have said, quote, if the representation is really just a represented image, then we have to work with it internally. If the will is truly in things, then we have to immerse our will in the things and not merely describe how the will lies in things. Here again you see an example of how a significant philosopher of the 19th century led us right up to the gates of initiation and then did everything in his power to close and lock those gates. Whenever you really take up life, You will see signs everywhere that the time is ripe to pluck the fruits of spiritual science. We need only to take these matters very seriously. Above all, we must learn to take people at their word, for spiritual science is not at all destined to defend its own correctness. The others, that is, its opponents, do this more than anyone else. But they are not aware that they do it. They have not an inkling of that fact. 
Let us take a certain sort of person who was very commonly found in the 19th century, an atomic materialist, one of those people who believed that at the basis of all the appearances of life lay the movements of atoms, who thought that behind the visible and audible world was a world of atoms in motion, and that these motions incited processes that we perceive as the sensible world. There is nothing spiritual in the world. The spirit is simply a product of atoms in motion. The processes and effects of atoms are all there is. So where did this idea of swirling atoms come from? Did somebody see them? Did somebody discover them through an actual experience of them? If that were true, then the atoms would not actually be the very thing that they are supposed to be, something that exists behind the experience of the world. If they have a reality, how are we supposed to find them? Let us assume that these atoms in motion do exist. Our reasoning cannot parse them out from the sense perceptions that we have. What would human beings need in order to be able to speak about this world of atoms? They would need to have clairvoyance. The whole world of atoms must be a product of inner vision of clairvoyance. And we could simply turn to the materialists of the 19th century and say, quote, We do not need to prove that clairvoyance exists because you must either stop propagating your theories or admit that you are clairvoyance who are able to perceive these things, at least to the extent that you are able to perceive the atoms that move behind the sensory world. For it makes no sense to speak of the materialist world of atoms if the powers of clairvoyance do not exist. If you think it is necessarily the case that there must be a moving world of atoms behind the sensory world, then you are proving to us that clairvoyance exists. Close quote. This is what it means to take people seriously, even when they themselves do not take the things they say seriously. If you take Schopenhauer seriously, then you would conclude, quote, If you say that the world is will and that our representations are nothing more than images, then you have to submerge yourself in the world through the will and dive into thinking through meditation and concentration. We are taking you seriously. You, on the other hand, do not take yourself seriously. Close quote. On a fundamental level, this is the case for all similar things that come under this kind of consideration. Herein lies one of the deeply significant aspects of the spiritual scientific worldview, that it takes seriously the things that others do not take seriously, but treat only superficially. The proofs of spiritual science are always to be found in its opponents. But people do not notice that their claims and the things that they think simultaneously negate the very thing that they imagine they are claiming or thinking. The claims of Schopenhauer and of the atomists negate the very things that both seem to want to claim. Schopenhauer negates his own system with his claim that everything is will and representation. But in the moment that he refuses to embrace the one he seeks to move beyond, he stands at the brink of leading people into spiritual scientific development. We are not the ones who form the spiritual scientific worldview. How does this spiritual scientific worldview take shape? It enters in and is to be found everywhere in the world. It enters into life through unknown gates and windows, and it will find its way into the cultural life of humanity, even if others do not take it seriously. But something else can be recognized when such considerations really lead us to see how little human beings are immersed in their own spiritual processes, and how little they really take themselves seriously, even when they are brilliant, serious philosophers. People weave a sort of fabric of ideas and representations, but they shy away from doing any sort of true inner work with the fabric of ideas that would further their experience with the fundamental forces of the world. So it is that we see, and again we mentioned this yesterday, 
that over the centuries the great triumphs of natural science are simultaneously the things that have led people to a very superficial way of thinking. The more glorious the developments of natural science, the more superficial this research into the very origins of existence has become. We can find some truly shining examples of this very thing. Let us assume that we have a person who has spent a period of time unconcerned with the spiritual world, but who then experiences a transformation that causes him, suddenly, to care about the spiritual world, to develop a desire to know something of the spiritual world. Let us say that we experience this when we are immersed fully into spiritual science. What would be needed in the case of this person who has shown little interest in the spiritual world but who now, as a, at a major crossroads in life, turns toward the spiritual world? It would be interesting to know what is happening in the soul of such a person. Whenever possible, we would try to enter into the soul of such a person and it would be useful for us to know, as I have often said here, that the often used saying, quote, nature makes no leaps, close quote, is completely false. Nature makes leaps everywhere. When the green leaf becomes the colorful petal of a flower, nature has made a leap. And when a person who has shown no interest in the spiritual world changes so that he suddenly is interested in spiritual science, this is also a kind of leap. And we would do well to find out what has caused it. We will gain some information about the various spiritual wellsprings that we have often spoken of here, and we will see how something like this could occur. We will ask ourselves, how old is this person? We know that every seven years something new is born in human nature. At the age of seven, it is the etheric body. At the age of fourteen, the astral body, and so on. We will then take everything that we know about the etheric body and the astral body, and so on, and that means we will take it up inwardly and not externally. Then we will be able to gain some information about what is happening in such a human soul. You could also proceed differently. You might become interested in the fact that people suddenly move from an external life into a life that is interested in spiritual truths and religious depth. A person might consider spiritual science to be a foolish fantasy, and when you conduct research into that person and the processes that are playing out in his soul, you might find what induces him to consider it so foolish. But then you could do the following. You might write, let us say, 192 letters, or even more, to people who have supposedly undergone such a transition. You could write letters to people all across the continent and ask them to respond by describing what brought about this change in their lives. Then you would receive all sorts of answers. One person might say, quote, When I was 14 years old, my life led me into all sorts of excesses. My father grew angry about this and trounced me thoroughly, and he beat me into a feeling for what the spiritual world is. Close quote. Another might say, quote, I saw a man die. Close quote. So, just assume that you have received 192 letters in response and you lay them out in stacks. You make one stack of letters in which the author says that he or she took up these things out of a fear of death or of hell. Then you make a second stack in which the author says that he or she is imitating or following in the footsteps of someone they consider good. And you make another stack of another type of letter and so on. You often have to group things together loosely for these stacks. Then you make another stack for people with other egocentric motives. And now you have these results. You have sorted the 192 letters. You have counted up how many letters there are in each stack. And now, with just a simple calculation, you can say what percentage of people had each type of motivation. For example, you might find out that 14% of people make this sort of change out of fear of death or hell. 6% because of egocentric motives. 5% because they have been gripped by some sort of altruistic feeling. 
17% are striving after some sort of moral ideal, probably the sort of connected with the society for ethical culture. 16% because of a crisis of conscience. 10% because they are following the teachings of someone they consider good. 13% because they are imitating someone else whom they consider religious. 19% because of social pressures or needs, and so on. You can also proceed by trying to lovingly immerse yourself in a soul that has gone through this change. You can attempt to conduct research on his or her interior life. For this, you need spiritual science. Or you can do something like what I have just described. The person who did this is a certain Starbuck, and he has written a startling book about such things. This is the most extreme version of an externalization of the matter. It is the opposite of what one must have a feeling for in spiritual science. Spiritual science always attempts to penetrate into the interior of things. The tendency that has arisen in this materialistic age is to take up even religious life through the use of the famous and beloved techniques of statistics, for this is, quote, unassailable research, close quote, as we have been shown all too clearly. It has a quality that is loved by those who do not want to go through the gates of spiritual science. One can truly say of it that it is easy, very easy. We already mentioned yesterday why so many people do not want to turn fully toward spiritual science. It is too difficult for them. Statistics, on the other hand, are easy, truly very easy. Now these days people are also conducting experimental soul science. I have to tell you a good bit about this experimental soul science if I am to really give you a concept of it. It is called experimental psychology. People think it has a lot of promise. I will describe to you only the beginnings of what people have started to do with these experiments. Let us say that we have ten children sitting before us, and then we write a sentence on the board in front of these children, something like this, quote, T-H ellipsis, H-A ellipsis, W-O ellipsis, Y ellipsis, A-C-C ellipsis, L-O ellipsis, close quote. Then you take the clock and say, quote, you tell me what you can read there, Close quote. The child does not know at first, but he thinks about it for a while, and then it comes to him, quote, Through hard work you accomplish lots. Close quote. And then you make a note of how much time it took the child to come up with the sentence. You need to have a lot of sentences ready, obviously, because it can be challenging to come up with something like that. Over time the children will be able to do it more quickly. Then you make note of how many seconds the first one needed and how many seconds the second one needed to complete the sentence, and so on. Then you figure out the percentages and do further work with the data statistically. In this way, you can test their adaptability to external factors as well as other things. This methodology in experimental psychology has a stylish name. It is called intelligence testing whereas the early, earlier methodology I described was called, quote, testing the religious nature of human beings through experimental means, close quote. You see, my dear friends, the things that I am presenting to you here in a few broad strokes are really nothing to laugh about, because there are far more philosophy positions open to those who are working with this future discipline of soul science than there are positions open to those who take seriously, even in a small way, the things that are discovered only through the inner observation of the soul, not to mention the things that we talk about. In these times, you have to be able to conduct experiments. These are some examples of the kinds of experiments being conducted now, and they have widespread support in the world. Physics and chemical laboratories are being built, there is an endless literature on the topic. Indeed, you can experience it for yourself. I will mention this just as a short aside. 
a friend of ours, one of the members of one of our northern branches, applied to write his doctoral dissertation at the local university. He made every effort, of course, just as one adjusts one's speech when speaking to children, to meet them at a level they can understand. He made every effort to leave out everything that he had learned and gained from spiritual science. All of it was left out. But now, at the defense of this dissertation, a man was on the committee who was an expert in these things, who had his finger on all of these different methodologies, so to speak. He did not accept the dissertation at all. This is a case that the Storting in Norway is already dealing with. The committee member, who is an experimental psychologist, is firmly convinced that he is standing firmly on the scientific ground of the present and that the future belongs to his sole science. Nothing in particular should be said against this experimental psychology. After all, why should it really be uninteresting to experience the kinds of things it has to say? To be sure, it is actually quite interesting. There is no reason why you cannot do things that way. But it is a matter of how these things are brought into life, and whether they are used to kill off true spiritual science and genuine knowledge of the soul. We must always continue to stress that we do not want to deny the work of others investigating the soul by examining the sensory world and registering responses using methodologies like the 192 letters. This befits the capacities of the researchers. But we must keep in mind the nature of the world into which spiritual science is now stepping. We must be clear about this. I am well aware that people might come forward and say, quote, He is at it again, complaining terribly about experimental psychology and picking it all to pieces. Close quote. People could just as easily say, quote, you insulted Goethe and his Faust around Easter time and picked it to pieces too. Close quote. People who cannot understand that describing something is different than the kind of criticism practiced in the usual sense of the word will always misunderstand such things. By describing such things, I hope to place them within the collective whole of human life. Spiritual science is not meant to practice criticism, and what it says cannot actually function as criticism. It is another thing to have clear vision, and this is how someone looking towards science can arrive at the insight that science actually externalizes all of human striving, even when it comes to religious matters. It does not look inward, but rather considers humanity from without. In practical life, people are not quite so credulous. The statistics of the insurance agencies can calculate approximately when a person will die. I have mentioned this before. In other words, you can make calculations for an 18-year-old boy and estimate when he will die because he belongs to a group of people in which so and so many die within a certain number of years. After that, the agency makes the insurance quotes and they are distributed quite properly. This all works out well. But if that same person were to then be preparing himself in everyday life for the year in which the insurance agency said he would probably die, he would be considered a fool. The system does not determine anything about your life. Statistics have just as little to do with your religious beliefs. We must learn to see all of these things. By doing so, you will struggle your way toward a feeling in which intuitive knowledge can be found. But it will be particularly difficult to bring what I would call the pinnacle of our spiritual science into current world culture, that is, the knowledge of the Christ. Knowledge of the Christ as the purest, holiest, and highest thing in spiritual science is what everything in spiritual science is leading toward. In many lectures I have attempted to make it clear that precisely in this age the Christ impulse, which entered through the mystery of Golgotha, must awaken the soul into a state of responsiveness through the instrument of spiritual science. 
I have tried to make the various workings of the Christ impulse clear in many different ways. Just think about the lecture on the Maid of Orleans or Constantine. In many different ways I have tried to make it clear that the Christ impulse has moved through the centuries in the unconscious, but that now we are living in a time in which it must step into human life much more consciously. This is an age in which a true knowledge of the mystery of Golgotha must enter in. You will not be able to learn to recognize and know this mystery of Golgotha unless you truly take up and immerse yourself through spiritual science in the ideas and imaginations that were touched upon at Easter, the concepts of Christ in connection with Lucifer and Araman. We are living in an extremely difficult time, in a time of great pain and suffering. You know that I cannot say something descriptive of these times for the reasons that I have already mentioned. I do not want to do that either. I want to touch upon something from an altogether different angle, something that is connected with what we are discussing today. This time of pain and suffering has awakened something in the human soul. And all of us who are experiencing this time and are concerned about what is happening will notice that in this age a great deepening of the human soul is coming in from one side. It is a deepening of the human souls that are standing in the midst of these current events and that have distanced themselves from all religious life, where the sensibilities and feelings have become totally materialistic. But in the messages we receive from them through letters and other means, we find that through their painful connection with these current events, they have begun to rediscover their religious feelings. It is characteristic of this moment that people who would never have let such words cross their lips before are starting to talk about God and a divine order. It is really true that you can experience a great sense of religious deepening on the part of people who are experiencing these things firsthand. But another fact can be called up that is just as clear as the one I have just mentioned. Take a look at the characteristic passages from the letters that come from the battlefields, the one in which you can find this characteristic deepening of religious feeling. They write a good bit about how they have found God again. But they also say almost nothing, and few people have really noticed this, about the Christ. We hear them speaking about God, but not about Christ. This is a very significant fact. A religious feeling is on the rise in this time of great pain and suffering. Excuse me, of great suffering and pain. A religious idea in the abstract form of the idea of God. However, we almost cannot speak at all of a similar deepening of the sense for Christ. I say almost. Naturally, we see it in a few places, but generally things are as I have just described them. From this you can see that our age is at a point where human souls feel a need to seek a connection with the spiritual world again, but also that it is hard for us to be led to what we call the Christ impulse and the mystery of Golgotha. This is why it is necessary for the human soul to be given an imagination of the whole of humanity. This is why it is necessary that we not only seek community with the things that we live with during one lifetime, but also that we turn our spiritual eyes toward all of the ages and all of the beings that we have been and have been with as souls throughout several lifetimes on the earth, several different ages, during several different ages. This leads us gradually to understand the powerful necessity in our souls to recognize that humanity undergoes descending and ascending periods of evolution. We must feel at one with humanity in its evolutionary process. We must look back to the moments of Earth's origin and witness its descending and ascending stages of evolution, at the middle of which stands the mystery of Golgotha. We must feel at one with all of humanity 
and feel at one with the mystery of Golgotha. The human soul stands closer to the spatial cosmos than to the temporal cosmos, the temporal cosmos being the one that has unfolded during the course of the stages of evolution. But we are led to the temporal cosmos when we start to feel united with the whole course of human evolution. For once we begin to feel this, we cannot help but see that a certain moment of human evolution came about at a point when something entered into human evolution that could not have come about purely through human powers. It had to enter human evolution by having an impulse from the spiritual world itself penetrate into the world through a human body, which happened at the beginning of the Christian calendar. It was a moment when heaven made contact with the earth. Here we are touching upon something that must be incorporated into religious life through spiritual science. We are talking about the way in which spiritual science must sink into the feelings of human beings so that they come into connection with the mystery of Golgotha and find the Christ impulse in such a way that it is not an unclear feeling for them, but rather they will have it as a clear consciousness that cannot be lost. Spiritual science will work. We have recognized the necessity of this work, and we have often stressed that at a basic level you all are sitting there as a way of demonstrating that you want to work with your whole heart as part of this spiritual scientific movement. And if in the future hard times befall humanity once again, then may it be the case that spiritual science will have found a way for this deepening of the human soul to connect not only with an abstract consciousness of God, but also with a concrete historical consciousness of Christ. The time has come in which serious feelings can be roused within us. We should not avoid calling up such feelings, which I would say are actually holy feelings. Let all of those who have become a part of this spiritual scientific movement be differentiated from those who have not yet approached it by the fact that all of the people who have committed to spiritual science take up everything that happens in the world with a fundamental sense of seriousness, both the external things and the deeper ones. Consider how important it is to see in everyday life that with our ordinary reason and intellect, which is bound up with our nervous system, we are actually outside of what most interests us in normal physical experience. Because of this, we are actually strangers to ourselves in our thinking, as it is typically practiced, say, by the hypothetical lawyer we mentioned earlier. But by working with spiritual science, we acquire a heart, quote, outside of the body, close quote, as we mentioned yesterday. And what we think will again be filled with inwardness and soul quality. Only in this way can we make use of the reasoning and understanding that are bound up with our physical body and thereby deeply connect ourselves with the spheres in which we actually practice our thinking. Through spiritual science, we will carry this out. And in the things that we think with our reasoning and our understanding, we will become people of truth. And life needs people of truth. What shines from the sun of spiritual science grows together with us because we grow together with the beings of the upper hierarchies. We must become people of truth about through spiritual science. Only then will our thinking become such that we do not use it like the lawyer who is capable of defending either side of an argument. We will become people of truth by becoming one with the spiritual truths. And insofar as we are able to find the possibility of grasping our will in the way that I have described today, we will find the path into the inner parts of things. Not by speaking as Schopenhauer did, about the will in nature, but by living into things with our will and intermingling our will forces with those that are in the thing itself. 
Here we touch upon something that is sorely missing from our present moment, the loving act of immersing oneself in the essence of things. This is so sorely missing from the present. I would say that you really need to keep experiencing the bitterness of this, the fact that the practice of allowing one's will to sink into the essence of things is so sorely missing. If I present to you an apparently insignificant fact, you will not be understanding it properly if you think that I simply want to make a personal remark. It is not meant as a personal remark and could, in fact, be of some significance for certain things that are a part of our considerations currently, even within our circle here. To be sure, I really do not like having to make such remarks, and if I were making it only as a way of showing that I myself find something to be unnecessary, then I would not be making it. But over time a certain perspective, a certain sensibility, must spread ever more for the seriousness that must become a guiding part of each one of us. There is no need for anyone to feel offended when I say something like this. I am not saying it for personal reasons, but rather as a way of pointing out that we must all remember to take up this seriousness that must become an integrated part of our movement. For precisely at a place like this, where it is possible to establish this building as an external sign for what we are doing, it is very important that the proper sentiment be the rule for everything that cannot exactly be said, but which must be felt and understood by every single person who is to be a part of our movement. You see, I am not fond of touching on these matters here in this place. After I attempted during the first months of this difficult period, to bring one thing or another to the souls gathered here, certain things happened, I will just leave it at that, that made it utterly necessary not to speak another word, even an objective one that might be fitting to our movement. I can honestly and rightfully admit that this is a fundamentally painful thing and that it is truly painful to feel such a great number of misunderstandings pulsing through our movement. I mention all of these things because they are connected with the question that must be addressed here today. The question I am addressing is how much we are strangers to ourselves in the act of thinking, and why exactly this is the case. It is not enough if we simply take up in our thinking the things that bubble up from the spiritual scientific perspective. We must take up these things that emanate from spiritual scientific sources in such a way that they move into our will. But this will, I mentioned already how it is intimately connected with what pulses in our life, this will is more recalcitrant than the thought. The portion of spiritual science that can be taken up in thinking is taken up very little. But the portion that is supposed to move into the will is generally quite misunderstood, excuse me, is in general greatly misunderstood. I, in particular, have had to experience this quite painfully. Out there in the world, people are talking about a kind of belief in authority that is supposed to be predominant here among us. But actually, much in here is misunderstood and ill taken up, because very few have been able to see how carefully this knowledge that I am presenting has been gathered and gained. Now, I do not know how a brochure written by a certain Mr. Church found its way to me yesterday. But if it was sent to me by the circle of our anthroposophic friends at Arlesheim, perhaps with the intention that I should read it and see what some people are saying about our current state of affairs, then I must say, even if it does not necessarily apply to this example, it does well to others, that if this brochure was indeed sent to me with the idea that I should take from it the knowledge of what someone else thinks as those thoughts are expressed in that brochure, and I find the act of sending it to me both out of place and inappropriate. 
I say that without criticism. If the brochure was sent to me by way of offering an example of how people falsify history, then that is another matter. But not everything is done with this intention in mind. This is all I would like to say about this brochure, in which someone has written some assessments of current events that are based on nothing more than the most frivolous sort of falsification of history. This is something that we must absolutely and completely overcome, the falsification of objective facts. But this falsification is also something that is practiced so often at present. Someone who knows nothing about what is happening makes claims that can be easily shown to be false. Someone like Mr. Church, who should not be allowed to speak when serious matters are considered by serious people. When something like this is said, my dear friends, it should be taken as a kind of example and not as something leveled against this particular instance which is ultimately totally insignificant. But this particular brochure is a symptom and we should think about symptoms like this so we might go ever deeper into the depths that must fill our spiritual movement. And our spiritual movement will serve as a guiding light in the soul particularly when we familiarize ourselves with what cannot be found by those who are in the midst of these most difficult current events, seeking for the values of the spiritual world. Spiritual science must gradually build for us the steps that will lead to a permanent understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. This mystery of Golgotha is what gives meaning to the earth. And understanding the meaning of the earth must be the greatest task toward which spiritual science continues ever to strive. That is the end of Lecture 13, the end of the book, Artistic Sensitivity as a Spiritual Approach to Knowing Life in the World, 13 Lectures, by Rudolf Steiner, Collected Works, Volume 161, translated by Rory Bradley.